This is Audible. The Grey Wolf Throne by Cinda Williams Chima. Narrated by Carol Monda. Chapter 18. A Web of Lies. Eamon sat down again, endeavoring to keep his face as blank as new snow while his heart hammered under his uniform coat. He looked up and met the High Wizard's cold blue eyes. While it's difficult to look beyond our recent losses and Queen Mariana's burial, we must consider the issue of the coronation, Bayar said. The coronation, sir, Eamon said. He glanced at Princess Melanie, then back at Lord Bayar. As you astutely pointed out, our enemies are gathering to the south, Lord Bayar said. Have you heard the news? Tamron Court has fallen to Gerard Montan. Eamon shook his head. No, he said, pretending surprise dismay. I hadn't heard that. We cannot afford to leave our throne unoccupied for long, Bayar said. It will be perceived as a power vacuum that our enemies to the south will be only too happy to fill. Montan may decide that it's easier to conquer the Fells than to continue fighting against his brothers. I can see where that might happen, Eamon said truthfully. Given the princess heir's extended absence, Queen Mariana made a difficult decision, Lord Bayar said. She modified the succession, recognizing that the princess Rasa might never return home. She named the princess Melanie her successor in the event that, that the throne became vacant and the princess Rasa couldn't be located. He finished delicately. He shook his head. None of us ever anticipated that this alternate plan would ever be needed. Raisa may still return, Melanie said, a faint protest. I don't want anyone to think that we're setting her aside. That is exactly what people will think, daughter. The demon eye in particular, Averil said. That is one reason I voted against it on the council. This is difficult for the Princess Melanie to accept, Lord Hackham said, speaking up for the first time. But in recognition of the current crisis in Arden and Tamron, the Council of Regents has determined that if the Princess Rasa doesn't return for Queen Mariana's memorial service, we must proceed with Princess Melanie's coronation. Eamon wished he could watch all the faces at once so as not to miss anything. He looked first at Speaker Jemson. The Speaker's face was smooth and untroubled. He was a smart man, he probably knew the price of resistance as well as Eamon. Melanie somehow managed to look both guilty and thrilled. Unconsciously, she reached down and stroked Micah's hair as if it were a talisman. She'd never hoped to be queen, Eamon thought. She likes the idea, and she knows in her secret heart that it will win her Micah. Is it really so urgent? Eamon said finally, trying to sound as if this were interesting news that had little to do with him. It seems like you have a little time before Montan regroups. The siege of Tamron Court must have taken a toll, and if he wants to march through the mountains, he'll have to wait for better weather. As far as I know, he has no experience with mountain warfare. And yet you just said that you returned home because of the risk Montan poses, Lord Bayar said, pouncing on Eamon's words like a trout on a fly. You can't have it both ways, his expression said. I don't think it's wise to underestimate Montan. Look what happened to the Tomlins. I can see why you wouldn't want to leave the throne vacant for long, Eamon said. But what happens if the Princess Rasa returns at a later time? He could feel Micah Bayar's black-eyed gaze on him. Lord Hackham shrugged. There is no provision to rearrange matters should that happen, he said. You must admit, it was irresponsible of her to run off like that, without a word to anyone. That was either brave or foolhardy on Hackham's part, to call the princess heir of the realm irresponsible. Still, Eamon could see how the nobility would take a dim view of Race's disappearance. They'd not been told that it had been precipitated by the prospect of a forced marriage to a wizard. They'd likely been told that Race had had a spat with the queen and stormed off in a huff. The Grey Wolf line was known to be headstrong. Look at Hanalea. Eamon knew that was all he could do, to try to raise a doubt, to try to slow things down. 
but why would they tell Ain and Byrne about their plans for the coronation? Unless, if Rhaesa still lived and Aemon knew where she was, they would expect him to rush back and tell her and that might flush their quarry before she could cause real trouble. So he sat, saying nothing, waiting to be dismissed, wondering what to say to Rhaesa, and how to prevent his own headstrong queen from doing something foolhardy. Queen Melanie will need a captain of her guard, Lord Bayar said, wrenching him back to the present. Oh. Queen Melanie. The sound of it made Aemon's skin itch. Aye, he said, nodding sagely. That's so. He knew he sounded like a dolt, but he wasn't going to make the offer. His mind worked furiously. Rasa had been right, as she usually was about political matters. Say yes, she'd said. Say yes, or it will be your death warrant. I would be honored, Corporal Byrne, if you would consent to be captain of my guard, Melanie said, smiling at him. Eamon was glad Rasa had warned him, glad he hadn't been blindsided. The Bayars knew that the Burns stood in the way of their complete control over their chosen queen, so why would they go along with the selection of a Burn as captain? Rasa had suggested one reason. The Bayars knew the elevation of Melanie to the throne would be controversial. They would want to add any legitimacy to it that they could. If a Burn consented to be captain, as tradition demanded, that would make her more credible. The second possibility was that they really took him to be a fool. The third possibility was that they wanted to keep him close and under their watch so they could handle him if he showed any signs of being uncooperative. It was hard to keep in the front of his mind who knew what secrets. Eamon realized he was thinking on it too long when they were all waiting for his response. I... I'm flattered, Your Highness... Eamon said, but surprised as well. Though I've been nearly four years at Odin's Ford, I'm still a cadet. I'm just eighteen. I would have expected you to choose someone with more schooling and experience. Come now, General Klemeth snapped. You can't be that surprised. It's always been a burn, ever since the breaking. He doesn't seem happy about it either, Eamon thought. Perhaps he thought one of his idiot sons would be tapped for the post. We believe that character and bloodlines are more important than training and experience, Melanie said, smiling. Unless you prefer we name your sister Lydia or your brother Ira, Lord Bayar said. Bones, Eamon thought. He was surprised Lord Bayar knew he had a sister and brother. He didn't like that he knew it. Naming Lydia was a possible out for them. She was an artist, without training as a soldier. Although still a burn, she would be less of an obstacle to Bayar ambition. It would put Lydia in danger and wouldn't offer much protection to the queen. And Ira was eleven years old. He wouldn't go to the academy for two more years. General Klemeth, you are right, Eamon said. I should have anticipated it. It's just... things are shifting so quickly, it's hard to keep up. I expected to have years in the guard to prepare. With the tragic loss of the queen... And the loss of my father. It will just take a while to get used to the idea, I guess. Bayar's expression said, don't take too long. Corporal Byrne, Melanie said, we have this in common. We are both thrust into roles we never expected. We can learn together, you and I. Eamon nodded. I hadn't thought of it that way. That's exactly what we don't need, Eamon thought. A young, malleable, inexperienced queen and a green captain of the guard. So you agree? Melanie said, leaning forward eagerly, the child unwilling to be denied. Eamon inclined his head. Yes, he said. I would be honored to serve as captain of the queen's guard, your highness. After all, he already was, in fact. Lord Bayar studied him for a long moment, then nodded, seeming satisfied. Good. He looked at Speaker Jemson. Isn't there some sort of religious ceremony? He said, with clear disinterest. Will you be handling that? Speaker Jemson nodded. Typically, it takes place at the time of the coronation, he said. I will prepare for that, along with the rest. Jemson is a fair liar for a dedicate, Eamon thought. Thank you, Corporal Byrne, Lord Bayar said, dismissing him. 
This region's council meeting is adjourned. Eamon rose and backed away, bowing, but they were no longer paying attention to him. Melanie climbed down from her high chair and stood, chatting animatedly with Micah. As Eamon watched, the young wizard slid an arm around Melanie's shoulders and drew her in for a kiss. Eamon didn't look forward to sharing all this news with Rasa. Corporal. Eamon flinched and looked up to find Jemson next to him. I am riding up to Mariana Peak now to observe the preparations. Why don't you come along? We can make some decisions, and you can get the lay of the land. Yes, thank you, I will, Eamon said, yanking his attention away from Melanie and Micah. Speaker Jemson followed his gaze. It seems we have our work cut out for us, doesn't it? Eamon had to agree. By the end of the day, Eamon was physically and mentally exhausted. The Grey Wolves had accompanied Eamon and Jemson to Mariana Peak, since Eamon meant to use them as part of the honor guard for his father. Whatever the final plan, he wanted soldiers on hand he could trust during the memorial. His wolves were all native-born, except for Pearly Greenholt, who had come north with Talia, leaving her post as weapons master at Wean House. She had taken Wode's place in Eamon's triple after Wode was killed in Tamron. They walked the burial ground, and Eamon took notes and made sketches. His father's urn wouldn't take much space, so there was no need to chop a deep grave out of the still-frozen ground. He spoke to the stone carvers about an appropriate monument. All the while, he racked his brain, looking for a safe way to bring Rasa in and out of the site without exposing her to those who would be eager to finish the job they'd started. When they returned to Felsmarch, Eamon debriefed his wolf pack again, giving them preliminary instructions for the day of the memorial. They wouldn't know about the Princess Rasa until the very last minute. He trusted his wolves, but the fewer who knew, the less chance word would leak out. He left the urn containing his father's ashes with Speaker Jemson. It would rest in state in the cathedral temple until the memorial service, when Eamon and his wolves would accompany it to the burial site. He managed a late dinner with his brother Ira and his sister Lydia and her family. Three years older than Eamon, Lydia was recently married and expecting a child. She and her husband, Donald Graves, a merchant, had rented a home within the castle close, since many of her painting commissions came from the wealthy nobility who lived in the area. With their father gone, Ira would move in with Lydia until it was time for him to leave for the academy. Lydia would have preferred to bury their father next to their mother in the burned tomb in the cathedral close, but it would not be the first time she had sacrificed her desires to the good of the queen and realm. There was much to talk about, memories and grief to share, and they were reluctant to let him go. As a result, it was quite late when Eamon fetched his horse from the barracks stable for the long ride back to Marisa Pines. As he led the gelding through the stable doors into the courtyard, he saw movement in the shadows next to the building. Eamon assumed it was one of his fellow guards, staying late from the previous shift or early for the next. "'Who goes there?' he called softly. But the tall, spare figure who stepped into the light wasn't one of the Queen's guard. "'What are you doing here?' Eamon asked, sliding his sword free but keeping it pointed toward the ground. Micah Bayar came forward, hands raised, palms out, to show that he wasn't touching his amulet. Relax, Corporal Byrne. I mean you no harm. I just wanted to talk to you. That's a shame, Bayar, because I don't want to talk to you, Eamon said, sorting through what he did and didn't know, and what he could and couldn't admit to. Have you been waiting for me all this time? Micah nodded. I looked for you at the barracks, but it seems you aren't staying there. He paused. When Eamon said nothing, he said impatiently, Why aren't you in the barracks? Where are you staying? It's crowded in the barracks, too many new faces, and it's none of your business where I'm staying. Eamon wanted to mount up, but he knew that would make him vulnerable to a magical attack. Now, if there's nothing else... Micah stepped into the gateway leading out of the courtyard blocking the way. I want to know if you've heard from the Princess Rasa. 
and if you know where she is. The Princess Raisa. Eamon assumed a perplexed expression. How would I know where she is? You heard what I said at the Council of Regents meeting. I've been at Odin's Ford all this while, same as you. Micah's eyes narrowed. Don't lie to me. I know you took her to Odin's Ford. I know you had her hidden away there. Eamon snorted. Let me get this straight. You think the princess heir of the realm ran away with a fourth-year cadet and has been living at a military academy for nearly a year? Some devil within him made him add, Why would she do such a thing, unless she was absolutely desperate to get away? Micah scowled at the dig. I know she was at Odin's Ford because I saw her, he said. If you say so, Eamon said, then maybe she's still there, unless you know something I don't. He paused, wondering if Micah would actually confess to kidnapping Raisa. When Micah said nothing, Eamon added, Why do you care where she is? Looks to me like you're, uh, supporting the Princess Melanie. Eamon raised an eyebrow. If the Princess Raisa is still alive, she should be crowned queen, Micah said. Eamon eyed Micah, trying to read his face in the inconsistent light. Well now, Bayar, he said, you finally hit on something we can agree on. If you know where she is, you need to get word to her, Micah continued. She has to be at Queen Mariana's funeral. Once Melanie is crowned, it will be too late. I didn't hear you speaking up at the Council of Regents, Eamon said. Seems to me that's who you should be talking to, not a lowly corporal in the guard. You don't fool me, Eamon thought. You just want to know where she is so you can finish the job you started. Still keeping one eye on the wizard, he swung up into his saddle and nudged his gilding into a walk, aiming straight at Micah. Micah Bayar waited until the last possible moment, then stood aside and watched him go by. Chapter 19 a calculated risk. The day after the newling queen's confession, Han asked Willow to move him into the visitor's lodge where he'd have less supervision and more freedom of movement. Willow disapproved. You'll overtax yourself, she said. At least here I can attend you and limit your visitors. He could have said, You're already letting in all the people I'd like to keep out. But that wasn't Willow's fault. I don't need anyone attending me, he said, and I'll get more rest away from all the comings and goings. Willow sat down next to Han on the sleeping bench. What are you going to do, Hans alone? she said. Do? Han rubbed the back of his neck. About what? About Briar Rose, she said. Who? Han pretended not to understand. Oh, the queenling. That girlie has more names than a rag market fancy. Be careful, Hans alone, Willow said, her voice low and urgent. She glanced around as if to make sure no one else was within hearing distance. I'm always careful, Han said. He couldn't help looking around as well. I mean it. If the demon I realize you're in love with her, they will kill you. Who says I'm in love with her? Han retorted, avoiding her eyes. Where'd you get that? I saw what was in your face when you handed her down to me at Trailside, Willow said. I heard what you said. If I can see it, so can others. Never forget that Avril is demon eye first, and he's no fool. He will not hesitate to kill you if he has any inkling that your intentions are— I don't have any intentions, all right, Han growled. Except for staying alive and getting out of this mess as soon as I can. That will be hard enough to bring off. I know you. Reaching up, Willow brushed a lock of hair from his eyes. You will go after what you want, regardless of the risk. And you stand to lose everything. I have lost everything, Han thought. Then he corrected himself. Every time I think I've lost everything, I find there's still something else to lose. Look, he said, I'm not a fool, though I act the part sometimes. I have no illusions about what I mean to her highness. I know all about blue bloods, and she's worse than most. She's been lying to me from the day we met. You are wrong, 
Willow persisted. She cares for you. She really does. And that increases the risk. There are some that will kill her, too, if they realize how much she cares. The Briar Rose represents hope for the Upland tribes. A chance to finally put one of our own on the Grey Wolf throne. A chance to redress more than a thousand years of occupation by jinxflingers and rule by the Veil Dwellers. Believe me, there is no one more dangerous than one whose hopes have turned to despair. She fell silent, smoothing the folds of her skirts. The Wizard Council has hopes also, to regain the power they once held. As long as they believe that the Briar Rose can be a part of that plan, she stays alive. And you are definitely not a part of that plan. Han ground the heels of his hands into his temples, wishing he could shut out Willow's gentle voice. When had she become such an expert in politics? Willow put her hand on Han's shoulder, her touch easing the pounding in his head. I know how to keep secrets to protect those I love. You must keep this secret, too. She searched Han's face, her own drawn tight with worry. Promise me you will. I might as well be spitting into the wind as talking to Willow, Han thought. He put his hand on her arm. I'll be careful, he said. I know how to keep secrets. He paused for a heartbeat. And now I need some favors from you. In the visitor's lodge, Han was granted one of the rooms reserved for important guests. It had a hearth of its own on the outside wall and two sleeping benches, each wide enough for two, piled with blankets and fur throws. He wished he had someone to share all this luxury with. His thoughts went unbidden to Rebecca. Rasa. This was new to him, this feeling like he'd had a limb hacked off. Two of Willow's apprentices were assigned to feed and dose him at regular intervals. But they knocked before they entered, and peeked at him out of the corners of their eyes, and acted like they thought he would flame them at the drop of a moccasin. It was tiresome, but convenient at the same time. Han wore Dancer's replica of his Hunts Alone amulet, displayed on the outside of his clothing, the Demon King's amulet hidden underneath. The flash in the replica was a faint reflection of the original. Han worried that if Elena touched it, she would know it wasn't the one she made. But though the matriarch likely noticed he wore it, she showed little interest in it. Dancer continued to use the original Hunsalone amulet, though he kept it hidden while at camp. He seemed to have made his peace with the borrowed jinx piece. That evening, Han and Dancer walked back to the matriarch lodge for the promised strategy meeting with all the players and plotters. It was the first time Han had seen Rasa since her confession to him. When they entered the common room of the lodge, she was sitting cross-legged on the floor, engaged in animated conversation with Averil and Elena Demoni. Her father and grandmother, Han reminded himself. Still, she looked up when Han entered as if she sensed his presence. Leaning forward, her hands pressed onto her leggings, she searched his face with a kind of mute appeal. Han averted his eyes and found a seat on the floor on the far side of the room. Eamon Byrne and Averil Demoni reported on the news from the capital. If the Princess Rasa didn't show at the Queen's burial, they'd put her little sister on the throne. So suddenly the discussion was not if she would attend, but how she could do it safely. So the Princess Rasa would get her way, as princesses usually do. Reed Nightwalker Demon Eye and the newly minted Nightbird were there. Several times, Han felt the pressure of Bird's eyes on him. He pretended not to notice. Nightwalker was another matter. Han could tell that his presence was like a tick under the Demon Eye warrior's skin. So Han made it a point to challenge his black stare every chance he got, like they were rival street lords in the market. The site for the memorial service lay on the south flank of the newly named Mariana Peak, north of the Vale. At least it was neutral ground. If anyone had an edge, it was the clans. Han knew the place. He'd hunted the area with Dancer and Bird, though it had been a long time ago. The Flatlanders called it Camelback Mountain. The clans had a more picturesque name for the double summit. 
Now both names would be discarded in favor of Mariana. The memorial site was accessible from the mountains to the north, using a high pass between the twin summits, though that would be hard going this early in spring. Before we go further, Avril Lightfoot said, glancing at Han and Dancer, there is something else you should know. All eyes turned to the demon eye patriarch. When I returned to the city yesterday, I asked the demon eye warriors assigned to my guard to search the Queen's gardens again, to see if there were any clues that Queen Mariana's guard might have overlooked. To Eamon, he added, I'm not meaning to suggest that the guard's search was lacking in any way. No offense taken, Eamon said evenly. Avril nodded, then put his hand on Bird's shoulder. Nightbird, can you show us what you found? Now everyone stared at Bird. She fumbled in her carry pouch and withdrew an object wrapped in deerskin. Coming forward onto her knees, she set it on the ground and unfolded the leather covering. It was a wizard's amulet in an old-fashioned style, a tangle of branches and birds in white and yellow gold, some of its fine detail worn smooth with long use. And where did you find this? Avril prompted. It was embedded in the rose briar below the queen's terrace, Bird said, sitting back on her heels, dropping her hands into her lap. Where once Han could have read Bird easily, now it was difficult to tell what she was thinking. Is this familiar to anyone? Avril asked. Does anyone know which jinx flint, which wizard carries an amulet like this? They all shook their heads. Han rolled his eyes. It wasn't surprising that none of them had seen it. Most of those present never interacted with wizards if they could help it. Dancer extended his hand. Could I take a look? Bird nodded, and Dancer lifted the amulet, cradling it between his hands, turning it to catch the torchlight. This is an old piece, he said finally, though made since the breaking. Nearly all the flash has been discharged. It's seen recent use. He looked up. I'd guess that somebody's been seen using this, if we ask around. Who should we ask? Nightwalker said. The Wizard Council? Why would they tell us the truth? We will ask the Flashcrafters at Demon Eye Camp, Avril said. Perhaps someone remembers renewing the amulet in the past. Han took the flash piece from Dancer and weighed it on his palm. It's hard to believe that a wizard would drop his amulet without noticing, he said, frowning. Or leave it lay if he did. He met Bird's eyes, and she looked down at her hands, embarrassed to be accusing wizards of a crime in his presence. If Queen Mariana ripped it off her attacker and it fell into the garden below, maybe he couldn't retrieve it right then, Elena said, taking the amulet from Han. Maybe someone was down there. Raisa shook her head. Avril said that nobody saw the queen fall or found her until Magret missed her. It may not be positive proof, Nightwalker said, but it supports what I've said all along. We shouldn't be allying ourselves with wizards to fight wizards who may be implicated in Queen Mariana's death. It puts them in a difficult position, acting against their own kind. Several of the young demon eye warriors nodded in agreement. What do you suggest, Nightwalker? Elena said, leaning forward. Nightwalker looked around the circle as if searching out allies. I suggest that we send a small band of demon eye into Felsmarch tomorrow. Some of us are familiar with the city now, and Lightfoot can easily gain us access to the palace. We seize the Princess Melanie and carry her back to demon eye camp. Once we have control of both princesses, the Wizard Council would have no option but to give in. Is that what you think? Raisa said her voice cold and brittle as river ice. That you have control of this princess now? I am not a game piece or a strategic castle you are trying to breach. That's where you're wrong, Han thought. Nightwalker thinks every girlie is a castle to be breached. Best to keep your drawbridge up. But maybe she knew that already, since the princess heir had fostered at Demon Eye Camp. Han studied the two of them, wondering just how well they knew each other. Jealousy flamed within him. He knew what Nightwalker wanted. He could see it in his face. With some effort, 
Han wrenched himself back to what Elena was saying. Nightwalker could have phrased that more appropriately, granddaughter, but don't be too quick to dismiss his suggestion, Elena said. It would put an end to any plan to crown Melanie in your place, and it would minimize the danger to you. I've already lost my mother, Raisa said. I will not risk losing my sister as well. You should understand this, Elena Sinestra. Must I remind you that Melanie is your granddaughter, too? I will not be a party to any kidnapping. I have to think that we can come up with a better plan. Nightwalker shrugged as if it didn't matter either way to him, but Han could tell his pride was wounded. Much as Han hated to admit it, he agreed with Nightwalker about one thing. The time had come to quit sneaking around and do something dramatic. Everyone had an idea of how to manage the memorial service. Lord Averill suggested that Raisa arrive at the funeral buried in the midst of a crew of demon eye warriors, display herself, and then return to Marisa Pines when the service was over. Elena offered powerful talismans that might protect the princess from magical attack by the wizard council. Everyone agreed that the element of surprise was key, that the safest thing was to whisk her in and out before the wizard council could organize some sort of attack. Han was happy to let everyone else talk while he and Dancer examined Corporal Byrne's sketchy map of the burial area. He wanted to discuss all this with Dancer and come up with his own plan, but all of a sudden he heard his name and looked up to find everybody staring at them. What? he said, irritated to be caught napping. We've run through all our ideas, Nightwalker said, and we wondered what the Charmcasters had to offer. The demon eye warrior looked from Han to Dancer, his expression alert and interested, but Han guessed that Nightwalker's expectations were low. Han shrugged. I don't think much of what you've come up with so far, he said. Elena's lips tightened. I see. Well then, perhaps you can tell us what you suggest. Han glanced at Dancer. Me and Fire Dancer need to talk it over, he said. We'll tell you what we come up with tomorrow. But if the Princess Raisa is Queen of the Realm, then everybody, including her, ought to start acting like it. What do you mean? Raisa said, sitting up very straight, her green eyes fixed on him in that unnerving way she had. The problem wasn't Raisa, Han thought, recalling how she'd walked into Southbridge Guardhouse like a lioness to face off with Gillen. She was fearless. Too fearless sometimes. I'm just a street lord. Han said, or used to be, but you don't get to be street lord by hiding in your crib. We understand that, Avril said, his voice edged with annoyance. But there has already been one likely regicide, and at least one attempt on the princess heir. There is a very real danger that— I get that, Han said, believe me. But say I'm street lord of Ragmarket. Even in Southbridge, I don't sneak around hoping nobody notices. No. I strut in like I own the place. I walk right down the way. I have my raggers with me. I'm not stupid. But the point is, my enemies should be worrying about themselves and what'll happen if they get in my way. They should be wondering about my plans and what I know and who I've got on my side. The Princess Raisa? This is her turf. They're the trespassers. If she comes off like she's scared of them, it's over. She's got to go back to Fellsmarch. She's got to move back into the old neighborhood and clean out the riffraff rivals. Long as she's up here, she's out of power. We're not really asking for political advice, Elena said, her black eyes narrowed. We were more interested in what you had to offer in terms of charm casting. Raisa surged to her feet, looking around at the others. He's right, though. I can't rule from here. The longer I stay hidden, the more time my enemies have to dig in. We'll never dislodge them if we wait. Avril rolled his eyes. He's telling you to do what you've wanted to do all along, he said. That doesn't make it the right thing to do. We can't afford to lose you, granddaughter, Elena said. If the Jinxflingers kill you too, the line will be broken. Then we make sure that doesn't happen, Raisa said, looking around the room. The demon eye will do our part, Nightwalker said, but it's going to be more difficult for us to protect you in the city. Hans alone has no real stake in this. We do. 
We haven't seen anything from the Jinxflingers to suggest they'll contribute at all. Dancer and I will meet with you tomorrow, Your Highness, Han said to Reza, using the formal title on purpose. Just the three of us. I'll tell you what we have in mind, and you say yes or no. You're the princess, so it's your call. What you need is some firepower, enough to scare off the wizard council so they leave you alone. For a while, anyway. What you want is to make show. We can help with that. Chapter 20 Lucius and Alger Han asked Dancer to walk back with him to the visitor's lodge. When they emerged from the matriarch lodge, powdery snow swirled around their feet in little devil dances, and Han's nose crackled in the icy air. Even in spring it was still plenty cold at this altitude once the sun went down. The visitor's lodge was nestled in the pines a short distance from the rest of the camp. Han and Dancer were single-filing it on the path when Han heard a step behind them. Whirling, he gripped his amulet and extended his hand, his fingers tingling with flash. "'It's just me, Hanselone,' Bird said, raising her hands and backing away, eyes wide. Han lowered his charm-casting hand. "'You can't ambush me like that any more,' he said. "'Not a good idea.' "'I can see that,' Bird attempted a smile. You've never been easy to sneak up on, but now you're jumpy as a fell's hair. That's how I stay alive, Han said. After an awkward pause, he said, Did you want something? Bird glanced over her shoulder to verify that no one was within hearing distance. I heard you were hurt, saving the Queen's life, she said. I wanted to see if you were all right. I've been better, Han said, but I'm all right. Good, she said glancing at Dancer, whose face offered no clues as to what he was thinking. I'm glad to hear that. She paused, scuffing at some leaves with her moccasin. When Han said nothing, she continued. I'm off duty tonight. Could we... Could I share your hearth? I would like to talk to both of you. Did Nightwalker send you here? Dancer asked. Was there something he wanted you to tell us, or something he wanted you to find out? Bird blinked at him. No, I came on my own. Why would you— We have plans, Han said. Jinx flinger business. Sorry. They circled around her and walked on. Han resisted looking back. He wasn't proud of what he'd said to Bird. It felt petty and mean. But he did have other plans, plans he couldn't share with her. And it was Jinx flinger business. Choose sides against a street lord, and you pay a price. The visitor's lodge was deserted. The other guests, like Avril, would be plodding long into the night. Han led Dancer into his room and shut the door. Dancer rekindled the fire and laid on another stick of wood. I'm glad to be back in the mountains, he said, shedding his warm coat. It's good to be back at my mother's hearth. Sitting down on the rug, he leaned his back against the hearthstone. Han eyed him curiously. You seem different. Like you're easier with being a wizard here in camp. Dancer shrugged. My time in the flatlands opened my eyes. Here people mistrust us for being wizards. Everywhere else people mistrust me for being clan. He smiled at Han's puzzled expression. It's taught me that the flaw is in them, not me. When I first found out I was gifted, I felt ashamed, like it was a fault or a curse. I'd been taught all my life that it was. I would have done most anything to get rid of it. I wanted to kill my wizard father for inflicting it on me. He half smiled. But what I've come to realize is it's not a curse. It's a gift, like my mother's gift for healing. I can do things that others can't do. I refuse to apologize for it any more. Han found himself wishing he had the same clear-eyed view. Lately, it seemed like all he did was react to others and their plans. He'd never get anywhere if he didn't know what he was after and where he wanted to go. Like I said, it's good to be here, Dancer went on, but I would have liked to stay longer at the Academy. I was making progress with Filesmith. I think he was flattered to have someone who was actually interested in metal craft and flash. 
He gave me some of his rare books to bring along. Dancer paused. But you didn't bring me back here to talk about my plans. Well, in a way I did. Partly. I'm trying to figure out what weapons we have going into this. Dancer nodded. I can add more flash capability to the amulet I made for you now, if you want, he said. Still won't be as powerful as the one I'm using, Elena's, or the one you took from the Bayars. No rush, Han said, touching his replica amulet. It brightened fractionally. I'm not really using this anyway, except for show. He paused. You don't have to keep using my old amulet, you know, he said. You could have another one made specifically for you. Dancer stroked the amulet Elena had made for Han, the one he'd been using since he lost his in Arden. I'm used to it now, and it's loaded with power. No reason to make a change. Han understood. Once linked with an amulet, it was painful to give it up. I have friends at Demon Eye Camp, Dancer went on. Not warriors, craftspeople. Depending on what happens with the coronation, I'd like to go over there if I can be spared. Isn't that dangerous, going to Demon Eye Camp? Han said, as a wizard. Everything is dangerous, Dancer replied, shrugging. Though it will be easier if you can keep Elena and Nightwalker away. Han nodded. I'll do my best to keep them busy keeping an eye on me. He paused. I asked you to come because I have a confession to make. I met with Crow again, on my way here. Swiveling away from Dancer's incredulous expression, Han filled a teapot with the water jug and set it on the hearth. You're not serious, Dancer said finally. You do have a death wish, I believe. Everything is dangerous, Han said, cocking an eyebrow at Dancer. He sat down on the edge of his sleeping bench and pulled off his boots. But I need your advice. Hmm, never go back? Dancer rolled his eyes. Somehow I don't think you'll take it. It's not as dangerous as you think, Han said. As I told you before, Crow doesn't have any power of his own. Then how exactly does he get to Edeon? Dancer said. When almost nobody else can get there. He uses mine, my flash. Without me, he can't do anything, Han said but he's incredibly knowledgeable about magic. Then who is he in real life? Dancer persisted. And why won't he agree to meet you on your home ground? If you can believe what he says, he doesn't exist in real life, Han said, serving up his story in small bites. He exists only in Edeon. He's a remnant of a wizard who lived long ago. A remnant? Dancer said skeptically. He's been in Edeon all this time, and he just happened to find you the first day you visited? Dancer pulled free a lock of hair, combed it straight with his fingers, split it into sections, and started interlacing them to make a braid. Han pulled the serpent amulet from under his shirt and tapped it with his first two fingers. Not in Edeon. Here. He's been waiting here for a thousand years, in this amulet. Dancer stared at the amulet then looked up at Han. He's been hiding in an amulet? I know a lot about flash pieces, and I never heard of that. He bit off a piece of string from a bundle in his pocket. There are lots of wizards in Odin's Ford, he said. Even more in the fells. Don't you think it's more likely Crow is one of them? He finished one braid, wrapping the lower end with colorful thread, and began another. Han spooned Highland Leaf into cups, then poured boiling water over it. And why won't he tell you who he is if he wants to partner with you? Dancer continued. Originally, he meant to use me, not partner with me, Han said. But the talisman you made put a stop to that. So last time we met, he told me who he really is. Dancer leaned forward. And? Han took a breath and spit it out. He claims he's Alger Waterlow, the last wizard king of the Fells. Dancer's hands stilled themselves, and he frowned. So you're meeting with someone who claims to be the demon king who nearly destroyed the world? Han nodded. Dancer gazed at him, speechless, for what seemed like forever. 
and you mean to keep meeting with him, he said finally, shaking his head. Han nodded again. I don't like it, Dancer said, with his usual gift for understatement. Either he's lying, which is bad, or he could be telling the truth, which is worse. He blew on his tea to cool it. Much worse. I don't like it either, Han admitted, but it's the only hand I have to play. That's why I asked you here, to get your opinion. How am I supposed to give you an opinion when I've never even met him? Dancer said. He sipped his tea, brow furrowed. Then he thumped the mug down on the hearthstone. That's it. I need to meet him and see for myself. Well, Han thought about this. He can't come here, so you'd need to go back to Edeon, and he'll be furious that I brought you along. Why is that? Dancer said. Why doesn't he want anyone else to see him? What is he hiding? He says he knows secrets the Bayars are hot for. If they find out I can talk to him, we're done. That's convenient, don't you think? Dancer snorted. Why should you believe him hunts alone? What has he ever done but try to use you and get what he wants? Dancer was right. In truth, since Rebecca had turned into Rasa, Han had lost faith in his own judgment. How could he have been so wrong about her? How could he have missed that he was walking out with a princess? Why should Han be following other people's rules when they broke the rules themselves? Dancer was his best friend and ally. It was time to begin treating him that way. All right, Han said. Come with me to Edeon and meet him and tell me what you think. If he's lying, the two of us might outsmart an imposter. Besides, I've arranged to... He stopped and cocked his head. Someone's coming. Immediately there came a tapping at the door. Han levered to his feet and crossed to the entrance. It was Willow with Lucius Frowsley in tow. It had been nearly a year since Han had seen his former employer, but the thousand-year-old man had retained the veneer of polish he'd sported at their last meeting. His hair and beard were trimmed and in order, his clothing tidier and in better repair than in the past. Lucius looks better off, and I'm probably worse off than before, Han thought. The recluse had been more than an employer. Han had trusted him, until he'd found out that Lucius had known the truth of Han's magical heritage and had never told him. What other secrets was Lucius hiding? One thing hadn't changed. The old man carried a bottle of product in one hand and a fistful of cups in the other. I sent a runner after Lucius, as you asked, Hanselone, Willow said, looking from Lucius to Han. Hello, Lucius, Han said, touching his arm to orient him. Boy! Lucius closed his eyes and smiled. His face crinkled like well-weathered badlands, as if he were basking in the warmth of Han's presence. Is there anything else you need, Hanselone? Willow asked. Han shook his head. Thank you, Willow. Send word to me when he's ready to go, she said, turning away and slipping out of the visitor's lodge. I can't tell you how happy I am that you're still alive. Lucius raised the bottle and waggled it suggestively. We have something to celebrate. Lucius always had something to celebrate. Han ushered him toward the hearth, his hand on the blind man's elbow. Here, sit by the fire, he said. Fire Dancer is here, too. Want tea? Tea? Making a disapproving face, Lucius settled onto the bench next to the hearth and carefully arranged his cups next to him. I'd prefer something stronger. Let's stick with tea for now, Han said. He refilled his own and Dancer's cups and made more tea for Lucius. Closing Lucius's hands around the cup, Han made sure he had a good hold before he returned to his seat. So. Lucius said, setting the tea aside without tasting it. Tell me everything, boy. Tell me about Odin's Ford. My years at the Academy were the best years of my life. Are the houses still fighting on Bridge Street? Still fighting, Han said, and the provosts are still rounding them up. Bloody provosts, Lucius muttered, his milky eyes fixed on some private memory. Them and their curfews. Alger... 
He used to tweak their pointy noses, let me tell you. He was like a vapor, that boy. He went wherever he wanted, whenever he wanted, and nothing the provost could do about it. That's who I wanted to talk to you about, Han said. Alger. Alger? Lucius's head jerked up, his expression wary. What about him? What was he like when you knew him? Han said. For instance, what did he look like? Well, he was devilish handsome, Lucius said. Blonde hair and blue eyes the color of the Indio in midsummer. Ladies claimed you could drown in him. Well built he was, and he moved like a cat. I wasn't so bad in my day, but never could compete with Alger Waterloo when it came to the ladies. Lucius rubbed his nose with the heel of his hand. Me and Alger, we once spent a whole weekend in the women's dormitory at the temple school. Bunch of dedicates decided against taking vows after that. Lucius grinned a gap-toothed grin, which faded quickly. Course, all that catting around ended when he met Hannah Leah. How did he get along with the other students? Han asked. There was just something different about him, Lucius said. Folks wanted to be with him. He'd draw you in. Soon as he'd walk into a room, he'd be the center of attention. Everybody loved him. Han rubbed his chin. He was supposed to believe that the flame-eyed demon king of the stories was the bang-up cove of Odin's ford. Everybody loved him, except Kinley Bayar, that is, Lucius amended. Kinley Bayar? Han asked. Who's that? Remember? He was the one who was to marry Queen Hanalea. Oh, right, Han said. They was like oil and water, Kinley and Alger. Kinley always wanted to be in charge. So did Alger. And whenever he and Kinley went head to head, Alger usually won, and Kinley couldn't abide losing. Have you ever been to Edeon? Han asked abruptly. Edeon? Lucius said, blinking at the rapid change of topic. Of course, plenty of times. That was our back alley highway, our secret meeting place, especially during the Civil War. Which made sense, if Crow was telling the truth. Dancer and I have been to Edeon, too, Han said. I've met someone there who claims to be Alger Waterloo. Lucius's dreamy expression slid away. Alger, what are you talking about? The old man leaned forward, agitated, his Adam's apple jumping as he swallowed. That's why I wanted to talk to you, Han said. It doesn't seem possible... But that's what he claims, and he knows more about magic than anyone I've met. Alja, Lucius breathed. His burled hands scrabbled in his lap as if trying to gain a purchase on the idea. Alja, alive. Who would have thought? Well, not exactly alive, Han said. He claims he's been hidden in his old amulet all this time. Han touched the serpent flash piece then remembered that Lucius couldn't see it. He describes himself as a remnant, not a ghost exactly, but he can't exist in real life. Not as himself, anyway. Lucius licked his lips, his face more pasty pale than usual. You sure about that boy? You sure he can't find a way? Well, Han shrugged. He says not. Anything's possible when it comes to Alger Waterloo, Lucius said. If I'm alive, then he could be too. Did he say anything about me? He pawed at Han's arm. Did he say what he wants? Tell me. Han shook his head, worried the old man might have a stroke. He hasn't said much about the past, except that he wants revenge on the Bayars. He seems... he seems bitter about what happened. He should be bitter. Lucius said. He's got reason. Turning, he groped for his bottle and pulled the cork with his teeth. He splashed product into a cup, his hand shaking, then drained it and poured again. He also seems to blame Hanalia, Han said, for betraying him. Lucius shook his head, eyes squeezed shut, his hands wrapped around his tin cup. But is that even possible? Han went on. 
that he could last a thousand years hidden in an amulet, based on what you know about magic and what you knew about him? You listen to me, Lucius said, his eyes popping open again. I don't know how it could be done, but if anyone could do it, he could. He emptied his cup with one gulp and refilled it. Sweet they have the mountains. I'll just come back. Whoa, now, Han said, putting his hand on the old man's arm. Lucius flinched, nearly spilling his drink. I'm not absolutely sure it's him. It could be some kind of a trick. I was hoping you could tell me something. Some question I could ask him that only he would know the answer to. Something Alja would know. Lucius frowned, blotting his forehead with his sleeve. Let me think. While he was thinking, Han rose and refilled their teacups. Except for Lucius's, which was still full. Is two things, Lucius said abruptly. Two things that only Alja would know. First, what was their secret meeting place, him and Analia's? And... What did he give to her as a love token when they were betrothed? All right, Han said, thinking Alger and Lucius must have been tight friends if Lucius knew these kinds of secrets. What are the answers? They used to meet in the conservatory at Fellsmarch Castle, right over Ranalia's bedchamber, Lucius said. Maybe it's still there. There was a secret passage from her room to the garden. The conservatory. Han repeated. And what did he give Hanalia? It was a ring, moonstones and sapphires and pearls, Lucia said. Because he only ever saw her by moonlight, he said. Hanalia wore it the rest of her life. He shuddered. Imagine what it was like for him, trapped in that amulet while Hanalia grew old and died. Strange, Han thought. It wasn't just that Lucius thought Crow's story was possible. He seemed convinced already that it was true. Like he'd been waiting to hear it for a thousand years. Like it was inevitable. What are you gonna do, boy? Lucius asked, breaking into Han's thoughts. Me and Dancer are going to Edeon tonight, Han said. I'm going to find out if he is who he says he is. Look, Dancer said. Even if he is who he says he is, and even if Lucius is willing to vouch for him, how do we know we can trust him? A thousand years locked in an amulet can change a person. He may be planning to finish the job he started during the breaking. Boy, does he know who you are? Lucius asked. Does he know you're his blood? No, Hans said. He doesn't seem to know much that's happened while he was, uh, locked up. Hans shrugged. I didn't know whether to tell him or not. You should tell him, Lucius said. He deserves to know that his line didn't die with him. That could make all the difference. He can help you. He'll want to help you. Believe me, you want him on your side. The old man stood, grabbing up his bottle and cups. Cool, Willow, he said. I'm ready to go home. And he refused to say anything more. Chapter 21 Back in Edeon After Lucius left, Han asked Willow's healer apprentices to keep any other visitors away. He warned them that he and Dancer would be using dangerous, unstable magic and laid magical barriers around the perimeter to prevent their being interrupted. Then he and Dancer sat down on adjacent sleeping benches in the corner of the room. You sure you want to do this? Dancer said. Lucius seemed to think that Alja Waterlow is capable of almost anything. He seems frightened of him, almost. In a way, it supports his story, Han said. If we can believe Lucius, Alger was powerful enough to conceal himself in an amulet for a thousand years. Why would anyone want to do that? Dancer said. Maybe if you were desperate for revenge, Han said, or willing to do whatever it takes to win. Like me he added to himself. They sat in silence for a moment, each alone with his own thoughts. Have you ever tried returning to Edeon? Han asked, since that day in Griffin's class. No, I haven't, Dancer said, staring up at the ceiling. 
I never saw much use in it, and after what happened to you the first time, I wasn't eager to try it again. We should go, Hans said, after another long pause. I can bring you along, or you can come on your own power. I'll come on my own, Dancer said. That way I can leave on my own. Are you wearing your Rowan talisman? Dancer reached up and touched his own. He'd made one for himself after Hans had prevented Crow from possessing him. Han nodded, opening his collar so Dancer could see. Wait a few minutes before you follow me. I'll give Crow a bit of warning that you're coming. Han didn't know if that was a good or a bad idea, but it seemed only fair. I don't think it really matters where we meet as far as Crow is concerned. He's just always there, waiting. But let's you and me meet in Mistwork Tower. What if Crow doesn't show, Han thought. I'll look like a fool. That was the least of his worries. He lay back, closing his eyes, and spoke the familiar words that would let him pass through the portal, and opened his eyes to Mistwork Tower. Midnight. Moonlight shafted down from the windows, kindling the dust motes in the air. Crow sat cross-legged on the floor in front of Han, dressed all in black, eyes closed, head bowed, his flax hair the only brilliant thing about him. If Han didn't know better, he'd have guessed he was either despondent or praying. Han reorganized his clothes, ridding himself of the clan garb he'd been wearing and arraying himself in elegant flair, down to the glittering rings on his fingers. It had become his way of honoring Crow, of meeting him on his own turf. Crow opened his eyes and blinked up at him. Alistair! He scrambled to his feet, brushing at his somber clothing. Then glittered up a bit, sprouting rings and sequins and jewels, as if to present a more cheerful appearance. You're alive! He looked eagerly into Han's face, examining it for damage. Are you... are you well? How are you feeling? Han shrugged, surprised at Crow's concern. I'll live. It's true, then, that the Maker looks after fools, Crow said, sounding more like his usual self. You nearly killed yourself healing that girl. You stripped your amulet and yourself. I thought you were dead. Why did you do it? Han didn't know how to answer that question, in the past or present tense. She was important to me. I had to try to save her. Did she live? Crow asked. Was all that sacrifice worth it? She's alive, Han said. I haven't decided whether it was worth it or not. Crow laughed, and it was unexpectedly charming. You're learning, Alistair. I told you not to go to war over a woman, though you must be a foolhardy sort if you came back here. I'm still not convinced you're telling the truth, Han said. I've asked someone to join us here, someone I trust. Crow's smile faded, replaced by irritation. No, absolutely not. Our bargain was you come alone. No one else is supposed to know I even exist. Our bargain was you'd help me against the Bayars, not treat me like a sweet mark. You've got no business squeaking about the rules now. Crow began pacing back and forth. I'm trying to protect you. The Bayars have been trying to pry me free of that amulet for a thousand years. If they find out that you can communicate with me, what do you think will happen to you? Do you look forward to hours of torture in the dungeon at Airy House? I've been there, and believe me, I have no desire to go back. When you meet my friend, you'll realize there's not much chance he'll cackle to the Bayars, Han said. Or that they'd listen if he did. It's too late anyway. I... As if he'd called Dancer by speaking of him, the air between them thickened and rippled, and Dancer appeared, clad in fine ceremonial clan garb. Crow took two steps back, eyes wide, raising his arms in defense. Instinctively, Han stepped between Dancer and Crow. Dancer looked momentarily disoriented, then fixed his gaze on Crow. You're smaller than I expected, Dancer said, cocking his head. And no flaming eyes. 
Crow grew fractionally larger and more brilliant, like a peacock displaying his plumage or a street lord making show. A copperhead? You brought a copperhead here to meet me? Crow lowered his arm slowly, staring at Dancer like he was a demon himself. No, he whispered, his brow furrowed. That's not right. You're a wizard disguised as a copperhead. Dancer fingered his talisman. Of course I'm a wizard, or I wouldn't be here. I'm also clan. Hayden Fire Dancer, meet Alger Waterlow, Han said, rather formally. Crow seemed as edgy as a cat in rag market. There's something about you, he whispered, his eyes riveted on Dancer. Something hidden, something dangerous, something you don't want anybody to see. Have we met before? Dancer shook his head. This is only my second time in Edeon. We have some questions to ask you, all right? Han said, beginning to lose patience. Questions? Crow's gaze flickered to Han. What questions? You say you're Alger Waterlow, the last of the gifted kings. If so, then tell me where you used to meet Hanalea in secret before you ran off together. That's no one's business but my own, Crow said, pressing his lips together as if he never meant to open them again. It's our business if we're going to partner up, Han said. Send the copperhead away, Crow said. I've no desire to partner with him. Then we'll talk. Han shook his head. I want him here as witness. Otherwise, we're both out of here. It was street bravado. He couldn't let Crow know how desperate he was for his help. Crow scowled and gave in. Very well. Hannah Leah and I used to meet in the glass house at Fellsmarch Castle, he said. There was a passage through the walls from her chambers. Glass house, Hans said uncertainly. Lucius had said the conservatory. The conservatory, Crow said, waving his hand. It's like a glass garden. Hans struggled to keep his street face while his stomach lurched. Was it possible Crow was telling the truth? All right, then, Hans said. Sounds plausible. What did you give Hanalea as a handfast gift? Crow's eyes narrowed. Who told you that? he demanded. Where is this coming from? Han hesitated a moment. Do you remember Lucius Frowsley? Crow seemed lost. Frowsley? He shook his head. I don't really... He looked up. Do you mean Lucas? He said. Lucas Frazier? He was in school with me at Mistwork. He was my best friend. But that was a thousand years ago. Han frowned. Had Lucius changed his name? Maybe, Han said. It's a long story, but he's still alive. He gave me these questions, and the answers. Lucas, Crow whispered, more to himself than to Han. Is it possible? I'd nearly forgotten about... that. He was so eager to live forever, but I had no idea if... Just answer the question, will you? Han said. Crow's brilliant eyes fixed on Han. I gave Hanalia a ring... Moonstones and pearls and sapphires. And she gave me a gold ring, engraved with her name on the inside, so I'd always have her against my skin. He laughed bitterly. The Bayars took it from me, along with everything else. It's really true, then, Dancer said, his hand closing reflexively around his amulet. You are the Demon King. Crow turned toward Dancer, then stumbled back a step as recognition flooded into his face and fired in his eyes. Speaking of demons, Crow said, his voice low and dangerous. I believe you have a demon's face. Springing forward, he smashed into Dancer as he had done when he'd taken possession of Micah in Edeon. But again he bounced back, driven off by the Rowan talisman. You're a filthy bear, Crow cried, rolling to his feet, 
his image rippling and fraying like a flag in the wind. Did you think I wouldn't know you after all these years? Do you think I wouldn't recognize that airy house stench? His voice trembled, his face twisting in revulsion. Dancer just stood there as if frozen, saying nothing. I told you how important it was to keep my existence a secret, especially from the Bayars, Crow said to Han, his voice low and furious. Now you've gambled away what little chance you had in the first place. You're mistaken, Han said, since Dancer still said nothing. Use your eyes. Dancer's no Bayar. He's clan, raised at Marisa Pines. I've known him since we were litlings. Kill him. Crow said through clenched teeth. Kill him now or we'll all suffer the consequences. Why is it you're always trying to goad me into killing somebody? Han demanded. You're a fool, Alistair, Crow said, and I was a fool to trust you. He sizzled out like a dying spark. Han and Dancer both stared at the spot he'd vacated. I'm sorry, Hans alone, Dancer said with a heavy sigh. I hope I haven't ruined it for you. I know you were counting on his help. What got into him? Han said. Maybe you were right. A thousand years trapped in an amulet has made him crazy. Dancer shook his head. Or maybe he's good at spotting a Bayar, that's all, he said quietly. As Han watched, Dancer's clothes changed from clan leggings and shirt to wizard robes, the stoles emblazoned with the stooping falcon. His hair, however, was still braided and tied in clan fashion. My mother is clan, Hunts alone, Dancer said. Have you ever wondered who my father was? Well, I heard the story, what Willow said at your naming, Han said, his voice trailing away. It was true, most of it, Dancer said except the part where she claimed she didn't know who it was. Can you think of a wizard ruthless enough to come into the spirit and attack a young woman in the forest like that? Hans studied Dancer's features, the jarring blue eyes set into his bronzed face, the angular bone structure, the heavy dark brows. As understanding dawned, Hans' throat constricted painfully, as if there were a large rock he was trying to swallow. The resemblance is rather striking once you know to look for it, Dancer said matter-of-factly. Hanalia's blood and bones, Han whispered, shaking his head. Your father is Gavin Bayar. No wonder Dancer had viewed his gift as a curse. You don't know how tempting it's been to present myself to Micah and Fiona as their long-lost older brother, Dancer said. Almost worth getting myself killed, for a time, that seemed like an easy way out. I'd step forward as a Bayar, and they would murder me. Memories came back to Han. Dancer's furious reaction when they'd met Micah and his cousins on Hanalea. It had seemed so out of character at the time. Dancer's knowledge of wizards and their ways, uncommon among the spirit clans. Micah's reaction to Dancer each time they met. Do the Bayars know? Han said. Dancer shook his head, half-smiling. I think Micah sees his father in me. It's like he knows on some instinctive level, but he just can't bring himself to believe it. I've never met Lord Bayar. If he knew, I'd be dead already. What about the demon eye? Averil? Elena Sinestra? Do they know? Dancer shook his head. If they knew, they'd have drowned me at birth. Willow and I are the only ones that knew. Now you... And Crow, unfortunately. Han recalled when Willow had brought Dancer to the city to Speaker Jemson, hoping to cure him of his cursed gift. She'd kept the secret for a lifetime, trying to find a place for the son she loved in a world at war with itself. Why didn't you tell me? Han asked, his mind reeling. You're one to talk, Dancer arrowed back. How many secrets have you kept from me? I'm not criticizing you, Han said. I'm just asking why. I didn't know myself until I began to manifest, Dancer said. After I almost told you, several times. 
but I knew how you felt about the Bayars after what happened to your family. I didn't know how you would react. And now there's Kat. She hates the Bayars. They murdered all of her friends. And my mother, Willow, she made me swear never to tell. Dancer spoke matter-of-factly, looking directly into Han's eyes. For a long time I didn't want anyone to know, but now I'm glad you found out. I'm tired of acting like it's our fault, like I'm ashamed of who I am. I can't control what other people do, but I can decide how I'm going to handle it. Anger sparked in Han. Why should Dancer and Willow bear that burden, keeping their secret, always worrying it would come out, worrying what the Bayars would do if they knew? Does Willow have proof? Han asked. That it was a Bayar, I mean. She still has the Bayar's ring, Dancer said. When she found out she was with child, she hid the ring away and claimed she didn't know who the father was. When Han opened his mouth to speak, Dancer raised a hand to stop him. She was trying to protect me from the Bayars and the Demon Eye. But once it was clear I was gifted, it became too big a secret to keep. I knew it would come out sooner or later. She should have named him, Han growled, and brought him to justice. We may think so, Dancer said, nodding, but she has a bone-deep fear of Bayar that she can't shake. Being attacked so close to home destroyed her confidence. She has never felt completely safe since. He paused. Bayar is going to pay for that. Han put his hand on Dancer's shoulder, squeezing it. You're my best friend, he said. I don't care who your father was. Dancer shrugged. I hope Kat feels the same way. I'm going to tell her. I don't want to keep secrets from her either. Not anymore. He fingered his amulet. Let's not say anything to Willow. Not until after the Queen's funeral, anyway. She's worried enough as it is that I'm going. She doesn't want me anywhere near Bayar. That's up to you, Han said, still trying to get his head around this news. It's your secret, but I think you should talk to her soon. Chapter 22 Making a Point You have to trust Han Alistair, Rasa told herself over and over. Even though he hates you now, you don't have a choice. Well, in fact, she did have a choice. Lots of choices. She could go with the well-insulated sneak-in-and-out plan her father favored, or the abduction plan Reed Nightwalker was pushing. But she wanted to honor Han by trusting him, since she hadn't trusted him before. She only hoped she was making the right decision. It didn't help that Nightwalker had made it abundantly plain that he didn't trust Han Alistair or his plan. Han had sketched it out the day before in a brief business-like meeting. Just the three of them, like he'd said. And Rasa had approved of it. Then they had shared it with the others, who didn't approve. Nightwalker could be relentless and persuasive. The sun wasn't even up, but he'd been distracting her for the last hour while she tried to get ready to travel to the memorial. The topic was Han Alistair and his plan. He's a jinx-flinger, Nightwalker said. How can you trust him to side with you against the Wizard Council? Isn't that the idea? Rasa said, rubbing her eyes. Wasn't that why Elena Sinestra recruited him? He's supposed to be the secret weapon. I didn't say we shouldn't use him. I'm saying we shouldn't trust him with your life. Nightwalker leaned against the lodge pole in the Matriarch Lodge, lithe and deadly as a fells cat. He dressed for battle, in the sunlight and shadow coat and leggings, his demon eye amulet glittering at his neck. He didn't look droopy-eyed at all, though no doubt he'd been up half the night reinforcing his rights to the clan name Nightwalker. Rasa had seen him and Nightbird kissing goodbye outside the visitor's lodge at dawn when Rasa went out to the privy. So they were still together, apparently. She forced her attention back to the present. Han hates the High Wizard, Rasa said. I can't imagine him throwing in with them. That's what he's told you. But he has more in common with them than he does with any of us. Rasa sat back on her heels, resting her hands on her thighs. 
You're doing it again, she said. Treating me like I'm stupid. I spent time with Alistair at Odin's Ford. I know him better than you do. I know what I'm doing. Nightwalker raised both hands. Forgive me, your highness. He stopped and cleared his throat self-consciously. It seems that I'm always apologizing to you. I think I spend too much time with people who agree with me. He took a breath. Despite my lack of diplomacy, it is not my intention to question your judgment. It is just that I'm concerned about your safety. Raisa blinked at him, surprised. This was more introspection than she was used to from Nightwalker. But still, she wouldn't let him off that easily. I suppose that's why you want to go to war against my sister, a princess of the blood, when you don't even know her intentions. Nightwalker shook his head. I only wanted to take her out of play. It would be safer for you and safer for her as well. There's not going to be any fighting, Raisa said. That will keep us all safe. She sorted through clothing, trying to figure out what she would wear that would send the right message to those assembled for her mother's memorial service. No, she amended, pressing her fingertips against her brow. What can I wear that will honor my mother and her legacy? She didn't have much to choose from, only what the clans had provided since her arrival. Everything else had been left behind in Fell's March and Odin's Ford. She thought of the closets of elaborate dresses back in the capital and sighed. You are a beggar of a queen, Raisa thought, always guesting in someone else's house and wearing borrowed clothes. She chose a gourd clan skirt in boiled white wool and a beaded overtunic in lightweight suede and draped them over her sleeping bench. Willow had given her a fine white deerskin jacket with painted and embroidered gray wolf symbols on the back and sleeves. Clan morning dress didn't mirror the dark, weedy look of flatland funeral garb. It celebrated the lives of the dead and their connections with the living. Wait outside for me, please, Raisa said to Nightwalker, who seemed inclined to remain glued to her side until it was time to leave for Mariana Peak. Elena's orders, maybe, with two wizards in camp? Or was it his own inclination? Nightwalker took hold of her elbows and drew her in for a lingering kiss. He smelled of leather and fresh air. Raisa drew back a little reluctantly. He seemed eager to resume where they'd left off. She knew from experience that Reed Nightwalker could be a welcome distraction from all of her troubles, if she would let him. He could help her forget that Han Alistair was treating her like poison. Nightwalker, go. I need to dress. We'll be leaving soon. The warrior's smoky-eyed smile made it plain that he'd gladly stay and supervise. But he ducked through the doorway into the outer room. Raisa sighed. Whenever she was with Nightwalker, she felt under siege, personally and in all other ways. She needed to find a channel for his relentless intensity. He wore her out. She missed Eamon's steadiness. He had ridden back to Fellsmart so he could accompany his father's ashes from the cathedral temple to their burying place. Averil was also back in the city and would travel to the memorial service with Mariana's beer. Raisa would have the demon eye with her and Han Alistair and Fire Dancer. That was all, and that would have to be enough. She hoped she could keep them from each other's throats. Raisa was just pulling on her boots when she heard raised voices outside, what sounded like an argument. She poked her head through the curtains to find Han Alistair and Reed Nightwalker circling each other like alpha wolves, hackles raised and nearly snarling. Han was dressed more finely than she'd ever seen him, all in black with a pearl-gray trim at the neck and on the sleeves. His shirt fit close to his body, showing off his distractingly lean, muscular frame. The lone hunter amulet glittered against the matte fabric, and the dark color set off his bright hair and blue eyes. What is going on? she demanded, looking from one to the other. I told him he couldn't go in, that you were dressing. He's objecting, Nightwalker said, his posture one of barely contained violence. I just wanted to let you know that I was here, Han said, shifting his eyes to Raisa, then quickly back to Nightwalker. 
I have work to do and not much time, if you don't want to be late for the ceremony. I'm ready, Rasa said, taking a deep breath. Let's begin. Han looked pointedly at Nightwalker and jerked his head toward the door. Out. I'm staying, Reed Demon I said, folding his arms and widening his stance as if he never intended to budge. We should do this in private, Your Highness, Han said. If I'm going to protect you, the fewer who know what I'm up to, the better. Han spoke to Rasa, ignoring Nightwalker. Well, Rasa thought, this is a welcome change. Ever since Rasa had confessed her true identity, Han hadn't spoke to her more often or at greater length than he had to. It was as if he had to pay a dear price for every word he spoke. I will not leave you alone with the Princess Air, Nightwalker said. It's too much of a risk, given the history of Jinxflinger interference with our queens. These two hate each other, Rasa thought, and it seems to go beyond the usual suspicion between wizard and clan. After all, Han should be comfortable with the spirit clans. He'd fostered with them throughout his boyhood. He hadn't even been a wizard all that long. A clearing of throats startled her. She looked up to find they were both looking at her, waiting for a decision. I've known Nightwalker for years, Rasa said to Han. He's serving as part of my guard today. If he can be trusted with that, then surely... I don't want him here distracting me, Han said. This is hard enough as is. So you admit it, Nightwalker said. You don't know what you're doing. That's exactly the kind of flap-jawed, ignorant remark that I don't need while I'm working, Han said, looking at Rasa and raising his eyebrows as if to say, See? He stays, Rasa said, feeling like she was refereeing in the schoolyard. But be quiet, Nightwalker, and allow Alistair to do his work or you're out. Han jerked his chin at Nightwalker. You, sit in the corner and out of the way if you don't want to get splashed with magic. Nightwalker scowled suspiciously, but did as he was told. Han circled around Rasa, appraising her. Stand still, he warned her. I'm going to have to touch you. He sounded resigned to it more than anything else. Han slid his hand inside his coat, and Rasa knew he was gripping the serpent amulet. Maybe that was why he didn't want Nightwalker there. He didn't seem to want to display that amulet to anyone in the camps. Rasa tensed up, her skin tingling in anticipation of the contact. His fingers hissed and fizzed as they brushed lightly against her head, her shoulders, the back of her neck, her waist. It reminded Rasa of the sculptor who'd struck her portrait for the crown coin, getting the feel of the clay before he shaped it. Han stepped back and rubbed his chin, frowning. Then his expression cleared as he stared down at her hand. Oh, he said, you need to take off the talisman ring or it won't work. Rasa looked down at the wolf ring on her right hand. Your Highness, Elena Demon I gave you that ring for protection against Jinxflinger charms, Nightwalker said. Now would not be a good time to take it off, not when you're going to be facing the most powerful Jinxflingers in the Vale. Now would be a very good time to take it off, Han said, if you want this plan to work. Forgetting about Alistair and what he might be up to, that ring protects you if one of the wizards at the memorial decides to flame you. Nightwalker argued. Without it, you'll be vulnerable. He paused, then murmured, not quite under his breath, unless that's the idea. She won't be vulnerable if you shut up and let me do my job, Han said, his hand still inside his neckline, his chin cocked up aggressively. Stop it, Rasa said. She slid the ring from her finger and tucked it into a pouch at her belt. There, I'll have it right here in case I need it. You'd better hurry. It must be nearly time to leave. This time was different. Han murmured charms as he circled around her, his face hard with concentration, his eyes fixed and focused internally. His fingers kindled little fires wherever he touched her. Rasa gasped as the magic slid under her skin, bringing the blood to the surface. She felt glowing and dizzy-headed, like she'd just stepped out of the sweat lodge at Demon Eye Camp. 
or like a lover after an episode of kissing. Nightwalker watched from his corner, taut as a bowstring. Then the wolves came. Singly and in pairs, they slid under the canvas dividers and through the walls, eyes bright, tongues lolling, until a dozen were assembled, sitting on their haunches in a circle around them. It reminded Rasa of the dream she'd had after Byrne was killed in Marisa Pine's Pass, the visitation of the Wolf Queens on the night her mother died. There was gray-eyed Hanalea and green-eyed Althea. Sometimes, for a split second, she thought she saw the queens themselves. Han glanced at the wolves, then back at Rasa. Friends of yours? Rasa blinked at him. You can see them? I've been seeing them, off and on, since we... since I healed you, Han said. I hoped they would come today. I don't know if this will work, but... He extended his hands toward the wolf queens. Flame danced on his fingertips. Light arced from his hands to the wolves and back to him. Hanalea tilted her head, gazing at Han with a wolfish grin. Why would Han Alistair see wolves, Rasa wondered. That was a trait of the gray wolf line linked to the gift of prophecy. It didn't make sense. Must be some quirk of the healing process, she thought of their joining together. The wolves closed their eyes and laid back their ears. Lifting their muzzles toward the sky, they began to howl, a mournful cry that raised the hair on Race's neck. Oh, she said, shivering. Nightwalker came upright, looking ready to spring. What is it, Briar Rose? What did he do? Your Highness, have you ever noticed how hard it is to concentrate and do things right when somebody's yammering in your ear? Han said. If this goes wrong, I'm just saying, I'm not the one to blame. Despite his sardonic tone, sweat pebbled his forehead and dewed his upper lip, like he was expending considerable energy, or was nervous about the outcome. The wolves finished their dirge. Hanalea turned toward Rasa and dipped her head. The royal pack melted into shadow and dissipated. Han withdrew his hand and stood, head down, taking quick, shallow breaths like he'd run a great race. The lone hunter amulet underlit his face, creating shadows and highlighting planes. Sweat dripped off him, spotting the rug. Rasa wrapped her arms around herself, gripping her elbows to either side. She still tingled all over, but that seemed to be the only lasting effect. Was it... did it work? she asked. Han raised his head and blotted perspiration from his forehead with his sleeve. We'll see soon enough. Rasa saw the question on Nightwalker's face and decided to ask it herself, thinking she might actually get an answer. What were you trying to do? I was creating a sending. A sending? What's that? A glamour. An image to use once we're on Mariana Peak. Something that will impress and confuse the Wizard Council and the rest of the Blue Bloods. Something that will make you a difficult target. Han glanced at Nightwalker. Remember? I said I would create a magical distraction, he said, as if Nightwalker needed simple speech. Can I put my ring back on? Rasa asked, pressing her fingers against her pouch. Han frowned, biting his lower lip, then shook his head. Better not. I think we have to keep the magical connection alive until after. Elena poked her head through the doorway. Are you ready? We must go, granddaughter. Rasa would ride hidden amid the demon eye contingent escorting her grandmother to the Queen's Memorial. Fire Dancer waited with the ponies. Han pulled him aside, leaned in, and murmured something in his ear. Dancer nodded, looking at Rasa. Nightwalker came and draped a demon-eye shadow cloak over Race's funeral garb, fastening it at the neck and letting his hands linger on her shoulders. The memorial for the Queen was scheduled for late afternoon. Their journey would take them the better part of the day since they intended to keep to the mountains, circling around the Vale from Marisa Pines, crossing the Dernwater to the west of Fellsmarch, and coming at Mariana Peak from the northwest. Elena and Willow rode alongside Rasa, while the demon-eye warriors rode ahead and behind. 
Han and Dancer rode side by side, hands on their amulets, stoking them up for what lay ahead. Raisa wondered how much Hans had been drained by the creation of the Sending. She hoped it would be worth the cost. Whenever Raisa looked at them, the two wizards had their heads together, talking quietly as they rode along. Dancer carried two large panniers on his pony, in addition to his bedroll. It would be a cold, clear day in the mountains, perhaps a bit warmer downslope where the service would be. The stars blinked out to the east as the sun broke over the spirits, spilling into the vale below. Mother would love this day, Raisa said to Elena, squinting against the slanting light. She loved the sun, even if she didn't love the cold. Mm. Elena seemed preoccupied, no doubt worrying about her son, Avril. Love makes you vulnerable, Raisa thought, and yet she'd always hoped for it. They crossed the Dernwater in early afternoon on a high bridge over the river's foaming roar. Though they were too high to smell it, the water below carried with it all the filth and jetsam of the overcrowded capital to the east. When I am queen, Raisa thought, as she had so many times before, and stopped. I am queen. They climbed high into the northern spirits again, catching glimpses of the greening vale below. Raisa eagerly drank in views of the spires, domes, and turrets of faraway Fellsmarch. It glittered in the sunlight like a child's fairy city, the kind of place that disappeared when you came too close. I'm coming home, she swore, tonight if I have my way. Northwest of the Vale, they would leave the trail that overlooked it and strike north and east again to come in behind Mariana and descend between her twin peaks. They paused at the joining of the trails to eat and rest the horses before the long climb ahead. Leaving Switcher in the hands of Nightbird, Raisa walked a short distance through the trees to where she could take a last look into the Vale before they rounded the shoulder of the mountain and it disappeared from view. The valley had come alive with people. Travelers clogged the roads, using conveyances appropriate to their stations. Some rode on fine horses, leaving the roads and cutting cross-country when they became impatient with their slow progress. Fine carriages competed for space with wagons packed with those who could spare a girlie for a ride. And some came afoot, even entire families, mothers and fathers carrying small children, Scarves wrapped around their faces to turn the dust of the road. They jammed the roads that descended from Fellsmarch, crossed the Vale, and climbed Mariana to the north. The citizens of Fellsmarch were turning out to say goodbye to their queen. Raisa was touched and surprised. Mariana had not been popular, at least among the folk in the poorer neighborhoods of the capital. They had exploded in riots when it was rumored that the queen meant to set Raisa aside and name Melanie heir in her place. Sweet martyred lady, she whispered. It looks like the entire city is on the move. Ragmarket and Southbridge, anyway, plus all the blue bloods, of course. Raisa flinched and turned. Han Alistair stood next to her, looking down on the veil. He could ghost about like any clan warrior. He shaded his eyes, the wind ruffling his hair. Maybe West Market, Roast Meat Hill, and the Bottoms, too. What do you mean? she said. How do you know? I sent Cat Tyburn down to the city, Han said. Told her to spread the word that the Princess Raisa would be here and might need an assist. That there were them that might try and take her throne away from her, or hush her on the spot, or slap her in Darby's. He slid easily back into the thieves' camp she'd spent months tutoring him out of. What? She tilted her head, looking up at him. After we went to all this effort to keep my presence a secret, you spread it all over town? Han rubbed the back of his neck. Do you think Lord Bayar listens to rumors from Ragmarket? Do you think the Council of Nobles meets in the Keg and Crown? He laughed. The raggers and southies are no danger to you unless you're carrying a fat purse through the streets. It's the blue bloods you gotta watch out for. I hear they're rum liars and connivers. He looked straight at her, 
his blue eyes hard and brilliant as sapphires. The pressure of his gaze was like a physical blow, but Raisa forced herself to stand her ground. Han, I'm sorry I lied to you, she said, putting her hand on his arm. If I had it to do over, I'd... There are no do-overs, are there, your highness? Han said. No, Raisa said. But... Anyway, don't worry about Ragmarket, Han said, stepping back, pulling free of her grasp. It's the shoulder tap in the back hall of the palace you should worry about. He seemed determined not to get into the unfinished business between them. I know that, Raisa said, giving up. Despite that, I plan to return to Felsmarch Castle tonight as queen-to-be. Han glanced over his shoulder to where the demon eye were busy with the horses. They're not going to be happy about that idea, he said, especially Nightwalker. He can't control you down in the city. He doesn't control me now, Raisa snapped. He means to marry you, Han said, staring out over the valley. Just so you know. Raisa resisted the impulse to look back at Nightwalker. What makes you think that? He's not that hard to figure out. He lifted his chin, the angled light revealing a faint reddish stubble in profile. Raisa wrenched her mind back to the conversation. Well, if he wants to marry me, he'll have to stand in line, she said. I'm sick and tired of being a means to an end. Han turned to look at her, puzzlement flickering over his face. A means to an end? You? What do you mean? Everybody wants to marry the bloody throne. Nobody would be interested if I lived in Ragmarket. I think I'll stay a maid. You have to marry, right? So you can assure a peaceful succession? He'd resumed his carefully blank expression, but she noticed his hands were fisted at his sides. Like the one we're having right now? She waited, and when he said nothing, went on. I know you agree with me, Raisa said. I need to get back to the palace immediately or chance losing the throne. And you're telling me this because... I need your help. To return to Felsmarch, I mean. I'll need protection. Han shrugged. Wasn't that the agreement, that I'd fight the wizard council on behalf of the clans and the true line of the queens? That detached, mocking tone was becoming annoyingly familiar. I've hurt him, Raisa thought. I've hurt him badly, and violated his trust. Somehow I have to find a way to win it back, to win him back, to prove myself to him. I wasn't there when the agreement was made, Raisa said, looking into his eyes. Anyway, that was between you and the clans. I know you're still resentful of the bargain you made, understandably. I don't need some grudging, half-hearted letter-of-the-law effort. That will get me killed. That'd be a shame, Han murmured. He paused, thinking, his fair brows drawn together. Isn't that Corporal Burns' job? Protecting you, I mean. You planning to make him captain of the Queen's Guard? Raisa nodded. He already is, in a way. I'll make it public at the coronation. But I'll need both of you, she said. Even that might not be enough. What's in it for me? Han asked, squinting into the distance. I'm a sellsword, after all. What are you offering in trade, since you seem intent on buying me all over again? His tone was light, but Raisa heard the traitor underneath the words. What do you want? Raisa asked. Han pretended to study on it, but she suspected he had the answers ready. Well, first off, I'll need a crib in the palace so I can keep an eye on you and everyone else. A nice place, mind you he said, narrowing his eyes as if she might try to cheat him out of his due. Big enough so guests can stay over, adjoining your rooms. Adjoining my... Raisa frowned. No, that's not possible. Having a wizard next door wasn't a good idea. It had never been done. Even Gavin Bayar and Queen Mariana had kept a gallery between them. Han raised his hands, palms up. Do you want protection or not? Do you want me clear across the palace when you need me? When she still hesitated, he added, You asked what I wanted, remember? I won't take a job if I can't do it right. You know who'll get the blame if it goes wrong. All right, she said, 
wondering how Eamon Byrne would react to this idea. But no guests, not right next door to my chambers. For security reasons, she told herself. He smiled crookedly. Your Highness, I have lots of friends who've never even been in a palace, and... She held up her hand. Never mind, Alistair. I can tell this isn't going to work. I'll take my chances with... You win, he interrupted, as if knowing he'd pushed too far. No guests. Overnight, anyway. She gazed into his face for a long moment, and he looked back steadily. All right, then. So we are agreed. We... Second, I'll need a monthly stipend, he said. The clans are paying my living expenses, but I don't want to have to rely on that, in case they get aggravated with me. I got people to keep in the city, so... He looked sideways at her, as if to assess the size of her purse. Fifty girlies to start. Fifty girlies? Raisa rolled her eyes. Who are you keeping, a harem of fancy girls? It wouldn't surprise her, given the stories she'd heard about the street lord Cuffs Alistair. It isn't your business what I do with the money, Han said. You just have to decide whether it's worth it to you. Raisa sighed. All right, fifty girlies. I'll speak with the steward when we... Third, you need to keep teaching me manners, he broke in. Protocol, dress, dancing, everything I need to know to be at court. Twice a week, an hour minimum. Really? Raisa raised an eyebrow. Seems to me you're doing all right on your own. When you make the effort, that is. But if that's what you want, I will arrange for a tutor to... No. He shook his head. You. I want you to do it. Just the two of us. It will give us a good excuse to meet in private on a regular basis. There was something in his gaze. Something that suggested this was some kind of test that she needed to pass. Raisa pressed her lips together to keep any words from spilling, and nodded her assent. Access was one of a monarch's favors to give away, and Han wanted guaranteed access on an ongoing basis. It was clever on his part. All right, she said. There can't possibly be anything else. One last thing. I want you to name me to the wizard council, Han said. Raisa stared at him. What? Back at Odin's Ford, when I asked about the council, you said that the queen appoints one member. That's what I want. I thought you hated the wizard council, Raisa said. Why would you want to be a member? Maybe I want to be a member of a club that would never let me in otherwise, Han said, just to give them the itches. Isn't that whom you're supposed to be fighting? Raisa's voice rose. Han put his finger to his lips. Shh. I'll be hacking at the council from the inside, but the demon I won't understand. That's one reason I need a stipend from you. If they think you've turned, you'll be risking more than your income, Raisa said. I'll take that chance, Han said. I'll be working for you, and you're the queen, right? Raisa rubbed her forehead. Are you sure you're not a traitor under the skin? she asked. We're all traitors in Rag Market, Han said. Raisa thought it over. Truth be told, she preferred Han Alistair to most anyone else she could think of appointing to the council. He was likely less dangerous, since he had no pre-existing alliances or family connections, and she couldn't imagine that he'd ever ally himself with the Bayars. All right, Raisa said. I'll appoint you to the wizard council. Han spit in his palm and held out his hand. Rolling her eyes, Raisa spit in her own palm and clasped his. Briar rose. Raisa looked up, startled. Reed Nightwalker had approached without her noticing. His dark eyes flicked from Raisa to Han. The horses are grained and rested and we're ready to go, he said. It's another two hours to Mariana Peak. Han smiled. We're done, he said, and walked toward the horses with something of a swagger. Reed stared after him. Raisa wondered how much he had overheard. She wondered if Han had intended that he overhear. Who was the real player, her or Han Alistair? And what was his game? She was in over her head in so many ways, vulnerable to him in so many ways. I've got to get better at this, she thought, if I'm going to survive. 
Chapter 23 Making Show It was mid-afternoon when they arrived on the north slope of Mariana, just below the joining of her twin peaks. The demon eye had sent several warriors ahead to scout the area and make sure the way was clear of unfriendly eyes. Nightbird was one of them. She returned to say that the regular army had established a light perimeter to the north of the memorial site. They've posted soldiers up slope from the memorial site, but not many, she said. Most have been sent down slope, since they seem more worried about threats from below. There's a huge crowd already gathered, and more coming all the time. The Queen's Guard has erected barricades around the memorial site itself, but the entire slope of Mariana is already packed with people. Really, Elena said, her brow crinkling. What kind of people? Soldiers, or... Within the perimeter, it's jinx-flingers and the Vale nobility and soldiers, Nightbird said. Downslope, they're regular citizens, not blue-bloods, but tradespeople and laborers, line soldiers and scholars, probably thieves and pickpockets, too. Thousands of people. Raisa glanced at Han, who seemed totally focused on Nightbird. He wore his politely interested street face. Nightbird continued her report. I spoke with the corporal in charge of the guard and told them that Elena Sinestra and a small party of clan royalty and demon eye warriors would be arriving soon from the north. I said that after the ceremony we'd be camping overnight on the north slope, then returning home tomorrow or the next day. Strategically, that was a good place to be. The demon eye could place archers on the heights, and that would leave a back door open for a hasty retreat, if need be. Who was the corporal? Raisa asked. The one in charge. Corporal Fallon, Bird replied. Mason Fallon. A cold rivulet of apprehension trickled between Raisa's shoulder blades. Someone else she didn't know, handpicked by her enemies. She was glad Eamon would be there. What's the arrangement for the memorial? Elena said. They've pitched several large pavilions around the Queen's pyre, Nightbird said. One flies the Grey Wolf banner, so it's likely the Princess Melanie is there. Another bears the Bayar pennant. A third carries the unleaded eye, though I didn't see Lord Demon Eye. The tomb is upslope from the memorial site, built into the side of the mountain. A number of people are milling around, making preparations. Did you see Corporal Byrne? Raisa asked. Bird shook her head. He's escorting the Queen's body. A smaller tomb for the late captain is to be built down slope from the Queen's. I saw several flatland soldiers guarding the site. So Captain Byrne would be buried near his Queen, Raisa thought, in the arms of her mountain. And Eamon was there, waiting for her. And the rest of the Grey Wolves, friends she hadn't seen since Odin's Ford, friends she could depend on. She took a deep breath, releasing it slowly. Good. Fallon said that Speaker Jemson would conduct a brief service, first for Captain Byrne and then for the Queen. Then Queen Mariana's body will be committed to the flame, freeing her spirit to take up residence in the mountain. The High Wizard and a representative of the Council of Regents will also speak. But not the Princess Melanie? Raisa asked. Bird shook her head. They say the Princess is too grief-stricken to speak. Or too intimidated by her keepers, Raisa thought grimly. If she would be queen, she needs to learn to speak up. Her people need to hear directly from her. They set up a temporary camp under cover of the forest, then gathered one last time. Raisa, along with Reed Nightwalker Demon Eye, Willow Watersong, Elena Sinestra, Han Alistair, and Fire Dancer. Raya Rose, Elena said. I know that you want to be present for your mother's service. I still say it would be safest if you watch from the crest of the mountain. We could leave a party of warriors with you as guard. That way you can see everything and yet be out of harm's way. Raisa shook her head. I will attend my mother's service, she said. We have already discussed this. Elena sighed and rubbed her chin. I thought you would say that. She put a hand on Raisa's arm. Then I beg of you. You are dressed like a demon eye. 
If you must descend to the tomb, then you're unlikely to be recognized if we ride as a group, with you hidden in our midst. Grandmother, I must participate in the service as the princess heir, Rasa said before as many witnesses as possible, so that they cannot later deny that I've returned to the queendom. It's the only way to secure my succession to the throne. You cannot ascend the Grey Wolf throne if you're dead, Elena retorted. We can't protect you if you wade into a crowd. I know you're eager to prove that you're not a coward, but I'm not doing this to prove anything except my presence and intention to ascend to the throne, Reza said. I'm doing this to honor my mother. If you live to be crowned, I hope that obstinacy will serve you well as queen, Elena growled. Han Alistair is pledged to secure my safety. That was your doing, remember? Rasa said. And Fire Dancer has agreed to help. We've worked out a plan, and we need to follow it. All eyes turned to Han, who stood, feet slightly apart, arms folded across his chest, his brilliant hair feathered by the downslope breeze. His hunter amulet glowed against the sober black of his tunic. Fire Dancer had left the group to fetch the panniers he'd been carrying all day. Unstrapping the lids, he lifted out a glittering steel breastplate and gauntlets with the Grey Wolf emblem emblazoned on them. Armor? Elena said. You're wearing armor? That's the plan? You think that will protect you against wizard flame? No, Grandmother, but it will protect me against other kinds of assassins, Rasa said. Remember, Queen Mariana died in a fall from a tower. Captain Byrne was shot through with arrows. This way, wizards won't be able to hire others to do their dirty work for them. They'll have to come out into the open if they want to take me on. Elena fingered the breastplate, running her worn fingers over the beading at the neck and the faint runes etched into the sides. She looked up at Rasa, eyes glittering. This is demon eye work. Who made this briar rose, and when? There's considerable power in it. I made it, Dancer said, setting the panniers aside. He stood and turned to face her. It's my work. An angry murmur arose among the demon eye warriors. You! Elena stared at him. But that's impossible. You're a... I'm a flash crafter, Elena Sinestra, Dancer said, lifting his chin. Or mean to be. Who's teaching you? Elena demanded. Because whoever it is plays a dangerous game. Just stop it, Rasa said. How can we expect to win against our enemies when we keep bickering among ourselves? This is my life from now on, she thought, sorting out squabbles among wizards, clan, and veil folk. Wizards are not allowed to craft magical weaponry, your highness, Elena said. It concentrates too much power in their hands. That's not part of the naming, Dancer said, setting his feet stubbornly. That's not written. It's not written because no one ever expected that a jinxflinger would be born into the camps. Nightwalker said, or would live long enough to... Fire Dancer's gifts come from the Maker, someone said in a loud, clear voice. Who are we to question the Maker's will? Rasa swung around. It was Nightbird, the young demon eye warrior, the one who still worshipped at the altar of Reed Nightwalker. There followed a stunned silence. Dancer and Han flat out stared at her, but Nightwalker looked the most astonished of all. Perhaps Dancer's unique talents are just what we need right now, Nightbird went on. Perhaps we should welcome any gift that helps keep this queen safe. Reed Nightwalker's expression turned from astonishment to betrayal. Nightbird, think again, he said. Some gifts are better declined. Who decides that? Han said. Not the demon eye. I have decided, Rasa said in a loud voice. I have decided to accept Fire Dancer's gift, and that ends the discussion. You all will go down and join the others at the memorial site. Han, Dancer, and I will remain here until it's time for the service to begin. Why don't you ride down with us now? Nightwalker asked, eyeing Han, making no attempt to hide his mistrust. 
I need to be seen as queen of all the people of the Fells, Vale folk, wizards, and the spirit clans, Racer said. I'm already dressed in clan garb. If I ride in with Upland clan, I'll appear to belong to you. Surveying the sea of frowns around her, she added, Don't worry, I don't mean to die today. Reed Nightwalker insisted on staying behind with Rasa and a small party of Demon Eye, in case of ambush, he said, whether by Han Alistair or somebody else, he didn't say. Rasa and her party stood in the fringes of the trees, watching the rest of the Demon Eye descend to the tomb, including Bird, whom Nightwalker sent on with the others. Rasa sat down with the copy of the Book of Temple Prayers and Liturgy she'd brought from Marisa Pines. Han and Dancer rested under a tree, talking softly, their hands on their amulets, storing as much power as possible in the time they had left. Reed Nightwalker and his warriors kept watch on events below. Willow sorted through the bundles of cloth that had come out of her saddlebags. Rasa read and reread the passages assigned to her, struggling to concentrate, speaking the powerful words under her breath, committing them once again to memory. Rasa had studied the prayers in preparation for her name day, but she'd never actually attended a state funeral. Queen Lyssa, her grandmother, had died before Rasa was born. Mariana, too, had ascended to the throne at a young age. Rasa couldn't help wondering if her mother would have done better had she had more time to grow into the job. Now Rasa faced the same dilemma. Would it be too much power too soon for her? A slight noise broke into her thoughts. She looked up to find Nightwalker standing in front of her. They're bringing Queen Mariano's body in procession up the mountain, he said. It's time for us to go. Rasa stood, and Nightwalker put his hands on her shoulders, leaned in, and kissed her forehead. Be safe today, Briar Rose, he said. He shifted his eyes to Han and Dancer, then back to her. Be wary. All will be well, you'll see, Rasa said, looking into Nightwalker's eyes, willing him to believe her, willing it to be true. I hope you're right, Nightwalker said. This is difficult for me. He smiled faintly, bowed his head, then turned away. The remaining demon eye warriors mounted up, then clattered over the hill and out of sight, leaving Willow, Han, Dancer, and Rasa alone. Rasa geared up for the war ahead, knowing that when it comes to politics, looking the part is often half the battle. Willow had sorted several garments into piles. She gave Han a bundle of black and silver fabric. It's not my best work, Hanselone, since it was done so quickly, she said, but I think it will serve. Her dark eyes studied him as if trying to divine his purpose. Han only nodded clutching the garment in his arms. Thank you. He turned and strode away toward his horse. Rasa had little time to be curious. Willow handed her a thick quilted jacket, armor padding of a sort. Rasa removed the shadow cloak and put the jacket on over her clan garb. Dancer unbuckled the breastplate, then held it open as Rasa slipped her arms through. He fastened it down the front, shifting it so it sat squarely on her shoulders. She poked her arms into the gauntlets, and he fastened those as well. He did good work. They were lightweight and well-finished. The magic in them buzzed against her skin. Willow draped a crimson cloak across Race's shoulders. It carried an image of a snarling gray wolf in intricate stitches. I hope you know what you're doing, she said, shifting her gaze from Rasa to Han to Dancer. This will mark you out like a banner. So Lord Bayar won't need his magic glasses to see me, Rasa said. Perfect. She ran her fingers over the stitches. This is beautiful, she breathed. How in the world did you— I had made it ahead to honor your coronation, Willow said. She smiled sadly. I had no idea I would be giving this gift so soon. Thank you, Rasa said, and embraced her, the armor a barrier between them. What will you— I will stay here and wait for you, Willow said quickly, as if she'd been anticipating the question. 
I've already mourned Mariana according to the old ways. I've spoken to Avril. He understands, as I hope you do. Of course, Raisa said, confused. But— Your Highness— Han's voice broke into their conversation. Raisa looked up to see that Han and Dancer were already mounted. Dancer waved his hand and galloped over the crest of the hill and disappeared. He would ride ahead, finding a vantage point where he could keep an eye on the Bayars and other wizards present and prevent any magical attacks. Han sat on his horse with his back very straight, his face as cold, still, and pale as sculpted marble, his vivid blue eyes the only color. He wore the coat Willow had made for him. It was black and silver, decorated with paint and stitching. Metallic serpents squirmed up the sleeves from hem to shoulder. A gray wolf and a raven faced each other on the lapels of the coat, and the back was embroidered with a wizard staff coiled with serpents thrust through the gray wolf crown. What's that about? Raisa wondered. He was of common birth, so would have no family crest. Then again, some commoners devised insignia when they rose in the world. Han didn't seem to be the sort to care about those sorts of things. The gray wolf must signify that he was in her service. But why would he go to so much trouble to proclaim an obligation that he no doubt found onerous? Also, he must have discussed it with Willow long before their trailside conversation. The feeling returned that she was being played by a master. Your Highness, Han repeated. It still sounded peculiar when he said it. He jerked his head toward the top of the hill. Are you ready? Raisa managed to haul herself into Switcher's saddle, despite the added weight of the armor. The mare crow-hopped a little at the unexpected burden. Yes, Raisa said, steadying herself. Let's go. Chapter 24 Farewells Han looked down the freshly named Mariana Peak to the preparations underway downslope. From this distance, he could make out spots of color like splashes of paint. Bright blue jacket blue splashed around what must be Captain Eden Byrne's modest tomb. Han wished he'd had a chance to discuss his plans with Corporal Byrne. That blue jacket was a good one to have at your back. He wished he'd had a chance to pick Crow's brain in preparation, to ask his advice. It had been a mistake to surprise Crow by introducing him to Dancer just when he needed his help the most. He wondered if he'd ever see him again. If wishes were horses, beggars would ride, Ma'am used to say. The Demon Eye Pavilion flew the unlidded eye banner, and the Demon Eye themselves were clustered upslope from the dais like the brown and pale green of the springtime forest. Bird was down there somewhere. She'd surprised him by defying Reed Demon Eye. She'd always been strong-willed and opinionated, and he guessed that was likely to cause friction with Nightwalker. It would be interesting to see what would happen from here on. Well, not all that interesting. What happened between Bird and Nightwalker wasn't his business. The Grey Wolf banner snapped in the breeze, high atop the tent where the Princess Melanie must be housed, and the Wizard Council had its own pavilion, bearing the flame and sword motif of the High Wizard. They reminded Han of armed camps facing each other, like what he'd seen in war-torn Arden. He recalled what Crow had said about leverage. Apply a little pressure where it will do the most good, and a lot can be accomplished. There was opportunity in the thousand-year-old faults that split the peoples of the Fells. Han meant to take advantage. It was the only way to win this thing, the only way to get what he wanted, once he decided what that was. The dais was a flower garden of color, packed with the nobility dressed in their best. It was, after all, a joyous occasion for somebody. Another queen would soon rule over the veil. Somebody had made that happen, and Han needed to find out who and why. The lower slopes of Mariana were layered with the muted tones commoners favored, colors that wouldn't show dirt with repeated wearings, five-day colors, ma'am would have called them. The very ground seemed to heave and ripple as thousands of people jockeyed for a better view. 
Latecomers had no hope of getting within miles of the ceremony. Cat would be down there somewhere, too, working her own kind of magic. A long procession of mounted bluebloods snaked its way toward the pavilions at the center of the burial site. Even at a distance, Han could tell they had their rumtogs on. That would be the dead queen's body making its way to the site of the memorial. The crowds on the lower slopes parted grudgingly to let her through. Han was accustomed to a festival atmosphere at executions and blue-blood funerals. It was something out of the ordinary, at least, for those with monotonous lives. But the mood of this crowd seemed grim and threatening. A thin blue line of guards divided the crowds from their betters upslope. The Queen's beer was followed by an honor guard of blue jackets. Eamon Byrne rode in the lead, cradling the urn holding his father's ashes, and immediately behind him a riderless horse, standard military issue, with boots reversed in the stirrups. Han looked sideways at Rebecca, Rasa, the Queen. She might have been an elven warrior from stories, with her magic armor, her made-to-measure sword, and her wind-blown cap of hair. Her gray wolf cloak fluttered out behind her in the breeze. A memory came to him. Rebecca in the alleyway at Odin's Ford, stalking toward him, her blade in her hand, leaving a would-be attacker flat on his back on the cobblestones. Rebecca promising Han the same treatment if he didn't get out of her way. The images reverberated in his mind until he felt half sick. Were these really one and the same? The friend he knew and the heir to the throne of the Fells? When he focused on Rasa, he saw that her nose had gone pink and her eyes fixed on the queen's beer glittered with unshed tears. He looked away, beating back sympathy. The only words spoken over Mam's and Mary's bodies were his own awkward prayers— and they'd nearly died unspoken on his tongue. What use would it be to call on a maker who would allow Mam and Mary to burn to death? Rasa was learning the lessons he'd been taught a long time ago, what could happen when you crossed a powerful blue blood. Those bearing the casket had reached the pavilion where the memorial was to be held. The linen-wrapped body was lifted into place on the flower-decked bier that had been prepared for it. Corporal Byrne handed down the urn, which was placed in a position of honor below the queen's casket. Then he dismounted and stood at attention with the rest of the honor guard. The blue bloods flowed into the high-priced seats close to the stage. It was time. Han looked up at the sky. Storm clouds piled up behind Hanalea, streaming over the lower peaks like long arms reaching out for the crowd. The sky to the west was a peculiar green, and lightning flickered over the west wall. The wind picked up, sweeping down over Mariana, reminding any who had forgotten that spring was a fickle season in the mountain home. Han's neck prickled. Say what you wanted about the Grey Wolf Queens. They had a magical connection to the spirit mountains. He hoped it would make his job easier. He glanced at Rasa, and she nodded, lifting her chin, green eyes wide and unblinking, fearless. Careful you keep your seat, Han cautioned her, wishing he could issue a clearer warning. I don't know how the ponies will react to all this. She nodded again, gripping her reins, lips pressed tightly together. All right, then. Han extended his free hand toward her, igniting the linkages he'd already established. They both began to glow, kindling brighter and brighter until they shone like two stars fallen to the earth. Rasa extended her hands, and they trailed flame in a wide arc, like wings. Their ponies, too, flickered with brilliant flame, resembling the horses the sun god was said to drive across the sky. The phantasm surrounding them grew, expanding so that they appeared to be twice their actual size. At the very least, Han thought, it would make them tricky targets if the magical barriers failed. Then the wolves came, terrible and wonderful, with flaming eyes and razor-sharp teeth and great ruffs of hair about their massive shoulders. They were wolves the size of horses, with teeth the size of belt daggers. The wolves were real, to Han's eyes at least. 
They'd been appearing to him ever since he'd joined himself to Rasa in his desperate attempt to heal her. Han had only wrapped glamours about them, increasing their size, enhancing their appearance, and making them visible to everyone. Now they resembled the monstrous beasts from Mam's scare stories, the hellhounds that the Breaker would ride at the end of days. Thirty-two wolves preceded them over the hill, descending toward the crowd on the mountainside, nearly two score grey wolf queens since Hanalia. When Han and Rasa crested the hill, light spilled down the mountainside ahead of them, dispelling the cloud shadow. We must look like a sunrise, Han thought, a new day. He smiled to himself. He'd given himself a visible role in this drama on purpose. Though it would make him a target, it was time people started seeing him differently. He was making show, along with Rasa. Heads turned as they walked their horses down the mountain, side by side. The demon eye warriors were farthest upslope, and they were watching for them. The clan folk turned and faced up the mountain, shading their eyes against the glare. The sound of their voices washed over Han. The wolf queens come to greet their sister, Mariana, they cried, as planned. Here come the gray wolf queens. The demon eye drew off to either side, leaving a wide path down through the middle. They dropped to their knees as the wolves passed through. By now, Han was close enough to see the reaction among the blue bloods. Atop the dais, he was pleased to see Speaker Jemson in his fancy Temple Day robes. Jemson squinted up at them, his forehead crinkled, his expression faintly perplexed. The platform was thick with wizards. Han recognized the High Wizard, Gavin Bayar, and Micah and Fiona, too, along with a half-dozen others. Lord Bayar squinted at them, his free arm slung over his eyes. It seemed he couldn't tell who they were, blinded as he was by Han's brilliant sending. All three Bayars positioned themselves between Han's fetch and the dignitaries on the stage. They kept their hands on their amulets as if they wanted to use them but couldn't figure out what spell to cast. A bulky sword dangler in an elaborate Highlander uniform laden with military glitter bits leaned over to speak to Lord Bayar. Bayar shook his head, scowling, without taking his eyes off Han and Rasa. Behind them, Avril Lightfoot Demon Eye, the Queen's consort and Rasa's father, stood next to a pretty blonde girlie with wide blue eyes. Lightfoot rested a reassuring hand on her shoulder, or maybe it was to keep her in her seat. Tall and slender, she wore diamonds at her throat and wrists and a kind of baby crown on her head. She didn't look at all like Rasa, but Han guessed she must be the younger sister, Princess Melanie. She was impressed by his sending, at least. She looked scared to death. The Blue Jackets had formed up, swords drawn, making a fragile barrier in front of the dais. They had starch, Han thought, confronting wolves that looked like they could swallow them whole, two at a time. The wolves didn't attack, however. They lined up in front of the blue jackets, then sat on their haunches, exposing their great teeth. All was silent for a long moment, save the snap of the banners in the wind. Even the crowd on the lower slopes had gone absolutely quiet, as if holding its breath. "'Who are you?' Lord Bayard demanded. "'How dare you disrupt our memorial for Queen Mariana with a conjure piece?' Rasa replied in a high, clear voice, do you not know me, Lord Bayar? Han's eyes were on the Princess Melanie as Rasa spoke. Melanie flinched and went ashen at the sound of Rasa's voice. Avril leaned down and spoke into her ear. A tall, sturdy woman with a long gray braid pushed forward to stand behind the Princess Melanie, resting her hands on her shoulders. Tears streamed down the woman's face. Sweet, sainted lady! she called in a carrying voice, almost as if she'd been coached. It's the Princess Rasa home again. Long live the Grey Wolf line. While some may be fooled by a wizard's fetch, I am not, Lord Bayar said, raising his voice as if to drown out the woman. Though it is a pretty piece of conjury, it is in poor taste. It has only frightened those who would honor our late queen— Please, identify yourself or leave us in peace. 
If you don't comply, I don't care who you are. I will have you before the council. Lord Bear, Racer said. I am Racer Anna Mariana, the heir to the Grey Wolf throne, here to mourn my mother. Not even a wizard with a heart of stone would deny me that. With that, Han allowed the brilliance that surrounded them to die to a faint glow. At the same time, he directed more power into his magical shields, glad he'd overloaded his amulet in the past few days. A murmur ran through the crowd like wind through the aspens. Han saw a flicker of movement on his right side. It was Dancer moving up alongside of the dais, eyes riveted on the High Wizard, reinforcing the barriers from the other direction, ready to act if needed. No one but Han seemed to notice him. Dancer was wrapped in a glamour, and they were all fixed on the apparition before them. Micah stood rigid, his eyes fixed on Rasa as if he'd seen a ghost. He closed his eyes, then opened them again, as if she might disappear in the interval. Fiona's pale eyes fastened on Han, raking over him like a steel-toothed comb. Lord Bayar had a rum street face, Han had to admit. When his black eyes lit on Han, they tightened a bit, the only sign that the High Wizard recognized him. Otherwise, his expression displayed only disdain and impatience. Do you really expect us to believe that this is the princess heir? The High Wizard shook his head as if he couldn't fathom that Han would make such a low play. He turned back toward Melanie, inclining his head. I'm sorry, Your Highness. It's a cruel trick to arouse your hopes like this. With sorcery, it's easy to make one thing look like another. This woman is probably just a glamoured-up street doxy. With that, the blood left Race's face, leaving two spots of furious colour on her cheeks. Lord Bayar, she said, her voice as clear and frozen as lake ice in January, as carrying as temple bells. Perhaps you would like me to tell everyone why I had to leave the fells against my will. Micah twitched, his complexion turning from marble to porcelain. The crowd on the slopes below murmured and shifted. Bayar seemed to prefer to focus on Han. The high wizard extended his hand toward Han, who forced himself not to flinch away. Madam, you are judged by the company you keep. This boy is Cuff's Alistair. A common thief. At that, another murmured rolled through the crowds down slope from the pavilions. Alistair, that's Cuff's Alistair. That's Cuff's Alistair? The sword dangling general blurted, seeming to echo the crowd. But, but look at him. He's a wizard. A common thief, Lord Bayar repeated through gritted teeth, who has somehow learned sorcery. We believe he's entered into an unholy alliance with demons who require blood sacrifice in payment. It may be that he's also acquired illegal magical tools from his allies among the Copperheads. The High Wizard seemed to grow taller, gaining in brilliance as if competing with Han. He kept his face toward Han and Rasa, but his audience was the Blue Bloods behind him. As some of you already know, Last summer, Alistair was implicated in a series of brutal street murders in Southbridge, done by magical means, Bayar said. When I confronted him, he attempted to assassinate me. He fled the country when Queen Mariana put a price on his head. Now he's returned, apparently meaning to take advantage of this time of transition to destroy us. He gestured toward the line of blue jackets in front of the stage. Corporal Fallon! he said to a swarthy man with sharp features and a blue-black shadow of beard. Seize him! Han wasn't sure what the High Wizard hoped for. Perhaps he thought Han might respond with a magical attack, and in the confusion, the Bayars would have the chance to kill both him and Rasa. Understandably, Corporal Fallon didn't rush forward. He looked from Bayar to Han and took one reluctant step. Rasa edged her pony in front of Hans and extended her hand, palm out. Hold, Corporal Fallon, if you are, as you claim to be, the sworn defender of the Grey Wolf line. Fearless, Han thought in grudging admiration. Corporal Fallon held, his eyes shifting from Rasa to Han, his hand on the hilt of his sword. 
He licked his lips and swallowed hard. Han Alistair saved my life, Lord Bayar, Raysa said. Like it or not, he is the reason I stand before you today. I owe him a debt of gratitude, not a birth in jail. Therefore, I have issued him an unconditional pardon. Anyone who lays hands on him will answer to me. Han looked Lord Bayar in the eyes, thinking, here's yet another reason for the High Wizard to howl after my blood. Bayar gazed at Han and Raysa, his hand on his amulet, eyes narrowed as if judging the strength of the barrier Han had erected. Han sat straight in his saddle, fingering his own amulet, chin cocked up, looking down his nose in a way that unmistakably said, Bring it on, Bayar, but you'd better kill me with your first shot. Something primal inside Han craved that attack, lusted for the chance to finish it now, one way or the other. Patience, Alistair, he thought. Never attack unless you're in a position to win. Han glanced at Fiona and Micah standing just behind their father. Micah's eyes were still locked on Raysa. Fiona's, on the other hand, were fixed on Han, her brows drawn together in appraisal, biting her lower lip. Han's attention was drawn to ground level as a score of blue jackets led by Eamon Byrne pushed into the space between Han and Raysa and the guards that lined the stage. They faced the High Wizard, swords drawn. Some faces were familiar to Han from Odin's Ford, Garrett Fry and Mick Bricker, Talia Abbott and Pearly Greenholt. The Demon Eye warriors moved up on either side of them, longbows at the ready, protecting their flanks. Kneel before the princess heir, Lord Averill said in a loud, deep voice, and thank the Maker she has returned to us. Averill dropped to one knee, bowing his head, followed by the gray-haired woman who had spoken out. Burns blue jackets fell to their knees. The demon eye dipped sideways in an almost comical fashion, acknowledging the princess while keeping their eyes and weapons trained on the wizards on the stage. Jinxes are slower than arrows, Han thought. Speaker Jemson went down, his robes billowing around him. Elena knelt beside her chair. Dancer knelt at the edge of the pavilion, keeping his head up, his hand on his amulet, and his eyes fixed on the Bayars, but no one else. They hung there like that for a long moment, as if balanced on the honed edge of a sword, and then it began. From down slope, a rhythmic rumble of voices that grew and spread into a deafening roar. Ray sa Ray sa Ray sa There were even some shouts of Alistair. Han looked beyond the pavilions with their brilliant banners, beyond the queen's beer and the blue bloods on the platform to see the crowds of commoners seem to ripple as they fell to their knees. Han had expected it, but it was still good to see and hear. Cat Tyburn had done her work well. And slowly, dramatically, like leaves falling from a tree, the others followed suit. First, the Princess Melanie, dropping to her knees beside her father. Then some other blue bloods Han didn't recognize, including the badged-up general. And after that, the blue jackets that protected the dais, including Mason Fallon. Still no wizards. They huddled in an unhappy group, like vultures evicted from a warm carcass. And then Micah Bayar swept back his cloak and dropped to his knees, bowing his head, his amulet swinging forward. Fiona glared down at him like she wanted to stomp on him. Oh, Han thought, Micah breaks with his family? That's interesting. Three other wizards went down, then the Mander brothers and a middle-aged russet-headed plump wizard who must have been their mother. And Master Griffin. Master Griffin? Han stared. His former teacher, Griffin, stood between two older wizards, an elegantly dressed man and woman with long, aristocratic noses and thin, unhappy mouths. As Han watched, Griffin swung his canes aside, and the older couple each took an arm and lowered him to the stage. They knelt as well, on either side of him, heads bowed, but Griffin stared up at Han, a look of ferocious curiosity on his face. Questions ricocheted through Han's mind. Why would Griffin be here when the spring term had already begun? 
Had all the students and faculty at Odin's Ford ditched school in favor of politics? Han forced his eyes elsewhere. Fiona was down now, too, leaving only Lord Bayar standing. The High Wizard looked about, shook his head, and smiled his crocodile smile. By the Maker's grace, he said softly, studying Race's face as if he were finally ready to be persuaded. Is it really you, your highness? It seems that I've managed to convince everyone in the queendom but you, Lord Bayar, Raysa said dryly, looking out over the crowd. Reignited, it roared, Raysa, and Briar Rose, and Alistair, and what sounded like Death to Bayar, though it was commingled and hard to sort out. And with that, the High Wizard sank gracefully to his knees. The bloody-handed, heartless bastard actually had tears in his eyes. Forgive the cynic in me, your highness. We have already lost our beloved Mariana. Given this season of tragedy, I had convinced myself that you must be dead as well. He shook his head. I couldn't bear to even hope that it was you. Which was likely true enough. The crowd roared its approval, the sound breaking over them like waves on a beach. Raysa stood in her stirrups as if to make herself as tall as possible. Because she was on horseback and slightly upslope from those on the stage, she could speak over their heads to the multitudes beyond. Her armor glittered in the sun, and her cloak fluttered and snapped in the wind. She lifted both hands, palms up. Rise, she said in that carrying voice that was becoming familiar. Please make yourselves comfortable. It is so good to be home. I have missed these mountains and the people who dwell here, uplanders and veil folk, the spirit clans and charm casters. She paused for a long moment. I came home because I wanted to see my mother's face and hear her voice again. Now that will never happen. There are many difficult questions to be asked and answered in the coming days, many decisions to be made. Race's gaze rested on the assemblage on the dais. But today I have come, and the ancient queens have come, she waved at the circle of mammoth wolves, to honor my mother, Queen Mariana. She is the link in an unbroken line that goes back to the warrior Queen Hanalea, who healed the breaking and saved the world. Such links are not lightly broken. The deaths of queens stir the beasts that lie beneath the dirt. They stir questions in all of us about what has been and what is to be. Han listened in amazement as Raysa spoke on. Does she carry those kinds of speeches around inside her all the time, he wondered, just in case? Or do they just hatch out whenever they're needed? However she did it, it was something he needed to learn. The rest of that afternoon passed in a smear of images. Han dismounted and helped Raysa down from her horse under the glare of the Bayars. He and Eamon Byrne mounted the steps to the dais together, just behind Raysa. They stood to either side as Raysa embraced her sister Melanie and Avril Demoni and the woman with the long gray braid. She greeted the others more formally, but had a smile and a word for each, even Lord Bayar, whom she greeted with a rum street face. The demon eyes still stood to either side of the dais, their longbows held loosely in their hands, arrows knocked but pointed at the ground, their eyes fixed on the wizards on the stage. It was less a treaty than a standoff. Under Jimson's direction, Raysa spoke a prayer over the dead queen, commending her to her rest in the spirit mountains. She greeted her ancestors, the Grey Wolf Queens, naming them from memory. She asked them, and her mother, to watch over her and guide her as she led her people forward. That makes no sense, asking for guidance from Queen Mariana, Han thought. She's made a mess of things. The speaker touched on memories of Mariana as a young girl, her talent for dancing, her skill on the basilica and harpsichord, her love of the hunt. She'd been widely hailed as the most beautiful and eligible princess in the Seven Realms, attracting a relentless parade of suitors vying for her hand. People cheered her wherever she went. She was the glittering centerpiece of a fairy tale they could all believe in. 
Then the fairy tale ended. Queen Lyssa died, and Mariana ascended to the throne at fifteen. Civil war broke out in Arden, and the young queen was challenged by an influx of refugees and a decline in trade revenues. The Council of Nobles recommended an isolationist policy, and her generals spent vast amounts on mercenaries. Taxes were raised again and again. Worried about being drawn into the wars to the south, Mariana passed over the glittering princes and chose to marry Avril Lightfoot, a suitor from inside the queendom who had the strength of the spirit clans behind him. When wizards and veil folk complained about their fairy tale princess marrying a copperhead, Mariana defiantly planned the most elaborate wedding ever seen. It was said to have cost one hundred thousand crowns and beggared the treasury for years to come. Even in Ragmarket and Southbridge, people still had souvenirs from that wedding stashed away. Mam had kept a copper coin with Queen Mariana on one side and Averil on the other. It's a sad thing, Han thought, when the best a speaker like Jemson can say about you is that you could throw a good party. That wasn't all he said, of course, but that's how Han's bitter ears bent it. Raisa lit the pyre, and the flames spit sparks into the storm-darkened sky. Lightning flamed over Hanalia, and the wolves lifted their muzzles and howled, a sound that raised goose flesh on Han's neck and arms. While the queen burned, Raisa called Aemon Byrne forward. He stood poker straight beside her while Raisa delivered a eulogy for Eden Byrne, captain of the queen's guard. I have loved and hated Eden Byrne, she said. I have loved him for his clear eye, honest soul, and blunt speech. She paused. I have hated him for his clear eye, honest soul, and blunt speech. She smiled at a smattering of laughter and applause. Our most valuable servants are those loyal enough to risk telling us the truth, not always what we want to hear, but what we need to hear. Eden Byrne was such a man. In the end, he gave his life for my sake. He will be sorely missed. She walked forward and looked down at the blue jackets surrounding the dais. The Burns are people of few words, impatient with long speeches, and so I will honor him with a short one. I commend him to the embrace of the spirit mountains, and know he will watch over his queen and all of the Grey Wolf line in death as well as in life. Her voice rang out, echoing among the peaks. Enemies of the Grey Wolf line had best take notice. Han looked straight at the Bayars. Raisa swung around, facing down slope again. And so, the unbroken line of captains and queens continues. Eamon Byrne, please step forward. Eamon took a step forward, standing at attention, chin up, eyes straight ahead. Give me the sword of Hanalea. Raisa said, extending her hand. Byrne drew his sword and extended it to Raisa, hilt first. She took hold of the heavy sword with both hands and lifted it so it pointed skyward. Strange, Han thought. Raisa didn't physically resemble the images he'd seen of Hanalea. The legendary queen had been tall and blonde and willowy, with long flowing tresses. This queen was small, with a cap of cropped dark hair her green eyes brilliant against her honey skin. Yet she looked like a warrior, all in armor with the sword in her hand, facing off against the thousands. Ordinarily, this would wait until my coronation, she said. Ordinarily, the lady sword would pass from one captain to another. But these are not ordinary times. Queen Mariana and her captain died within days of each other, it seems important to reforge the link between captain and queen as soon as possible, lest my enemies think they see an opportunity in our losses. In the same vein, we will schedule my coronation as soon as it can be arranged, she added, her eyes sweeping over the crowd and the assembly on the dais. There is too much business before us to delay. She looked up at Eamon Byrne. Kneel, she commanded. Byrne fell to his knees, still somehow at attention, his eyes fastened on Raisa. Raisa tapped each shoulder with the flat of the blade. Rise, Captain Eamon Byrne, commander of the Queen's Guard. 
Han looked over at the Bayars in time to see a quick look exchanged between Micah and Fiona. Lord Bayar tilted his head toward the general next to him, who was filling Bayar's ear with something. Bayar was completely expressionless. Princess Melanie seemed a bit blindsided by the cascade of events. She gripped the arms of her chair, her blue eyes wide, shifting from Raisa to Eamon and then to Micah, as if for a clue. But Micah gazed at Raisa with a half-smile of grudging admiration. They know they've been outplayed, Han thought. The more Raisa accomplishes out in the open, in front of witnesses, the less that can be forced on her behind closed doors. Han had no illusions that it would stop them, but it would complicate things, at least. Raisa had marched into the old neighborhood with her gang and made show to those who wanted to challenge her. It was well done. By now the queen's pyre had burned down to ashes, fueled by the holy oils the speakers used. Raisa smiled at her sister, taking her hands and gently lifting her to her feet. She embraced Melanie again, her younger sister towering over her. She led Melanie over to the bier, where they stood, hand in hand. As Han watched, Raisa leaned over and whispered something in Melanie's ear. Speaker Jemson sprinkled a powder over the flames, and a plume of gray and white smoke spiraled up, organizing itself into a sleek, fine-boned wolf with blue eyes. She descended to the ground, landed lightly and walked forward, stiff-legged, her ruff bristling about her head to touch noses with the assembled wolves. Thunder growled over Hanalea, and the rain came slashing down in huge drops that exploded as they hit the dais. The wolves turned as one and loped away, vanishing into the rain-thickened air. Chapter 25 Homecoming It was a great day. It was a terrible day. Raisa had never felt braver. She had never been more frightened. She had never been lonelier. She had never felt more loved. And now she was on her way home. The fierce courage that had fueled her during the long service at Mariana's tomb had ebbed, leaving exhaustion in its wake. She rode, embedded within her guard, Eamon to her right and forward, Han to her left and behind her, surrounded by Demon Eye warriors, with Reed Nightwalker and her father, Avril, Lord Demon Eye, always within sight. Behind them came her former nurse, Magret Grey, and the other maidens of Hanalea, their pendants displayed outside their cloaks, honoring the line they'd sworn to serve. The time will come, Raisa vowed, when I'll be able to ride unescorted through the streets of my own queendom. The Princess Melanie rode alongside her, her long golden tresses plastered to her forehead and neck, her lips blue and teeth chattering from the cold. She wore a lightweight silk cloak in black and royal blue, which was soaked through. Blinking raindrops from her eyelashes, Raisa tugged her hood up. Like most clan work, her gray wolf cape was a marriage of beauty and function, and its tightly woven, oiled wool fibers turned the downpour. Still, her forward motion as she descended the long slope of Mariana slapped the rain into her face. Water ran in rivulets down her neckline and between her breasts. Melanie kept twisting in her saddle, looking back to see where Micah was, as if to make sure he was still there. He rode alongside Fiona, just behind the Demon Eye Warriors. I need to pay more attention to Melanie, Raisa thought. I need to woo her away from those who've held her in thrall. She's all I have left, she and Avril. They'd never had much in common. Before Raisa went to foster at Demon Eye Camp, their three-year age difference had seemed like a chasm that could never be bridged. Raisa prowled the streets with Eamon and his older friends, while Melanie played with dolls and tea sets under the shelter of their mother's warm regard. Raisa had returned from Demon Eye to find that Melanie and Queen Mariana had grown even closer, leaving Raisa feeling more like an outsider than ever. She leaned toward Melanie. You look cold and miserable, she said. Didn't you bring anything to shed the rain? She instantly regretted it. It sounded like she was being critical rather than sympathetic. And that's how Melanie took it. 
The corners of her mouth curved down. Who knew it would start to rain? She said. The weather wizards did not predict it. If you ride into the mountains, you have to be prepared for changeable weather, Rasa said, unable to stop herself in her exhausted state. You should call Micah forward, Melanie said loftily. We often go riding together. He knows how to shield against the rain. Just because he knows how to do it doesn't mean it's a good idea to use wizardry for such a purpose, Rasa said, thinking guiltily of how Han had dried her cloak in Odin's Ford. You should be wary of allowing wizards to charm your person. You're one to talk, Melanie said, pouting, when you show up entangled in a wizard's fetch. That sounded too much like Lord Bayar's words. This wasn't going well. Before Rasa could think to ask it, Eamon Byrne slowed his pace, angling his horse in closer. He draped his thick guard cloak over Melanie's shoulders, then spurred ahead again to give them privacy protector of the line. They'd left the slopes of Mariana behind and were now crossing the relatively flat vale, making better time as the rain had diminished to an annoying drizzle. The hard pan road presented its own hazards, however. Huge puddles hid large craters in the surface. It needs repair, Rasa thought, like everything else. Where will we get the funds? Where have you been all this time, anyway? Melanie went on. We thought you were dead. She sounded almost as if Rasa had pulled a nasty trick by being alive. I was in Odin's Ford most of the time, Rasa said, attending classes at the academy. You were going to school? Melanie raised her fair brows. You ran away to school? As if this were inconceivable. Rasa glanced about, wary of getting into the meat of the story with so many eyes and ears close by. They have wonderful teachers there, and students come from all over the Seven Realms. I learned so much. An idea struck her. You could go there, you know, she said. You could study whatever you like. I think we should send more students to the Academy than we do, not just wizards. Melanie's eyes went wide with alarm. Now that you've come back, you mean to send me away? Her voice cracked. No, no, Rasa said quickly. Not unless you want to go. I only thought it would be a great opportunity for you. When you returned, you could serve on my council. I'll have need of counselors I can trust. I love my teachers and tutors, Melanie said, her voice rising. I love being at court. Why would I want to go anywhere else? I would love to go back to Odin's Ford, Rasa thought. That's a mistake I make constantly, thinking Melanie wants the same things I do. She's changed while I've been gone, Rasa thought. In the past, she'd always relied on her sunny, uncomplicated personality. Now she seems angry and suspicious and resentful. Thirteen is a hard age, Rasa thought. She's had a hard year and a heartbreaking week. Never mind. Rasa reached across and touched Melanie's shoulder. Come, let's not fight on the day we buried our mother. It's your fault she's dead, Melanie said, jerking away from Rasa's hand. That fanned the flames of the guilt Rasa was already feeling, and frayed away what remained of her patience. How can you say that? she demanded, forgetting to keep her voice down. Eamon glanced back at them, eyebrows raised, lips tight together. Now Han nudged his horse forward, so he came abreast of them. Your Highness, you and the Princess could use some privacy. I'm nearly used up, but I think I can manage. Touching his amulet, he gestured, and a curtain of silence descended, blocking out sound all around them. He reined in his horse, so he fell behind them again, following at a respectful distance. Melanie raised her chin as if to say, See, you have your wizards too. But what she said was, Is it true he's a thief and a murderer? Maybe, Rasa thought of saying, or probably. He used to be, she said. He was street lord of Ragmarket. A wizard street lord, Melanie said, swiping rain from the tip of her nose. That's romantic, in a way. I doubt he'd describe it that way, Rasa said. 
Anyway, he didn't become a wizard until after he left the streets. What do you mean, become a wizard? Melanie said. Wizards are born, not made. Unless Lord Bayar is right and he's made some kind of deal with the Breaker. She shivered. Do you think that's possible? If he made a deal, he made a poor bargain, Raisa said. And I know for a fact that he's a better trader than that. He is handsome, Melanie allowed, in a wicked kind of way. I don't think I've ever seen eyes that blue on a man before. And the way he looks at a person, almost unnatural, like he can look right through your clothes. And dressed all in black like that, his hair... Melanie, Raisa said gently. Charm or not, she wanted to stay away from the subject of Han Alistair, with him riding so close by. Matters were complicated enough. You were talking about Mother, how it's my fault she's dead. Melanie didn't speak for a long moment, until Raisa began to wonder whether she would answer at all. Mother was broken-hearted when you left, Melanie said finally. She blamed herself. She thought she should have seen it coming and somehow prevented it. She barely ate or slept, and she grew thin and weepy. Melanie looked over at Raisa. So we were all miserable and worried while you enjoyed yourself in Odin's Ford. Enjoyed myself? Do you know how hard I was working? As Raisa said it, she knew she was being dishonest. Despite everything, she had enjoyed herself. Melanie rolled her eyes. You're a fiend for hard work, and you know it, she said. You always had to work harder than anyone else, whether it was schoolwork or hunting or... or anything. You always had to make everyone else look bad. Everyone else, no doubt, meant Melanie. It was time to tell the truth. Did Mother tell you why I left? Raisa said, leaning close to her sister. Melanie nodded. She said you had a crush on Corporal Byrne. She jerked her chin toward Eamon, riding just ahead. Mother said you ran off when she insisted you marry someone else. She lifted her chin defiantly. And Corporal Byrne was at Odin's Ford, too. Wasn't that convenient? That's not true, Raisa hissed, stung. I didn't run away to be with Eamon Byrne. Really? Melanie raised her eyebrow. Are you calling Mother a liar? Raisa pressed her lips together to keep any more words from spilling out. She didn't want to speak ill of the dead, and yet she wanted to honor Melanie with the truth. She was tired of lies, tired of the awkwardness and suspicion between them. You never seemed interested in getting married anyway, Melanie persisted. You always said you wanted to kiss a lot of boys before you narrowed down to one. Well, yes, Raisa had said that. I'm not saying Mother was a liar, Raisa said diplomatically. I'm saying she didn't tell you all of the truth. Yes, I left when she insisted I marry someone else. Do you know who that someone was? It doesn't matter now, Melanie said, facing forward as if she somehow knew that she wouldn't want to hear what Raisa had to say. You left and Mother died. She slammed her heels into her pony's sides, meaning to ride forward and away, but Raisa caught hold of her horse's bridle. It was Micah Bayar, Raisa said. She wanted me to marry Micah Bayar. Melanie shook her head, slinging water all around. No, she said. That's not possible. It is possible because it's true, Raisa said. No, Melanie repeated. Micah would never... Micah was willing, Raisa said. I wasn't. Melanie stared at her, tears pooling in her blue eyes. I don't believe you, she said, and wrenched her horse away, spurring him forward until she was beyond the range of easy conversation. Well, Raisa thought, so much for clearing the air. Someone must have sent a bird to Felsmarch, or maybe riders with fresh horses had outpaced them to the capital, wanting to be the first to announce the news of Raisa's return. Or maybe Cat Tyburn had arranged this reception, too. However it happened, the news had preceded them, so that when they entered the capital, the way of the queens was lined with people on both sides, cheering and waving scarves and kerchiefs. 
Although the way was broad, the crowd surged in close, reaching out to touch their returning princess. The guard tightened its perimeter, and Eamon and Han took up positions on either side of Reysa, using their horses to keep anyone from coming too close, while the queen's guard forced a path forward toward the castle close. To Reysa's embarrassment, some in the mob of people cursed and jostled the demon eye, calling them copperheads, baby-stealers, and worse. They weren't used to seeing clan in numbers in the city. Sweet lady in chains, Reysa thought. Somehow I have to bring all my peoples together, wizards, veil folk, clans. We spend too much energy fighting with each other. It makes us vulnerable. Speaking of vulnerable, she thrust her finger into the pouch at her waist, pulled out the wolf ring talisman, and slid it once more onto her finger. It seemed unlikely there would be any wizard attacks between here and home, but still, it made her feel safer to have it on. Ahead, Reysa could see the glittering towers of Felsmarch Castle poking above the buildings, a sight that tugged at her heart. So much had happened since she'd last seen them. She pounded down regret like bread dough before its second rising. Learn from it, she thought, but don't waste energy on what can't be changed. And it was good to be home. She looked about, drinking in the details she'd missed for so long. The twisting side streets, the steps built into the alleys that climbed the slopes into the outer city, the northern accents clamoring around her, and yes, the stink of cabbage cooking and wood fires and the filth that ran in the gutters. She took a deep breath and let it out, allowing her shoulders to slump a bit in relief, already looking forward to a hot bath and good northern food. As she did so, she caught a flicker of movement on the roof of a building ahead. A dark silhouette rose into view, its motion fluid and sinuous. It stilled itself, taking careful aim. Instinct caused her to shift sideways and down to present a narrower target. She opened her mouth to shout a warning. Eamon swore and lunged toward her as something like a fist slammed into her right chest, nearly unseating her and bringing tears to her eyes. Bedlam ensued. Before Raisa knew what was happening, Eamon had scooped her from her saddle, cradling her close and leaning over her so that his body covered hers. Make way, he roared, in a hoarse, unfamiliar voice, urging his horse into a gallop, willing to ride down any fool who didn't get out of his path. Bricks and tiles flew as a blast of wizard flash hit the roof where the archer had been. It was Han Alistair, discouraging any second attempts. Melanie, Rasa gasped, See to my sister's safety. She saw flickers of blue to either side, breathed in the acrid scent of wizard flame, heard shouted orders and the twang of longbows. They thundered into the broader, straighter streets near the castle, through the gate that led into the castle close. Still, Eamon didn't slow. Rasa could smell the moat and hear the hollow rattle of hooves over wood as they crossed the drawbridge at a dead run. They passed under the portcullis and into the interior courtyard of Felsmarch Castle. The portcullis slammed down behind them. She was home. She raised her head, twisting around so she could see. The courtyard was packed with blue-jacketed guards and rearing horses. To her relief, she saw Melanie, still astride her pony, led by Mick Bricker. She looked pale as parchment, but apparently unhurt. Han and his friend Fire Dancer planted themselves in the arch leading to the drawbridge, gripping their amulets like they might have to fight off raging hordes of assassins. Call a healer, Eamon bellowed right into Rasa's ear. The princess heir has been shot. Rasa ran her fingers over the plate armor just below her collarbone. It was badly dented and pierced partway through, but had held against the assassin's arrow, if that's what it was. The missile must have fallen away in the street. Rasa attempted to squirm free of Eamon's grip. Really, Eamon, I don't think I'm... A familiar voice broke into her protest. Captain Byrne, give her to me. It was Margaret Gray, who'd already dismounted and shed her rain-drenched cloak. Margaret opened her arms and Eamon lowered Rasa down into them. Rasa looked up into Margaret's familiar face streaming with tears, 
etched with new lines of pain. Were they new, or had she just never noticed? Magret's hair was grayer than before, caught into its customary thick braid that extended nearly to her waist. When Raisa was a toddler, she used to cling to that braid and suck her thumb when she needed consoling. Melanie's face came into view at Raisa's elbow, tear-stained and terror-stricken. Raisa, she whispered, I'm so sorry. Please don't die, too. I'm not planning on it. Not any time soon, Raisa said. Magret, please set me down. I'm fine. Just bruised is all. But Magret's grip was as difficult to break as Amon's. Let's get her into the keep, Eamon said. Kiefer, I want a dozen guards on the door. Talia, get over to the healer's hall and bring Lord Vega on the double. Nick and Halley, take a triple and go out and see if you can track down the archers. But be careful. Guards took off in all directions, an explosion of blue uniforms. I'll help, Avril said, his eyes brilliant with anger. I know the streets. No, Eamon shook his head. Depending on who's behind this, you might be a target yourself. I'd like to keep you close for now. Avril opened his mouth to protest, but Nightwalker said, I'll go, Lightfoot. My warriors will be just outside the close, and I know the streets as well as you do. The archer who shot me was on the roof of Kendall House, Raisa told them. The arrow might be lying in the street near where I was hit. That might tell us something. Nightwalker nodded, his face grim and determined. We'll find them, Your Highness. He slipped past Han and Dancer, disappearing through the archway into the growing dusk. Magret strode toward the keep, still carrying Raisa in her arms. Magret, set me down, Raisa said, exasperated. Please believe me when I say I'm just bruised. I've been shot before, and I know the difference. At that, Han swung around to look at her, his mouth twitching with amusement and relief. It was the first genuine smile she'd seen on him in a long while, overlaying a face haggard with worry. Burn, we need to do a better job of protecting the queen, he said. Before we know it, she'll be showing off old battle scars to her ladies whenever she's in her cups. It won't help our reputations any. Eamon nodded without smiling. I agree. We need to do a better job. And we will. He turned to Raisa. Humor me, your highness he said, stubborn as ever. He nodded to Magret. Take her inside. Chapter 26 Agreeing to Disagree There was no saying no to Magret Gray. The former nurse carried Raisa into one of the salons on the first floor of the palace. There, she removed Raisa's armor and padding, stripping her to her camisole, and put her down on her back on one of the couches under a blanket. She pressed an icy cloth against the purpling bruise above Raisa's right breast. The court healer, Harriman Vega, a wizard, arrived with four assistants. Han Alistair followed them in and stood next to Raisa, arms crossed. Lord Vega scowled at Han. "'Wait outside, please, while we examine Her Highness,' he said in a high, supercilious voice. Han shook his head. I'm staying, he said, immovable as stone. After what's happened, Captain Byrne isn't in a trusting mood. I promised him I wouldn't leave her side. And he trusts you, Raisa thought. That's different. Magret stood, hands on hips, giving Han a look of undiluted hostility. Your Highness, please, Lord Vega said. Surely you don't want this young man looking on while we... He stays... Raisa said with a sigh. I might as well get used to having no privacy at all, she thought. Still, her cheeks burned as Lord Vega undid the cord at her neckline and pulled down her camisole. The wizard healer tried to keep his body between Han and Raisa, but Han moved enough to make sure he could see the healer's hands and hear what charms he spoke. His face was again as unreadable as one of the stone faces of Hanalia. Vega and his assistants all had to take a look. As you can see, the wizard said to his assistants, still trying to block Han's view. The arrow did not pierce the skin, so even if it were a poison daub, there's no danger to the queen's life. The armor apparently stopped the projectile, although the force of the blow has caused considerable bruising. 
He looked up at Raisa. Was the arrow launched from close range? She nodded. I would guess no more than twenty feet. Then you are most fortunate you were wearing this armor, your highness, Vega said, lifting Raisa's breastplate and weighing it in his hands, peering at the dent made by the arrow. It's lightweight, but magic to turn any but the strongest blows. I suppose it's of copperhead make. It's clan work, Raisa said, and it's maybe wizardry too, she thought. I need to thank Fire Dancer for saving my life. Observe, Lord Vega said to his assistants. He laid his hands over the bruises and spoke a charm. Han leaned in close, cocking his head so he could hear, ignoring Vega's glare. Within seconds, the ache in Race's chest had eased somewhat, and the purple swelling diminished. Thank you, Lord Vega, she said, rolling her shoulders to test her range of motion. That's amazing. I hope you won't have too many ill effects. It's my calling, Your Highness, Vega said modestly. There's a personal price to be paid, of course, but I would gladly sacrifice my health on your behalf. Raisa couldn't help glancing at Han, who'd nearly sacrificed his life on her behalf, and maybe regretted it now. Lord Vega and his minions also examined the healing wound in her back from the ambush in Marisa Pine's pass. At this rate, she'd collect as many scars as Han Alistair. "'May I ask how this was treated, Your Highness?' Lord Vega asked, running cool fingers over her upper back. This wizard was remarkably good at controlling any leakage of power, compared to Han and Micah, at least. Or maybe Han's presence was keeping him on his best behavior. I was treated at Marisa Pine's camp, Raisa said, by Willow Watersong, a clan healer. It's mending well, Vega said grudgingly, poking at it, though I don't recommend that people seek treatment in the camps except in an emergency— it's difficult to predict the effects of the herbals they use. Not only that, once the copperheads have meddled in an illness or injury, it can make it more difficult for an academy-trained wizard to diagnose and treat the problem. I'll bear that in mind, Raisa said, sliding her arms back into her gown and retying the cord at her neck. Magret draped a thick shawl over her shoulders as if to provide a little additional coverage. Is there anything else? I think I'd like to rest now. She looked pointedly at the door. I'll be back to examine you again in the morning, Lord Vega said. He looked up at Magret. You there, if there should be any change in the Queen's condition, if you have any concern at all, don't attempt to treat it yourself. Send a servant to the healer's hall to fetch me. I will, my lord, Magret said. Thank you, my lord. Lord Vega and his assistants swept from the room, stuffed full of their own importance. What a pompous ass, Magret said, when he was out of earshot. Course you can't throw a rock without hitting a pompous ass of a wizard. Raisa laughed as Han blinked at Magret in surprise. Magret, meet Han Alistair, she said. Han, this is my nurse, Magret Gray. Magret's eyes narrowed. Alistair! Her eyes dropped to Han's wrists, then flicked back up to his face. The gang leader and murderer? Magret! Raisa put up her hand. Alistair is... Used to be, Han broke in, shrugging his shoulders. You one of the Pearl Alley Greys? Magret eyed him balefully, keeping her hands planted on her hips. Used to be, she said. What is he doing here, your highness? she asked without taking her eyes off Han, as if he might make a move on her. He's going to be staying here in the palace, Raisa said. He's, um, kind of my bodyguard. No, Magret said. He can't be staying here in the palace. Not this one. Her eyes fastened on the amulet that hung around Han's neck, and she took a step back, raising her hands as if in defense. He's handsome enough, I'll grant you that, but he's a fiend, your highness. Truly he is. Raisa looked from Magret to Han. What are you talking about? Do you know each other? Han kept his eyes on Magret. Maiden Grey, he said softly. I'm sorry about Velvet. Don't call him that, Magret shouted. 
Don't you call him that. His name was Theo. Theo Gray. I'm sorry about Theo, Han amended. Velvet. Rasa recalled the boy in the velvet coat who'd been with Cat Tyburn the day Han had rescued her from the raggers, the razor-leaf user who'd meant to rob her. They're all dead, Han had said, all of the raggers except Cat. I should have known you for a wizard, Magret said. That's the only way to explain it, him taken to the streets like he done. He was a good boy before you lured him away from his family. Unconsciously, Magret had slipped into the kind of street cant that Han used, or had used. Who was Vel... Theo, to you? Rasa asked Magret. He was my sister's boy, Magret said. My nephew. My sister died of remitting fever. I raised him till he was four. Then he went with his father, who took him for a street mumper. A memory came back to Rasa, playing at blocks with a boy her own age when she was three or four, a boy who somehow belonged to Magret, though she'd never married. Then he falls in with cuffs and his gang, Magret went on, turned to slide hand and razor leaf and shoplifting. He was starving, Han said. His dad disappeared and he was mumping on his own, doing a little slide hand and second story work along with. He started up with the river rafts. He came to me later, after Southies took over their turf. He could have come to me, Magret said. He should have, but you charmed him. You, you silver-tongued demon. He wouldn't leave even when I begged him to. He was a leaf user by then, Han said. Not many are able to leave it. It isn't your fault you couldn't save him. You're right. It isn't my fault, Magret said, drawing herself up, her voice dripping with scorn. It's your fault. Magret, Rasa said gently. Han's been out of that for more than a year. My Theo was tortured and killed and burnt by wizardry, Magret said, still glaring at Han. You're a jinxlinger. Don't try and tell me you don't know what happened to him. I won't try and tell you that, Han said, his blue eyes focused on Magret's face. I do know what happened to him. He was killed by wizards looking for me. So it was my fault, though it was never my intention. He was making no excuses, not even attempting to defend himself. Magret stood, fists clenched at her sides, staring at him, her mouth dammed up as if to keep her words from spilling out. If you want to know more, I know a girlie was his street lord at the time, Han said. I'll ask her to speak with you. I don't want your help, Magret said fiercely. I don't want to talk to any street rats. I want you to leave so I can see to the Princess Rasa in peace. They all jumped and turned when Eamon Byrne rapped on the doorframe. Your Highness, he said apologetically. Sorry to disturb you, but the door was open, so... Come in, Eamon. Rasa said, relieved to have the tension in the room diluted. I'm fine. Dance's armor saved my life. Have you found out anything? Eamon scanned the hallway, then carefully closed the door behind him and crossed to her side. He held up a crossbow bolt between his thumb and forefinger, the tip wrapped carefully in muslin. Nightwalker found this, bodkin-tipped, meant to pierce armor and kill common as weeds along a roadside, except he waggled it in his hand. It's got a poison daub on the head. I'd like to have Willow look at it and see if she thinks it's the same as was used before. Good idea, Rasa said dryly. It would be good to know if it's the same people trying to kill me or a whole different group. Seems like whoever it was took his one safe shot and ran, Eamon said. Guards are still swarming through the city, the demon eye warriors, too, but I'm not optimistic. Rasa glanced at Magret. Her nurse was cutting her eyes toward Han and shaking her head, putting her finger to her lips. Magret, Rasa said wearily. Like it or not, Han is here for my protection. He's already saved my life once, maybe twice. We have to trust him. We need someone gifted, given what's been happening with Lord Bayar and the Wizard Council. Speaking of the Bayars, 
Micah is outside, Eamon said. He's been waiting out there for more than an hour, and he won't take no for an answer. He insists on seeing you and verifying that you're alive and well. Hayden Firedancer is keeping him company. He smiled faintly, the first smile Rasa had seen on him in a while. I'll tell him no and make it stick, Magret growled, turning toward the door. The conniving, scheming lowlife. She seemed happy to have another wizard to direct her ire against. No, Rasa held up her hand to stop Magret. Let him in. Maybe we can learn something from his reaction. See what he knows. Han straightened, and he and Eamon exchanged glances. Rasa studied them, frowning. Something had changed between them. Some kind of barrier had fallen. They almost seemed like co-conspirators now. She wasn't sure she liked that. You're not going to see him in your cami, your highness, Magret said, looking scandalized. Oh, let's just get it over with, Rasa growled. All right, I'll fetch him, your highness. Eamon left again. I'm not going to receive him lying down like an invalid either, Rasa said. She slid off the bed, her bare feet thumping on the floor. Wrapping the blanket closely around her, she sat down in the chair next to the bed. Magret twitched the fleece up over Rasa's shoulders, providing maximum coverage. Han stood behind her chair, his hands resting on the back to either side of her. Rasa's skin prickled and pebbled at his nearness. I should just get dressed again, Rasa grumbled, trying to ignore it. I've got a lot to do. Your Highness, there's no point. Soon as we send the jinxlingers away, I'll take you upstairs for a long, hot bath, Magret promised. Moments later, Eamon returned with Micah and Dancer. There was a grim, angry set to Micah's mouth, a stiffness to his posture. When his eyes lit on Han, he stopped short in the doorway, looking from Rasa in her blanket to Han, as if he couldn't believe the evidence of his own eyes. "'What are you doing here, Alistair?' he demanded. "'I couldn't believe it when I saw you ride up at the memorial service, dressed like some kind of prince. How did you get involved with the princess heir?' He looked at Rasa. "'Do you know who this is? Do you know what he's done? He's a murdering, thieving—' Sulpea, Rasa said. I thought you were here to inquire after my health, not malign and interrogate my bodyguard. Your bodyguard? Micah looked Han up and down, shaking his head slowly. Him? Indeed, Rasa said, losing patience. Get used to it or get out. Sweet lady in chains, she thought. I'm so weary of wizards. Closing his eyes, Micah took a deep breath, then released it, mastering himself in that way he had. "'As you wish, your highness,' he said, with a smile that didn't quite reach his eyes. "'I'm already used to it.' He came and knelt in front of Rasa. When he lifted his head, his black eyes raked over her, drinking in every detail, like he would tally up every cut and bruise and healing wound. Rasa he said. Are you really all right? He reached for her hands, and she snatched them back out of reach. Han shifted his weight behind her, and Rasa knew without looking that he'd gripped his amulet. Eamon moved up next to Micah, his sword ready in his hand. Just, just keep your distance, Micah, Rasa said, raising both hands, palms out. I'm already jumpy, and I have absolutely no reason to trust you. Pain flickered across Micah's face, but he rested his hands on his knees in plain view of everyone. Of course, he said. I had to see you, to see for myself that you were all right. You're not hurt? You're not wounded at all? Rasa shook her head. No, I was very lucky. Yes, you were. Micah looked at Han and Eamon almost accusingly, then back at Rasa. I can't tell you how relieved I was when you appeared at the memorial service. Were you? Rasa's voice was cool and indifferent. Were you really relieved? Micah drew his brows together in a frown, tilting his head. Well, yes, of course. 
The last time I saw you, we were in the middle of a battle. That's right, Raisa said. And you put me there. How did you and Fiona manage to escape? And the Manders as well. We were able to recover our amulets, Micah said. After that, it was relatively easy to conceal ourselves. He shrugged. To be honest, Prince Gerard seemed more intent on finding you, Your Highness. He turned west to Tamron Court while we traveled north. When I returned home and found that you hadn't arrived, I didn't know what to think. And immediately found somebody else to marry, Raisa said. I had no idea you were so determined to settle down. I'm as much a prisoner of family and politics as you are, Micah said. That didn't keep me from worrying that something had happened to you. I thought perhaps Montan had recaptured you, or that you were trapped in Tamron Court. Something did happen to me, Raisa said. On my way home, I was attacked and nearly killed in Marisa Pine's Pass. Attacked? Micah shook his head slowly, as if to deny it. Micah was a consummate actor, but Raisa thought his surprise was genuine. Yes, attacked by someone who was expecting me to come that way. Now Micah leaned forward, intent on her. Who was it? Who attacked you? They were out of uniform, but they appeared to be members of my own guard, Raisa said. Micah's eyes narrowed. Then it wasn't. He stopped himself, took a deep breath, let it out. It wasn't the Copperheads, then. But she had the impression he'd changed what he meant to say. Well, I can hold back information as well as you, she thought. She shook her head. Hardly, she said. The clan healers saved my life. What about those who attacked you? Micah asked, his eyes fixed on her face. Have they been questioned? Do you know why they attacked you? Were they just renegades, or— They're all dead, Raisa said, shrugging, but watching Micah closely through her lashes. I guess we'll never know. Micah sat back a little, looking disappointed and unsettled rather than relieved. So, he said, there have been two attempts on your life within a space of weeks. He looked up at Eamon Byrne and Han Alistair. And where were you two during all of this? Or do you only surface after the assassins have fled? Again, Raisa sensed Han stirring behind her, and she felt the heat of him through her skin. It seemed to roll off him in waves. I beg you, Raisa, take better care, Micah went on. It's clear to me that your soldier and your so-called bodyguard are not enough to keep you safe. You can't keep tempting fate. These are dangerous times. You were the one who dragged me away from Odin's Ford, Raisa said. If you hadn't kidnapped me, I'd still be there. For how long? Micah asked. Don't you think that those who tried to kill you would have tried again? You would know better than me, Raisa said. What's the plan going forward? She leaned toward him, as if he might really answer. Micah glanced at Eamon and Han, and Raisa knew he hated holding this discussion in front of this particular audience. What I did at Odin's Ford was for your protection. Even if you managed to stay alive, had you not returned, the Princess Melanie would have been named Princess Air and maybe Queen by now. Well, that would have worked well for you, wouldn't it, since she seems to be smitten with you, Raisa said. I'm not pursuing your sister, he said, rising to his feet. I'm telling you to take very good care, Raisa. Please, he bowed. Welcome home, your highness. I will call upon you again. He nodded at Han and Eamon. Gentlemen, using that term loosely, of course. And so he left, leaving Raisa more confused than enlightened. Chapter 27 on the loose in the palace. Fellsmarch Castle was like a small city in itself, familiar to Han in unexpected ways. The servants' quarters reminded him of Ragmarket's back alleys, where you could travel long distances unobserved by most. The audience chambers and salons were like large public squares, where the Blue Bloods gathered to make show and catch the attention of their rivals. Han explored the palace and the close, 
mapping it in his head as he had Rag Market and Southbridge. True to her word, Raysa had moved Han into an apartment next to hers, Margaret Gray's former quarters. She didn't have much choice of places to put him because her room was fairly isolated in one of the gateway towers beneath the glass gardens on the roof. The glass gardens where Alger Waterlow once trysted with Hanalea, the warrior queen. Seeming immune to Margaret's scandalized disapproval, Raysa relocated her nurse into quarters in the other gateway tower, some distance down the hall. The maiden haunted the corridors at all hours like a tall, stately spook with a lantern and long gray braid. Margaret made it clear that she detested Han, that she blamed him for what happened to Velvet. It was too bad because Han rather liked the iron-spined nurse. He still had hopes of winning her over, but maybe he was fooling himself. Raysa demurred when the High Wizard and her council suggested that she move into her mother's elaborate quarters in the main palace. That could wait until after the coronation, she said. The Queen's chambers held too many painful memories to move in so soon. Also, she had a sentimental attachment to her old rooms. Anyway, she preferred to mourn her mother in seclusion, not burdening the court at large. Besides, she would likely redecorate the suite once her grief had abated somewhat, and that would be easier if it weren't occupied. She had a dozen arguments, and her story often changed depending on the audience. Han admired her politician's ability to say no and keep saying no while making it seem like no one wanted to say yes more than she did. Still, he was surprised by her decision to stay where she was, it seemed like claiming the Queen's rooms would reinforce the inevitability of the coronation to those who still might hope for a different outcome. From all appearances, resistance to Raysa as Queen had evaporated after her sudden reappearance at the memorial service. Han knew that it had only been driven underground. Even if Raysa survived her coronation, an assassin could make sure her reign was short-lived. Eamon Byrne was taking no chances. He kept hand-picked blue jackets on duty outside Race's room whenever she was in residence, and they accompanied her wherever she went, even inside the palace. Han's suite was small by palace standards, intended for a servant, but it was almost too big for him, consisting of a room to sleep in and a room to sit in and another room for spares. He had lived most of his life with the rest of his family in a single room. If there had been more than three Alistairs, they'd still have shared a single room. Except for when they visited the privy, most families in Rag Market did everything in one room, whether it was eating, sleeping, piecework, laundry, dying, birthing babies, or making love. The furniture in Han's suite was heavy and ornate, like the kind in some of the fancier parts of Southbridge Temple. The bed in particular was huge and lonely, and Han rattled around in it, plagued by an excess of space and bad dreams. It was so deadly quiet at night it was hard to fall asleep. Even with his shutters open, most nights all he could hear was the splashing of the fountain in the courtyard. It was almost a relief when lovers crept out there in the moonlight, breaking the silence with their whispers, laughter, and sighs. Except it only made him ache for what he'd lost. He tried to distance himself from Raysa, he told himself she was just another blue-blood liar who'd use him and discard him, who would ride right over the underclass when they got in her way. Pining after a princess, as Cat called it, was the road to humiliation. He'd never been more to her than an interesting diversion. But the reality of her kept getting in his way. Twice now, he'd nearly lost her for keeps. Once in Marisa Pine's Pass and once in the attack just outside the palace gates. If not for Dancer's armor, she'd be dead or badly injured. He revisited the memory of their entrance into the city again and again, the crushing pain, the vacancy where his heart used to be, the realization that he had failed once again to protect someone he loved. It was like poking at a deep bruise, verifying that it hadn't yet healed, reminding himself of his vulnerability of hers. And so he'd set himself this impossible task. He could protect himself, 
and if he failed, well, he'd been ready to pay the personal price for failure all his life. But how could he keep Raisa alive when so many enemies seemed bent on killing her? How could he become powerful enough to make a claim on her, to make her take him seriously as a suitor? How could he convince her to see him as a peer, someone who could partner with her in every way? And how could he do all that without putting her in even more danger? Willow's warnings echoed in his ears. He didn't yet know the answers, but he knew this. He wouldn't put her at risk by allowing a romance to blossom between them until he was in a position to defend it. Raisa was brilliantly savvy about some things, but she'd never truly understood how it was between blue bloods and street runners. She'd never had to. She didn't seem to realize that any hint of romance between them would bring both the clans and wizards down on them. He'd have known the rules on his old turf. Here, following his instincts would get them both killed. If you don't know where you're going, you'll never get there, Jemson used to say. At least now, Han knew where he was going, and who with. He'd just have to find his own path. Race's first tutoring session hadn't gone well. The tension was so thick you could have spread it on bread and called it a meal, as Mam would say. Raisa was constantly on the move, pacing back and forth, and talking and waving her hands like she could fill up the chasm between them all on her own. Han sat in a straight chair, his hands gripping the armrests, hearing every third word. His mind's eye strayed to that rose tattoo on her collarbone, to her tiny waist, to the green eyes shadowed by thick lashes and black brows set against her tawny skin. It was a special kind of misery to recall her fresh air scent and forthright kisses. It had been a pleasure to kiss someone who seemed to enjoy it as much as he did. An inside door connected Han's quarters to the Queen's, meant to allow the servant that was supposed to be living there to come and go in privacy. While attending Raisa in her rooms, Magret kept it locked and rattled the lock several times a day, a warning to the wizard on the other side. Han mastered the lock his first day, and then it took all the self-discipline he had to stay on his side of the wall. He fetched his own water from the pump in the courtyard and either ate in the dining hall or carried food back from the kitchens himself. While he wanted to fit in with Blue Bloods, he wasn't going to chance food or drink that had been sitting unattended in the hallway or carried by a servant. There were too many people who would like to see him dead— and too many slick clan-made poisons that could be added to food and water undetected. Each of his rooms had its own fireplace. Darby Blake, Han's personal servant, had the idea he would slip in when Han was out and replenish the stack of wood and fill the water pitcher and empty the chamber pot. Han had to break him of that because he'd laid charms on all the doors and windows to keep out intruders. Servants could be threatened, charmed or bribed, so Han carried his own wood from a bin along the corridor just outside his room and set his chamber pot outside when it needed attention. Darby was always there, ready to receive his slop jar like it was a privilege or a gift. For Han, living in the palace was a lot like living in Ragmarket, surrounded by enemies, with death always a footfall away, only plusher. There were several dining halls, like taverns, some catered to the quality and others to the working class. The food was always good and there was plenty of it, even though others in the queendom might be starving. Any time of the day or night, food could be had. His sitting room led onto a terrace that overlooked the courtyard in the center of the palace. The stone walls of Felsmarch Castle afforded plenty of handholds and footholds for an experienced second-story thief. The walls took him to the roof, to the glass gardens up there, and the roof took him wherever else he wanted to go. Han was amazed at how many rooms there were in the palace, some of them only used rarely. Even after several weeks, there were parts of the palace he'd not yet explored, including the Bayar stronghold. No doubt they'd have laid traps for intruders, knowing Han was in the castle. He wanted more training on detecting and disabling magical locks and killing charms before he ventured there. 
and that meant he had to find a way to make up with Crow. Han's proximity to the queen and his apparent role as her favorite made him the subject of endless servant gossip. At first, the maids froze like deer when he passed by, and the chamberlains elbowed each other and clamped their mouths shut when they saw him coming. Their attitude toward him was a mixture of fear, fascination, and pride of ownership. His reputation as a ruthless street lord, thief, and knife fighter had preceded him into the palace. Added to that were the stories about Queen Mariana's memorial service, churned and expanded by the palace rumor mill. A wizard from Rag Market, who'd heard of such a thing. He was one of them, and yet he wasn't. Wizards breathed the rarefied air on Grey Lady and moved in blue blood circles. Wizards hired folk to give orders to their servants so they wouldn't have to talk to them directly. The Grey Wolf Queens were known to be lusty and venturesome in matters of love, and the servant underground assumed that Han was their queen's dangersome plaything, who would soon be discarded for someone more biddable. Han figured bets had been laid on how long he would last, and whether he'd go quietly when the time came. He would have wagered himself, but he didn't know what odds to demand. Only Blue Blood seemed unaware of the ongoing speculation. The notion that the queen of the realm would romance a thief seemed beyond comprehension to them which was a blessing, and he meant to make it last. Han made a special effort to win over the servants. His mother had worked in the palace for a time, and he was well aware of how powerful a network the palace underground was, how much information it carried, and how gossip could remake a person. He was free with Queen Race's coin when he asked the palace staff for favors, and he made sure to learn their names and stories— he made it clear that he would make it worthwhile for those who brought him information. He would double the payment of any who sought information about him. He also made it clear that anyone who entered his room intending mischief would die a horrible death. Han had never realized that queens worked so hard. At least this one did. Maybe the old queen hadn't done much of anything in the past year, or maybe it just seemed that way. Raysa toured the city's fortifications, reviewed the Highlander army, and attended services in temples all over the fells. She sat through meeting after meeting, with her stewards, with the Queen's Council, with the committees laying plans for the coronation. Some meetings were routine, while others had to do with projects Raysa herself was pushing. It wasn't easy. Her advisors couldn't agree that water was wet and the sky was blue. Also, there didn't seem to be any money. As Race's bodyguard, Han attended nearly all of her meetings. He hoped to learn something useful, who was who and what was what. But it wore him out. It was all talk, 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 and nothing much accomplished. He stood through most, vibrating like a plucked string, impatient at wasting so much time. It struck him how alone Raysa was. There seemed to be few people at court the Queen could trust— even her father, Averil, had a clan agenda that might not fit with her own. She was always on stage, whether at meals or at a recital, or in conference with her economic advisors. At one afternoon meeting with the Queen's Council, she managed to get into a row with just about everyone. They were seated around the table in her privy chamber, which Han thought was an amusing name, given what was often slung around. As was his custom— Han stood propped against the wall, looking as ruthless as possible. "'General Klimath, Raysa said, lifting her chin in that way she had when she meant to do battle. "'As the contracts with the mercenary forces come due for renewal, I want you to dismiss the foreign brigades and send them home.' "'Send them home, your highness?' Klimath stared at her in astonishment. "'These are dangerous times, my dear.' I know the brigades are expensive, but surely there are other places to cut costs. He ticked off each point on his thick fingers. There is conflict with the water walkers on the western border. Arden is a threat to the south. The army might be needed to help the guard if we have a domestic rebellion. He looked up at the ceiling, making a point of ignoring Lord Averill. There is unrest among the upland clans. They are always unpredictable. Now is not the time to be frugal with the army. 
I think you will find that tensions between clans and Vale folk will diminish once the Blooded Queen is on the throne, and we are convinced that she is no longer in danger, Avril said. In the meantime, we will do whatever it takes to maintain the tenets of the naming and protect the Grey Wolf line. As long as attacks on our villages continue, we will stand ready to defend ourselves. May I remind you that in many areas of the countryside, the demon eye are all that stand between the people and the flatland brigands. I don't mean to cut funding to the army, Raisa said, holding up her hand to quiet the debate. At least not to the degree that it puts us in danger. I intend to field as many soldiers as now, but I want to move to native-born soldiers, men and women who have a loyalty to the fells, who know the land, and will fight hard to defend it. Clemath raised an eyebrow. If there is a rebellion, your highness, it would be best to field professional soldiers who have no possible allegiance to slum dwellers and street thieves. Except that your foreign soldiers have no particular allegiance to me, Raisa said. But they do as they're told, Clemath said, like he was trying his best to be patient. Your homegrown army might betray you. Clemath is native-born, Han thought. Strange that he's so married to the notion of southern mercenaries. Maybe he's lining his own pockets. Maybe he's on the daub from the mercenary brokers and doesn't want to give that up. It's not the primary job of the army to fight our own citizens, Raisa said. People in the fells are close to rebellion because there are no jobs and no way to make a living. The wars in the south have idled hard-working people— wouldn't it be better to use our funds to put our own people to work? Has there been a problem, your highness, with the mercenaries? Clemath asked. There has been a problem, general, with people starving in the fells while we send money to sell swords and brokers in the flatlands. The spots of color on Race's cheeks signaled that she was losing patience. I've been out to the camps. Most of our soldiers seem to be from Arden and Tamron. You'd think they'd have plenty of fighting to do at home. Clemath raised his hands helplessly and turned to the others on the council. Gentlemen? Gentlemen? Raisa repeated. That's another problem. Why aren't there more women on my council? They all looked at one another, each waiting for someone else to speak. They were all men, save one spare, red-haired woman Han didn't know. Well... Uh, Lord Hackham flailed about for an answer. The members... It's the office, not the gender, you know. I'm going to fix that, Raisa said to herself. Your Highness, Lord Bayar said with an indulgent smile. With reference to the mercenary issue, perhaps it's wise to listen to your counselors. We are here to help, after all. I knew you were kind-hearted, Your Highness. Lord Hackham said, patting Race's hand. But you are as yet unschooled in military matters. Although the mercenaries are expensive, it is dangerous to make so radical a change during this transition period. Above all, we want to keep you safe. Hackham served as her financial minister as well as chair of the Queen's Council. The guard keeps me safe, Uncle, Raisa said, firmly withdrawing her hand. And the good will of my people which I mean to earn. Eamon Byrne cleared his throat. As captain of the Queen's Guard, he was an ex-officio member of the council, but he didn't speak out often. We use only native-borns in the Queen's Guard, and it's worked well for us. Until recently, our army was native-born as well. And we lost Queen Mariana despite her native-born guard, Lord Bayar said. Are you suggesting it was murder? Byrne asked, looking the high wizard in the eyes. Bayar backed off. I'm only raising the possibility, nothing more, he said. I'm saying I still have questions about how she died. Really? I thought perhaps you had the answers, Avril said. I did too, Han thought. Why is Lord Bayar raising questions about Queen Mariana's death when he's likely the one who did her? That's enough, Raisa said. Into the silence that followed, she said, Anyone who has solid information about my mother's death should speak to Captain Byrne. 
We will not sling accusations here in this council. This is like a rival gang standoff, Han thought, with Raisa trying to be street lord over all of them. Raisa waited, and when nobody said anything, went on. Regarding the reshaping of the army, I thank you for your advice, but I have made my decision. This is not an impulsive move. I've been looking at this issue for some time. I will rely on you, General Klimath, to provide proper training to our new recruits. Yes, Your Highness, General Klimath said, bowing his head. As you wish, but with so many other pressing obligations, I hope you realize that it can't be done overnight. This change will be so gradual as to be unnoticeable, Han thought. In a year, we'll have no more than a handful of native-borns in the army, and Klimath will still have his mercenaries. I don't expect you to do it without help, General, Raisa said sweetly. As Captain Byrne is experienced in working with native-born soldiers, he will assist you in implementing this. She laced her fingers and rested her chin on her hands. Also, Speaker Jemson has contacts in Rag Market and Southbridge, where I expect many of our recruits will come from. Lord Averill is similarly connected in the camps. The clans have been underrepresented in the army, and I mean to field a force that reflects all the peoples of the Fells. She paused, looking at each man in turn. The four of you are accountable for this. You will meet at least weekly, and I will expect monthly progress reports. Irritation flickered across Klimath's face, then quickly extinguished. Jemson frowned, looking as if he wished to say something, but didn't. Byrne's expression said that he would see it done if that's what his queen required. She's put him in a spot, Han thought. The Blue Jackets and the army already hate each other, but she doesn't have much choice if she really means to make this happen. What other business is there? Raisa asked, stretching her arms out in front of her and rotating her shoulders like they hurt. This arrived from Tamron Court via the garrison at Tamron Crossing, Klimath said sullenly, extending an envelope toward Raisa. It is addressed to you from Gerard Montan, Prince of Tamron. Prince Gerard? Hans stiffened. He and Dancer had a run-in with Gerard in Arden's Court. Gerard had tried to recruit them for his wizard army. If not for Cat Tyburn, he might have succeeded. Strange that Klimath would give Raisa the message at this meeting, Han thought. Why wouldn't he just forward it to her with other dispatches from the border? Unless he already knew what it said and wanted to see how Queen and Council reacted to the message within. Raisa stilled herself for a long moment, took a deep breath, then took the envelope from Klimath. It was thick, creamy stationery, sealed with a wax stamp. Ripping the seal free, she slid a folded sheet from the envelope. She unfolded it and spread it out on the table. Tucking her hair behind her ears, she bent her head to scan the message so Han couldn't see her expression. She appeared to read over it twice, running her finger along the page as if to assure herself that she was reading every line. When she raised her head, her complexion resembled the tawny marble they dug from the quarries in Weenhaven, set with the emeralds of her eyes. Pressing the heels of her hands into the table, she tapped on the page with her fingers, staring straight ahead. Well, Lord Bayar asked impatiently, what does Montan have to say? Raisa flinched as if startled and looked at the High Wizard, her eyes unusually bright. What is it, Your Highness? Bayar said, leaning forward and reaching for the letter. Perhaps we could shed some perspective on... Here, Lord Bayar, Raisa said, thrusting the page toward him. Why don't you read it aloud for the council? She sat back, arms folded, gripping her elbows to either side. Bayar scanned the page quickly then looked up at Raisa as if seeking clues as to how she might respond. Clearing his throat, he bent his head over the paper and began to read. Chapter 28 Love Letter from Arden To Her Majesty Queen Raisa of the Fells I write in the fervent hope that this finds you well, and to offer congratulations on your imminent coronation. 
Please also accept my condolences on the sudden and yet remarkably timely death of your mother, Queen Mariana. It is well known that relations between the two of you have been strained of late. Her accident, while unfortunate, has cleared a major obstacle from your path. It appears that you, like me, don't hesitate to shape events to your advantage. This only reinforces my notion that we are natural allies and could be more than that. Blood of the demon, Avril swore. Clearly, this wasn't a message intended to be read aloud in company. Or perhaps it was. Han watched Race's face. It retained its stone-like quality, stamped with a faintly interested expression. He could tell that she was watching all the other faces in the room. Daughter, Avril said, you shouldn't entertain this kind of slander. The notion that you would have had anything to do with your mother's death is ludicrous. And yet many suspect me, Raisa said, especially outside of the fells. She gestured to Bayar. Go on. It will take some time to re-establish order in Tamron and rid the kingdom of spies and traitorous elements. The abuses and excesses of the recent king have stoked the fires of rebellion among both nobles and commons. They must understand that those days are over. Indeed, the former prince and princess are at risk of assassination by their own people. You will be glad to know that I am keeping them well secured within my keep. The current confusion does, I believe, present an opportunity for us to expand our holdings. My brother, Prince Jeff, continues to lay claim to the Kingdom of Arden. He has reinforced his borders with Tamron and brought his army west to meet any threat from us. This leaves his northern borders lightly garrisoned and unprotected. I understand that the Fells maintains a standing army of more than five thousand horse and foot soldiers. Bayar looked up from the letter. Remarkably accurate count, wouldn't you say? Remarkable, Raisa murmured. Bayar resumed reading. I propose the following, the details of which are to be negotiated by our representatives. The Fells will invade the Kingdom of Arden from the north, committing at least 3,000 of its troops to this campaign. The Felsian army will drive south as far as Temple Church and hold its position there. This will divert the Ardenine army away from the western border and allow us to advance from that direction to take the capital. It would also make any future alliance with Jeff unlikely, if not impossible, Avril said. Raisa nodded, lips tight together. Go on, she directed Bayar. He continued reading. Once Arden is securely under my control, I will withdraw most of my army from Tamron, leaving the Tomlins to rule as my regents there, assuming that they can be made to understand certain realities. Finally, I propose an immediate marriage contract between us, with the marriage to be solemnized as soon as our military objectives are accomplished. It would be best, of course, for our betrothal to remain secret for now. Following our marriage, we will jointly rule the larger kingdom of Arden, Tamron, and the Fells. You would, of course, retain your title of Queen of the Fells, a title that our daughters would inherit. We needn't stop there. Given your line's history we would have a natural claim to the rest of the Seven Realms. With our combined resources, we can add these jewels to our crown. You will be the beautiful and glittering symbol of a new age of peace and prosperity. Do give this proposal careful consideration. I think you agree that this arrangement presents significant advantages to us both, if we act quickly. I also hope you are able to set aside the unfortunate incidents along the border between Tamron and Arden, and know that it was my desire to cement a match with you that drove my behavior. These times call for bold and aggressive action. Best, Gerard Montan, King of Arden and Tamron. Bayar tossed the pages onto the table with a snort. 
The new king of Tamron takes you for a fool, your highness. Raisa laced her fingers, resting her hands on the table. Do you think so, Lord Bayar? During that unfortunate incident, as he calls it, Montan murdered young Will Mathis in cold blood, Bayar said. Raisa nodded. I was there. Not only that, Bayar continued, some speculate that his agents may be responsible for the murders we've seen recently, right here in the city. Murders? Raisa looked from face to face, fastening on Captain Burns. What murders? Five of the gifted have been murdered in the past fortnight, and the bodies left in Ragmarket, Burns said. The murders seem indiscriminate, connected only by the fact that all of the victims were wizards. One was a member of the Assembly, but the last two were students slumming in Ragmarket. They were found in a back alley with their throats cut and their amulets missing, painted over in blood. That caught Han's attention. Kat had mentioned that there'd been several murders of the gifted in Ragmarket and Southbridge. She'd asked around, but nobody seemed to be bragging about it. Whoever's running that crew has starch, Han thought at the time. Or a death wish. Why would Montan kill wizards in Ragmarket? Raisa asked. It's just one theory, Burns said. As you know, your highness, Montan has abducted wizards and forced them into his army. But it's likely he's been having difficulty getting his hands on magical weaponry. So he might be killing wizards in order to collect their amulets or seeking to reduce the supply of gifted in the north. Bayar rolled his lace cuffs. Some say Gerard Montan is behind it. Others believe we should look closer to home. He turned his head very deliberately and looked at Avril Demonai. The red-haired wizard leaned forward, nodding her support. By all means, look closer to home, Lord Demonai said, glancing up at the ceiling, after all, wizards have a long history of preying on each other. Perhaps some have chosen this means to address the shortage of flashcraft. Isn't it more likely to be gang-related? Race's gaze flickered to Han, then fixed back on her captain. That could be, Byrne said, but the gangs usually leave wizards alone. All right, Raisa said wearily, as if she were adding this problem to some mental list. Let's get back to the matter at hand. She looked around the table. What about the rest of you? What do you think of Montan's proposal? Is she really considering it? Han wondered. He'd met Gerard Montan, and he wasn't buying anything the prince was selling. I agree with Lord Bayard, Byrne said, whether or not Montan has anything to do with those murders. My guess is, since he hasn't been able to defeat his brother on his own, He's hoping the army of the Fells will distract Jeff long enough for him to gain a foothold. He paused. Our losses could be devastating. Our army is trained for mountain fighting, where our smaller numbers aren't such a disadvantage. Out on the Arden Plains, we can be flanked and overwhelmed. Let's not be hasty, General Klemath said, adjusting his bulk in his seat. While there is some truth to what Captain Byrne says... His knowledge of our army and the tactics of flatland warfare is limited. Many of our mercenary soldiers have trained in Arden and Tamron for just this kind of fighting. In this instance, it may be that our employ of experienced mercenaries will lead to success rather than failure. He smiled smugly, as if he felt redeemed. A strong marriage to the south would cement your position, Klemath continued, and discourage those who might seek to take advantage of a young and inexperienced queen. Why is Race's general offering political advice, Han wondered. What's his dog in this fight? Lord Hackham nodded in agreement. There may be opportunity here if we proceed carefully. Whether any alliance with Arden would be acceptable to the Council of Nobles would depend on how claims for land and holdings are adjudicated and whether Southerners have any claims on properties here in the North. Tilting his head back, Hackham looked down his nose at the others. If we come to Gerard's aid, it would seem that grants of lands and estates in Arden should be ceded to us as victors. 
There's the potential that many of us could do very well on a larger stage, with more resources. He smiled, his eyes lighting with avarice. Arden and Tamron, think of it. Miles and miles of fertile fields and riches such as we've never seen in the fells. He's in as long as he gets shares, Han thought. Everybody here is voting his own interest. Running this council is like herding cats and rats together and trying to keep anybody from having a meal. I was just an Arden, Han said, and it's not what you think. They've been at war for almost a decade, so it's pretty torn up. A lot of the crops have been destroyed, and they've been pouring money into their armies for so long, there's been little to spare for building and repair. They all looked at him as if a dog had suddenly spoken up, offering military advice. Well then, Hackham said, folding his fingers carefully together and wrinkling his nose like he smelled something bad. Likely many of the major landholders have been killed, so there will be properties available and in need of management. There may also be the opportunity to negotiate advantageous marriages with prominent families in Arden or Tamron. That may be, Lord Hackham, Avril said, assuming that Gerard wins. I've not been impressed with his military efforts so far. If Jeff wins against us as Gerard's allies, I suspect we won't be making any marriages to the South. He paused. Your Highness, you already know my opinion of Gerard Montan. He's a snake, and a snake doesn't change its basic nature if you dress it up and give it a fancier title. I think it wise to look both inside and outside the Queendom for a match, but as a father and a counselor, I can't advise that you go to Montan. You would never sleep soundly in his bed. A ghost of a smile passed across Race's face, coming and going so quickly that Han wasn't sure he'd really seen it. Maybe Montan wouldn't sleep soundly either, Han thought. That cheered him, but only a little. We may be able to secure our objectives without committing to your marriage to the Prince of Arden, Your Highness, Lord Hackham said. Perhaps he would be satisfied with another match. My daughter Melissa, for example, is cousin to you, and a marriage between them would strengthen our ties outside the queendom. It would be a grave error to allow Gerard Montan to gain a foothold here, Lord Bayar said. The next thing we know, we'll have the crows of Malthus flocking into the cities and taking over our temples. That will never happen, Lord Avril said, glancing at Speaker Jemson, who, as usual, listened more than spoke. The expression on Avril's face reminded Han that he'd been, and still was, a demon eye warrior. Come, Gavin, General Klemath said to Bayar, ignoring Avril. Surely we can work this to our advantage and manage this in a way to keep us all safe. I'll match our wizards against Gerard Montan any day. There is some risk, but there is much to gain in this. Arrows are faster than jinxes, Han murmured. Once again, they all stared at him. Alistair is right, Byrne said. Used strategically, wizards could play a pivotal role in a military campaign. But we're not used to cooperating in that way. We've not fought such a war in a thousand years. It was a peculiar marriage of interests, Lord Avril and Captain Byrne and Lord Bayar and Han Alistair agreeing on anything was as rare as gold in Ragmarket. I think you'll find that the Council of Nobles will concur that an alliance with Gerard Montan presents a rare opportunity, Lord Hackham said, especially now that he holds Tamron. Perhaps we should meet with his representatives before we come to a decision. By all means, let us open negotiations with Montan's representatives, Racer said. That commits us to nothing, and we may learn more about his intentions. At the very least, it may keep him at bay as long as he thinks it's a possibility. While I'm not keen on a match with Gerard, I certainly wish to keep all options open when it comes to the best interests of the realm. I think we have to be practical in such matters, whatever our personal inclinations. Uncle, I will leave this in your hands. Hackham smiled like a sharp that spies a Nick Ninny mark. I will keep you apprised of developments, Your Highness. Ignoring the scowls on Bayar's and Demon Eye's faces, Raisa folded the letter, 
returned it to its envelope and set it aside, closing the subject. Is there anything else before we adjourn? Lord Bayar stood. Your Highness, as you know, the Queen appoints one member to the Wizard Council, who speaks for her interests. Our next meeting is scheduled a week from now, and it would be wise for you to have a representative there. We will want to choose a new High Wizard as soon as possible to provide you proper protection. His gaze swept over Han as if he were an example of improper protection. Really? Raisa said, raising an eyebrow. It's scheduled in a week, is it? She drummed her fingers on the table. Bayar should have known better. Either he was blind to Raisa's moods, or he didn't care to try to read her. As time is short, may I suggest my daughter, Fiona? He said. You grew up together, and, as you said, it would be useful to have another young lady on the council. A young lady who would like to nudge Raisa right off the throne, Han thought. Raisa folded her arms, a sign of resistance. Don't the Bayars already have a seat on the council, in addition to your role as High Wizard and Chair? Lord Bayar nodded. As my eldest, Micah, has turned eighteen, he will assume the Bayar seat on the council. I, of course, will continue as Chair until a new High Wizard is chosen. So Micah's the older twin, Han thought. Add Fiona, and that'd be three Bayars on the Wizard Council. That wasn't such a good idea, especially if they were getting ready to pick a new High Wizard. Thank you, Lord Bayar, Raisa said. I appreciate your suggestion, but I've already chosen a representative to the Council. Lord Bayar's head came up, and he wiped a look of startlement off his face. Really, Your Highness? So quickly... Is it someone I know? Alistair has agreed to serve, Raisa said, nodding toward Han, where he stood against the wall. Once again, heads turned like beads on a string. Street face, Han said to himself, looking back at them. Gavin Bayar didn't bother to hide his opinion. Your Highness, he protested, turning back to Raisa. No doubt Alistair would bring a refreshing new perspective to our deliberations. However, despite your generous pardoning of him for past crimes, he would be ill-suited to represent your interests among members of the oldest and most illustrious families of wizards in the Queendom. His rather colorful history doesn't prepare him for his duties there. I don't know, Lord Bayar, Raisa said, her voice like sweet poison dripping into their ears. The Wizard Council has been described to me as a nest of vipers. It may be that his street-fighting experience will serve him well in that environment. The council members shifted in their seats, looking everywhere but at the powerful high wizard and the stubborn young queen. Han crossed his arms, affecting nonchalance, looking frankly back at anyone bold enough to meet his eyes. Princess Raisa, I beg you to reconsider, said the red-haired woman, there is some question as to whether Alistair is truly gifted. He's come out of nowhere, we know nothing about his family, and it seems his power has manifested only recently. Lady Griffin is right, Bayar said. There is talk that his so-called gifts are not gifts at all, but a manifestation of demonic possession, fueled by blood sacrifice. Takes a demon to no one, Han thought. I'm from Ragmarket, Lord Bayar, he said, pulling away from the wall and standing, feet slightly apart. And I came by my gifts in the usual way. As to why they didn't surface earlier, well, there are reasons. Han's gaze flicked to Lord Avril, who wore his traitor face, then back to Bayar. As for my family, my father was Danil. He died as a mercenary in the Southern Wars, Han went on. My mother's name was Sarah, called Sally, and my sister was Mary. They died last summer, but then you already know that. Every time you forget, I'll remind you. That's the blood sacrifice I made to be here, and that's enough. His words sent ripples through the council like a stone dropped into a pool. Han looked from face to face, and the only friendly one was Jemson's, and Jemson looked worried. Lady Griffin cleared her throat. That's exactly my point, Your Highness. 
My son Adam was recently named to the council. When you compare his pedigree to that of a street thief, I think you'll find that... Lady Griffin, your son was my teacher at Mistwork House, Han said. If you have any questions about my credentials as a wizard, I suggest you send a note to Dean Abelard. As it happens, Dean Abelard is on her way back to the Fells, Lady Griffin said. We shall certainly ask her opinion, though realistically, as a first-year student, you'd have had limited contact with the Dean of Mistwork House. Actually, I saw quite a lot of Dean Abelard, Han said, straightening his stoles. She was... she was sort of a mentor to me. He hadn't intended on playing the Abelard card so soon, but just now it was a useful distraction. Bayar's eyes narrowed. Micah and Fiona would have already put a word in his ear about Abelard and Alistair. Whatever Abelard says, your highness, you must weigh the risk in having such a person close to you, Bayar began. This conversation is over, Raisa said, bullying right through whatever Bayar intended to say. I've made my decision, and Alistair is my choice. It was my hope that the Council would accept it with grace. Failing that, they had better learn to live with it. Lord Averill studied Han, eyes narrowed as if wondering what his sellsword was up to. Lord Bayar kept his eyes fixed on Raisa, and there was something in his gaze that gave Han the chills. He hadn't survived on the streets as long as he had by overlooking murder in his enemy's eyes. The High Wizard inclined his head. Very well, Your Highness. If Alistair is your choice, we will certainly arrange to welcome him to the Council House on Grey Lady next week. He still didn't look at Han, as if acknowledging his presence would give him too much credit. I look forward to it, Han said, displaying his street lord smile. He tried to ignore the voice in his head, the one that said, Kill him now, Alistair. Kill him now before he tries again. If that is everything, then we stand adjourned. Raisa said abruptly. Alistair, Captain Byrne, Lord Demonai, Speaker Jemson, stay behind. She's intentionally rubbing salt into the wounds she already made, Han thought. The rest filed out, stiff-backed and silent. Byrne poked his head out the door and spoke to someone just beyond, no doubt one of his blue jackets. Then he closed the door and returned to the table. After a moment of awkward silence, Avril said, You've made some enemies here today, daughter. Do you think they were ever my friends, father? Raisa said bitterly, standing and pacing back and forth. They've never been your friends, Avril said, but now they have reason to think you will be difficult to manage. Good, Raisa said. I won't be managed, and I won't be condescended to. These are dangerous times, my dear, she mocked. As if I don't know that. They need to know that times have changed. There have already been two attempts on your life, Speaker Jemson said. Four, actually, Raisa said, toying with the hilt of the dagger she always carried. Four, then, Jemson amended. I must admit I'm worried, Your Highness. So am I, Raisa said. But if we force their hands, they may make a mistake and we'll have the proof we need. Otherwise, I can't think of any way we'll find out what really happened to my mother. Or we'll make a mistake, and you'll be dead, Byrne said. They only need to get lucky once. We need to be perfect every time. My thinking exactly, Han said to himself. As if she'd heard him, Raisa swung around and glared at Han. What about you? she demanded. You've scarcely said a word. What do you think about all this? Han gathered his thoughts, surprised to be asked his opinion. I think it might have been smart to wait until after the coronation to pick fights with Lord Bayar, he said. It's like poking at a wasp's nest. Do it enough, and you'll get stung, no matter how careful you are. Trust me, I know. You! You should talk, Raisa said, opening and closing her hands as if she wanted to wrap them around somebody's neck. Do you think you made any friends in there? Oh, they hated me already, Han said, shrugging. Don't get me wrong. I think you're right to start with the army. Until you're in control of it, you're at risk. It's like running a gang that's blood-sworn to your second-in-command. You don't dare dismiss them, because they'll turn on you. 
You already know that Klemath will fight like a demon to keep control of the army. If Klemath and Bayar throw in together, all you got is the guard. He shrugged, nodding toward Byrne. No disrespect to Captain Byrne, but that's what Queen Mariana had, and she's dead. Briar Rose, you can't be serious about a marriage with Gerard Montan, Avril said, giving Han a shut-up kind of look. Please, tell me you're not serious. As long as I pretend to entertain the proposal from Montan, that keeps him in the south and drives a wedge between Klimath and Hackam and Bayar, Raisa replied. They've been in bed together too often recently. The Council of Nobles will side with my uncle, especially if mercenaries do the fighting, and the Crown pays the bills. Lord Hackam will spend at least as much energy trying to engineer a match with my cousin Melissa as in serious negotiations for my betrothal. She rolled her eyes. Until I can get control of these people, I have to keep them from ganging up on me. Was that why you had Lord Bayar read it out in council? Jemson asked, understanding dawning on his face. Raisa twisted the ring on her finger, smiling grimly. Klimath had certainly read it already. There's no telling who else. That thing has been opened and resealed so many times, it's a miracle it's still legible. She looked pointedly at Han. You were saying? Don't underestimate this, girlie, Han reminded himself. Don't ever do that. Some blue bloods grow up fast, just like street lords. He cleared his throat. I agree you need to push the thing with the army, chancy as it is. Soon as it's safe, you ditch Klimath and put someone in place who's beholden to you. So I think what you did was right though maybe I would have done it at a different time. Raisa gazed at him for a long moment, then gave a quick nod. Yes, well, all right then. I didn't realize you planned to name Hans alone to the Wizard Council, Your Highness, Avril said, frowning. When did you make that decision? Lord Demon I obviously thought he should have been in on it. Han waited, wondering if Raisa would say anything about his demand to be named to the Council. She didn't. What choice did I have? Raisa said, like she wasn't happy about it. I wasn't going to send Fiona Bayar. This way, Alistair can keep an eye on them. General Klemath was right about one thing, Speaker Jemson said. These are dangerous times. Raisa said briskly, What's done is done. I expect you three to hold Klemath's feet to the fire on the army issue. I want to see real progress within three months. Look over those mercenary contracts and see which ones are up for renewal. I'll issue a writ that no new contracts are to be ratified without all four signatures. If you get resistance, let me know. She sighed, rubbing her eyelids with the tips of her fingers. I'm sorry to put you in this position, she said, speaking through her hands. I wish I had someone in the army I could trust. Give me a little time, Your Highness, Byrne said. I'll make a few inquiries and give you some names. Some of the officers are native-born. Another possibility is to transfer some good officers from the guard to the army. That's what we don't have is time, Raisa said. So much to do, so little time and money. With that, she dismissed them. As Han passed through the cluster of blue jackets around the door, he looked back to see Raisa standing alone in her privy chamber, head down, twisting the wolf ring on her right hand. She's more worried than she lets on, Han thought. Chapter 29 A Game of Suitors Gerard Montan wasn't the only one interested in a match with Raisa. As word spread throughout the Seven Realms that the missing princess heir had resurfaced and would be crowned Queen of the Fells, the flow of suitor gifts recommenced, from inside and outside the queendom. It was a mixed blessing. Raisa still hoped to put off marriage as long as possible, but her coffers were nearly empty, and she wanted to continue to support the Briar Rose Ministry in Ragmarket and Southbridge. To everyone else, an unmarried crown princess was seen as a loose end that should be either clipped or knitted up as soon as possible. Dissonant messages of consolation on her mother's death and congratulations on her impending coronation arrived from the other monarchs in the realms, 
salted with opening bids in the marriage auction. Some offered younger sons who needed thrones to sit upon. Others suggested the joining of the Fells to kingdoms as far away as Bruin Swallow and Weenhaven. Although Reza Anna Mariana wasn't yet crowned, and rumor had it she was keeping a thief as a paramour, and that she likely had a hand in Queen Mariana's death, most were willing to overlook that in consideration of the queendom's mineral-rich holdings. They'd heard the northern queens were all witches anyway. Everyone abroad seemed eager to help a young orphaned queen govern her queendom. Everyone at home seemed anxious to get her married off as soon as possible, as long as it was to their favorite. The Klemath brothers re-emerged as suitors amid a plethora of local hopefuls. The foremost marriage candidate from the uplands was Reed Nightwalker. He spent more time in the capital than Raysa could ever remember because of his assignment to Avril's guard. The demon eye warrior launched a quiet courtship, bringing gifts of fur throws and leatherwork and clan made jewelry, perfumes and aromatics from the markets. Clearly, he hoped to follow in Avril's footsteps and marry a queen. Raysa and Nightwalker took long walks through the gardens sometimes, her gray wolves following a respectful distance behind. Sometimes they rode into the hills surrounding the Vale, but always with an escort. Nightwalker listened more than he spoke, and he didn't push as hard as he had in the past to go beyond kisses and caresses. I could do worse, Raysa thought, as a political match anyway. She ticked off the advantages. Nightwalker was unquestionably committed to Felsian interests. He wouldn't be trying to make the Fells a minor province in a faraway realm. He would support her efforts to clean up the Dernwater and keep the Wizard Council in check. A marriage to him would reinforce the ties between the clans and the Grey Wolf line. And it would serve the Bayars right, after all of their plotting and scheming to marry Raysa off to Micah. All in all, Nightwalker seemed like the safest choice, the same one her mother had made. On the personal side, at least he was closer to her age than Avril had been to her mother's. He was lithe and graceful and handsome. Although it was unlikely he would remain faithful to her, that wouldn't affect the line, at least. Micah Bayar was another matter. With Race's return, he abruptly left off his pursuit of Melanie. As a result, Melanie moped about, tearful and sullen much of the time, trying Raysa's patience. You're just thirteen, Raysa thought, and a princess. Get used to it. Me, I'm done with romantic entanglements. Everybody I get involved with is either forbidden or unavailable or mad at me. For instance, Han Alistair was by turns brisk and businesslike, cold and unreadable, or slightly mocking. He deftly deflected or ignored Race's many attempts to restore or rekindle their friendship. They'd had one tutoring session, and it had been a disaster. Alone together in her privy chamber, she'd rattled on like a runaway horse, dissecting the politics at court until she was entirely bored with herself. Han had sat there clenching the arms of his chair, stony-faced and glaze-eyed, like he wasn't hearing half of what she said. Raysa was exquisitely aware of him, constantly measuring the physical and emotional distance between them. Their next two sessions had been cancelled and rescheduled, once by him, for undisclosed reasons, and once by Raysa, because of a conflicting meeting. Why does he even bother, she thought. I'm at a total loss for what to say to him that would do any good. I don't know how to go about rebuilding trust between us, or if that's even possible. There is one thing I can do, Raysa thought. I can't give Han Alistair a pedigree, but I can give him a title, and a home to replace the one that was burnt on Mariana's orders. Maybe that would make him feel more secure, more at ease at court. She thrust away the nagging thought that neither her father nor the Bayars would be happy about it. I'm not here to make them happy, she told herself. Plans for her coronation proceeded amid the hard work of governing. Invitations to the coronation ball were sent out, and acceptances flooded back from throughout the seven realms. Some were likely curiosity-seekers 
who wanted to see what the headstrong princess heir would do next, now that she was on her own, without maternal supervision. Those who hoped to woo and wed her would come, for fear she might be married off in a hurry and they would miss an opportunity. Others were no doubt looking to enjoy a week of hospitality at somebody else's expense. Or maybe they were eager to see what a real witch looked like. Most of the thanes from Arden declined, citing the demands of the ongoing war. But, to Race's surprise, King Jeff Montan of Arden sent word that he would attend, along with his queen and two children. He must be feeling more confident about his hold on the throne, Raisa thought, to leave Arden at this time. From what the queendom's spies reported, Jeff had mustered nearly unanimous support among the war-weary southern thanes. Raisa hoped he wasn't another Gerard. At least this Montan was already married. There was no response from Tamron, either from the Tomlins or Gerard Montan. She guessed that was a good thing. It would be awkward to have two kings of Arden in attendance. Meanwhile, Lord Hackham's negotiations with Gerard's representatives dragged on. Raisa submitted to multiple fittings under Magritte's supervision. She needed a dress for the coronation ceremony itself, a gown for the ball, dresses for all the parties that would occur before and after. It wouldn't do for Raisa to wear the same thing to more than one party. Maybe I could just swap with somebody, Raisa groused. We shouldn't be spending this kind of money on clothes I'll probably wear once. Magritte rolled her eyes. As if anyone could fit into your clothes, she said, and you would swim in anybody else's. A coronation happens once in your life, your highness, as does a wedding, she added pointedly. Raisa made sure that Melanie was well outfitted also. She hoped that the series of social events would lift her younger sister out of her funk. And indeed, while Raisa tolerated the fittings, they seemed to cheer Melanie considerably. Raisa's younger sister loved trying on clothes. Like Mariana, she was fond of parties. There were long sessions in the cathedral temple with Speaker Jemson rehearsing for the coronation. That's my life from here on in, Raisa thought dispiritedly, one ceremony after another. But Speaker Jemson was kind and funny. He took the coronation seriously, but it helped that he didn't take himself too seriously. The Grey Wolves had been assigned to Raisa's personal guard, and so would play an important role in the coronation ceremony. At rehearsals, they stood stiff and solemn, brows furrowed in concentration. In a way, it made it worse that they were friends. Raisa knew they would never forgive themselves if they made some misstep that marred her big day. Raisa missed her easy camaraderie with the wolves. They were constantly around her, but now the barrier of rank stood between them. It was hard to relax with someone who came to attention whenever you entered the room. Eamon had carried the water walker staff Dimitri had given Raisa all the way from Odin's Ford. They resumed practice with it three times a week in the barracks yard. It was a good workout, but more important, it was the only alone time she had with Eamon these days. It allowed them private conversations away from listeners in the palace walls. Four days after she announced her appointment of Han to the Wizards' Council, Raisa walked back from the stables at dusk after a long ride across the Vale with Reed Demoni and an entourage of guards. She was flushed and sweaty, muscles loose, the tension dissipated by hours in the saddle. She and Nightwalker had parted with a kiss at the stable door. He wanted more than that, of course. Expected more by now. She just wished she could conjure up a little more enthusiasm. Talia Abbott and Trey Archer were on guard outside her room. Raisa paused in front of her door and smiled at Talia. How is Sergeant Greenholt settling in? she asked. Pearly Greenholt, Talia's Ardenine girlfriend, was new to the Fells. The former weapons master at Wean House, she'd been named sergeant under the new Captain Byrne. She likes it well enough, Your Highness, Talia said with studied politeness. Thank you for asking. Raisa raised an eyebrow. Really? Talia snickered. She says it's too bloody cold up here, and she's tired of walking on a slant all the time. Plus, she misses the fresh fruits and greens we had year-round at the Ford. 
says all the turnips and cabbage gave her the farts. Rasa laughed, knowing Pearlie would be mortified if she knew what secrets Talia was sharing with the Queen of the Fells. But Talia, at least, was short on formality. Back in Rasa's room, her bath waited on its burner, steaming in the chilly air, but Magret was nowhere to be seen. She must be down with one of her headaches, Rasa thought. She ordered a light supper sent up and wearily stripped off her riding breeches, jacket, and underclothes. As she sank into the hot water, her thoughts returned to the question that had been deviling her since she lost her temper with her advisers. Had she made the right decision in putting Han Alistair on the Wizard Council? Would Han be able to help her on the Council, or would he be shunned as the outsider he was? Or worse, murdered for his arrogance? Avril had made it clear he disapproved. It was what Han had wanted, but... She must have fallen asleep. She woke to a hard rap on the door and assumed it was supper arriving. Climbing from her bath, she toweled off and shrugged into her dressing gown. She walked into the sitting room, but when the sound repeated, she realized it came from the inside door to Han's suite. She put her lips to the door. What do you want? she said. I believe we have an appointment, your highness, Han said through the door. Appointment? Oh. Right. It was time for their rescheduled tutoring session. Blood and bones. She wasn't ready to face another evening with a cold, distant Han Alistair. It was just too painful. This isn't a good time after all, Rasa said, looking down at her bare toes peeking out from under her dressing gown. Could we meet later in the week? I need to talk to you. Now, he said brusquely. After a pause, he added, we had a bargain, right? Rasa sighed. Yes, she said. We did. She unlocked the door and yanked it open. Han brushed past her into the room, not seeming to notice her state of dress. She noticed his. Her tailors had been busy. He wore a blue silk coat that matched his eyes and black trousers made to fit. Maybe I should ask them to dress him in a burlap, she thought. He'd be easier to resist. He walked to the window, rested his hands on the stone sill, and looked out over the city. Han's back was bored straight, feet slightly apart, shoulders square and tense. He's angry, Rasa thought. What now? I've ordered supper, she said. Have you eaten? We can talk while we eat. I'm not hungry, he said, still staring out the window. Look, Rasa said, goaded beyond endurance. There's no point in meeting if you're going to... I hear I have a castle on the Firehole River, Han said to the window. And a title. Oh, yes, Rasa said in a rush. I meant to tell you, but I haven't seen you since I worked out the details. Ravenguard, it's called. The castle is good-sized, stone and timber, though in need of repairs. There's quite a bit of property with it. Good hunting and pasturage. A few outbuildings. Not so good for farming, but... Don't you think it would have been a good idea to tell me? Han said, swinging around to face her. It's the talk of the court. I'm the last to know about it. I meant to tell you, Rasa said. It just slipped my mind. I didn't realize word was out. But of course it was. Rumors spread at court like the night itches in rag market. I thought you'd be happy. To have a home, I mean, she added lamely. She'd hoped that property and a title would help bridge the chasm between them. And maybe I would be, if it was done differently. He shook his head. Don't you get it? It makes me look like a fool that I didn't even know about it, like you were gifting a favorite instead of meeting an obligation. Rasa winced, biting her lip. I was tired of Lord Bayard calling you Alistair and the thief, so I thought I'd give you a title. Do you think that will stop him? Hans snorted. Alistair and Thief don't bother me so much. At least they're accurate. It's when they call me your doxy that I object. His voice shook, and it seemed to take a moment to master himself. He was all sharp corners and frayed edges tonight. Rasa blinked at him, but he swung away again, scowling into the fireplace. His anger confused her. She hadn't thought of him as someone who would be over-worried about gossip. Maybe even the rumor that they were lovers repulsed him. 
She came up behind him and touched him on the elbow. He flinched, but didn't turn around. People will talk at court, Raisa said. There's no way to stop them. He said nothing. The talking about me as well, she said. It's my reputation, too. You think I'm worried about my bloody reputation? Han finally turned and looked at her. If they think you favor me, if they think I'm your pretty boy plaything, they'll come after both of us. The only thing that stands between me and them is fear and respect. I've got to make show. We're not in Southbridge anymore, Raisa said. It's not like you're muscling into another gang's territory. No? Han raised an eyebrow. That's what you think. Walking into the Wizard Council House will be a lot like walking into Southbridge after midnight wearing ragger colors and carrying a sack full of gold. You're the one that demanded a room next to mine, Raisa retorted. You're the one that asked to be on the council. What did you think would happen? The thing is, you can't be waving me like a red flag in front of the Wizard Council. He gripped her arms and looked down at her. Listen, for both our sakes, you have to act like you hate me. Like you don't want me here at all. I hate you? Raisa rolled her eyes, exquisitely aware of his hot fingers on her upper arms. Well, that makes sense. That's why I gave you the room next to mine and named you to the Wizard Council. Let them think you're doing it against your will, Han said. Maybe you're doing it under pressure from Dean Abelard. They already think I'm crewing for her. Or maybe I'm blackmailing you. If they think you don't really want me on the council, they won't guess I'm your pair of eyes. I don't want people to think I can be bullied, Raisa countered. Better that than they think we're allies, Han said. We got to amuse them for a while until I get my game going. After that, it won't matter. What is your game, Raisa thought. Are we really allies? What are you really after? Revenge on the Bayars? Is it all about that? It's a little late to convince them we're enemies, don't you think? Raisa said. After the Queen's Council meeting and all. Han laughed, but it had a bitter edge. Nah, they'll go for it. Despite the rumors, Blue Bloods don't want to believe you could be allies with a street rat. It turns their stomachs. They'd be happy to know different. We're not all like that, Raisa wanted to say, but knew it would do no good. But that still puts you at risk. Raisa said. If people think you're my enemy, it'll be open season on you. Everyone, even my friends, will be out to get you. Trust me, it's even riskier if they think you and I are tight, Han said. That makes nobody happy. The Wizard Council begins to think about hushing both of us and putting Melanie on the throne. The clans will be all over me if they think there's something between us. Your father is already jumpy because you put me on the council. But you'll be all alone she said. You can't fight everybody. I'll be alone? He looked her up and down, his mouth quirking into a half-smile. Who's more alone, you or me? I don't have many friends, but at least I can count on those I have. Nobody's cozying up to me in order to get ahead. Raisa took a quick breath, meaning to disagree, then released it without speaking. He was right, of course. Han smiled like he knew he'd scored a point. I can take care of myself. I have some allies, and I'll find some more, you'll see. He paused, searching her face, his gaze traveling from her eyes to her lips. I'm really very personable when you get to know me, he whispered. Releasing his hold on one arm, he tucked a stray lock of hair behind her ear. Raisa was acutely conscious of how close he was, the pale stubble on his cheeks, the memory of past kisses. Coming up onto her toes, she reached up with her free hand and pulled his face down toward her. She kissed him with a kind of desperation, winding her fingers into his hair to prevent escape. He put his hands on her shoulders as if he meant to push her away, but then slid them down onto her shoulder blades and lifted her up and into him. His lips seemed to sizzle against hers, sending a current all the way to her toes. Once he got started, he couldn't seem to stop. He kissed her lips, the corner of her mouth, the space beneath her chin and behind her ear, leaving heat behind wherever his lips touched her skin. 
He was breathing hard, and she could feel his heart hammering under the silk. Sweet Analia, she murmured, gripping his lapels, her own heart thudding painfully. I've missed you so much. Look, he growled, swallowing hard. This is not a good idea. I just... I'd better go before we... Don't go. Desire sluiced through her, washing away all good intentions. She slid her hands to the back of his neck, drawing his head down again, stoppering his mouth with hers and crushing her body against his. He scooped her up, carried her to the couch, and deposited her on it. Squeezing in next to her, he pulled her close. Rasa pulled his linen shirt free of his breeches, sliding her hands underneath. They lay together in a muddle of velvet and silk. Rasa's fingers brushed Han's muscled shoulders and back, down to the curve at the base of his spine, mapping the evidence of old hurts. Han's lips grazed her skin, giving her the flaming shivers, his caresses wilting what remained of her resistance. I'm sorry, he breathed, kissing a sensitive place behind her ear. I didn't mean to do this. It's just really hard to resist when you... A knock came at the door, and they jerked apart. It was the door to the corridor this time. Han rolled to his feet in a heartbeat, straightening his clothes and combing his fingers through his tousled hair. Rasa sat up reluctantly. She couldn't help thinking Han was used to quick getaways from interrupted trysts. The tapping was repeated. Your Highness, a woman called. May I bring a supper in? It took Rasa a moment to get her voice going. Just leave it outside, she said, her speech thick and strange. After a moment's hesitation, the woman said, I can't leave your supper in the corridor, your highness. You know it isn't safe. I'm not hungry, Rasa murmured to Han, raising both hands to stay him when he turned toward the door to his quarters. Han shook his head. I'll go, he whispered, leaning so close that his warm breath tickled her skin. I was right to start with. This isn't a good idea, and it won't happen again. He moved silently to the connecting door. Good night, your highness, he mouthed. He stepped through and closed it behind him with a soft click. Bones, Rasa thought, frustration like a stone in her middle. Nobody was acting like they were supposed to. She stood, rearranged her gown, and waited for the blood to stop lurching through her veins. Outside the glow of the firelight, shadows shifted in the gloom, light reflecting off golden eyes and white teeth. Of course, she said to herself miserably, a danger to the line. Everything I do or want is a danger to the line. She stepped to the door, unlatched it, and took several paces back. All right, she called to the servants outside, her voice nearly normal. You can bring it in. The door swung open, revealing a tall, broad woman in an ill-fitting blue uniform, carrying a tray covered in a napkin. Someone she didn't know, Rasa realized. The soldier's eyes swept the room quickly, then she stepped forward and to the side, revealing two men behind her, armed with swords. They rushed toward Rasa as the woman dropped the tray onto the table with a clatter. She turned and bolted the door behind her, then scooped a brace of knives from under the napkin, one in each hand. It all seemed to happen in slow motion, like a dream in which Race's feet were fastened to the floor, her cries stuck in her throat. The two swordsmen came at her from either side, smiling because they knew that with the door bolted, they'd have time to finish their work even if she called for help. They would be on her before she could wrench open the door to Han's suite, assuming it wasn't locked. Rasa fled, screaming into her bedroom and slammed the door behind her. She struggled to slide the bolt across, leaping back as blades splintered the wood of the door. Dimitri's staff stood propped in the corner of her room, and Rasa snatched it up, holding it horizontally across her body as the latch gave. She smashed the end of her staff into the face of the first man through the door. It hit with a satisfying wet crunch, and he dropped his sword and went down like a rock, clutching at his face with both hands. Before Rasa could bring her staff back into position, the other two were inside. The woman with the blades dropped her knives and picked up her fallen comrade's sword. Again, they came at Rasa from two sides. 
Even given the length of the staff and her hard-earned skill with it, she couldn't defend against both at once. Raisa continued to shout for help, thrusting at first one assassin and then the other in order to stay out of the reach of their blades. Where was her guard? Talia and Trey should be right outside. Why weren't they responding? Then, beyond the assassins, Han materialized in the doorway, rimmed with light, one hand on his amulet, the other extended, looking like the demon king himself. He spoke a charm in a cold, deadly voice. The sound startled her attackers, and they started to turn. Flame boiled through the doorway, engulfing the soldier in the lead. The man screamed and jittered in a macabre dance, batting at his burning skin. The remaining assassin half-turned, distracted by what had happened to her comrade, and Raisa took this opportunity to smash her staff into her throat, a killing blow Eamon had taught her. The assassin crumpled in place, her head at an odd angle. The terrible stench of burning flesh stung Raisa's throat, penetrated her nose, and brought tears to her eyes. She shrank back against the wall, coughing violently. Her stomach threatened to evict its contents. The flaming assassin lurched across her room to the window. Raisa didn't know if he was thinking of escape or only hoping to quench the flames in the river below. Han charged across the room after him. The traitorous guardsman crouched on the broad stone sill for a long moment, then launched himself through the open window and fell like a flaming star from her sight. Raisa flattened herself against the wall, the tip of her staff drooping to the floor and banging against it as she shook uncontrollably. Han crossed the room to her, taking hold of her arms to keep her from toppling over. Are you all right? he asked, looking fiercely into her eyes. Did they stick you? Even a minor scratch? She knew he was thinking of poison, and she shook her head mutely. Han released her and stalked across the room. He bent over the two assassins on the floor of her bedchamber, pressing his fingers against their necks, looking for a pulse. He looked up, shaking his head. Next time, try and leave somebody alive to question, all right? He said. You should talk, she retorted, a bit of her usual starch returning. Setting people on fire like that, you... She stopped abruptly, thinking of his mother and sister. Thank you, she whispered. Thank you for saving my life yet again. No, he said suddenly, unfolding to his full height. It was you. It was all you, understand? I was never here. Raisa stared at him, momentarily forgetting about throwing up. What are you talking about? It won't help our plan if your enemies think I saved your life again, Han said. Stands to reason you'd be grateful, right? Our plan? Raisa stammered, unclear that they had one. Han chewed his lower lip, thinking, the fingers of his right hand beating an uneven rhythm on his thigh. Then he picked up a lamp from the table, blew out the flame, and smashed it on the floor. Oil splattered everywhere. What are you doing? Raisa cried, leaping back to avoid being cut by flying glass. She heard shouts outside in the corridor, followed by bodies slamming against the locked door. Your Highness! Someone shouted outside the door, his voice ragged with fear and desperation. Bam! He hit the door again. Raisa! It was Eamon. Han rested his hands on her shoulders again, looking down into her eyes. Here's what happened. You set one man aflame with the lamp and he leaped from the window. You clubbed the other two to death with your staff. Raisa planted her feet stubbornly, shaking her head. No, absolutely not. I'm not going to... Please, he said. Please, please do this. It's almost the truth, and believe me, it's safer this way. It's almost the truth? The door into the hallway splintered, making them both jump. Better let Captain Burn in before he injures himself, Han said. He gazed at her a moment longer. You're a rum smasher with a staff, he said. Good thing, but I'm not going to let this happen again. He ghosted through the doorway to his rooms, closing and locking the door behind him. Raisa ran into the outer chamber as the door gave way, and four guards shouldered into the room, swords drawn. One of them was Eamon. They immediately surrounded Raisa, 
putting her to the inside of a circle bristling with steel. Other blue-jacketed guards poured in behind him, fanning out through her suite of rooms. It's over, Rasa said wearily, swiping a splatter of blood from her face with the back of her hand. There were three of them. One went through the window, the other two are in the bedroom. Dead. Blood of the demon! Amon swore, looking around the room, not relaxing his ready stance until he'd verified that there was no one available to kill. Mick Bricker emerged from Race's bedroom, an awestruck look on his face. There's two in there, just like Rebecca, like her highness says, both dead. Amon cocked his head, looking at Rasa. You killed three assassins all by yourself? Rasa shrugged, avoiding the question. Do you recognize them? Mick shook his head. Never saw them before, but I don't know everyone that's in the guard. There's too many that are new. Rasa slumped quite suddenly into a chair. She couldn't seem to stop shivering, and Eamon took off his jacket and draped it over her shoulders. It smelled like him, which soothed her. What happened to Talia and Trey? she asked. They were just outside as I came in. They weren't there, Eamon said. I was going to ask if you knew what they... His eyes widened, and he swung around and began barking orders, sending Mick out to look for the missing guards, two others to the guardhouse for reinforcements. Then he sat down in a chair opposite Rasa. Leaning forward, he began, gently but relentlessly, to question her. How did they get in? he asked. Tell me everything. I had ordered supper in my room. Someone knocked on the door and said she'd brought it up. When I opened the door, three of them rushed me. Who did you talk to about supper? Who knew you were expecting someone? I told Trey, Rasa said. I don't know who he might have told. Obviously the kitchen staff. One of them would have gone down and watched Mistress Barclay put the tray together. They could have waylaid him on the way back. His duty assignment's no secret. It wouldn't have been hard to figure out who the tray was for. Eamon's eyes strayed to the tray next to the door. There was no food, Rasa said, only knives. Mick burst through the door, only to find himself faced with a prickling hedge of blades. When the gray wolves saw it was Mick, they dropped the tips of their swords. Mick raised both hands to ward them off, his face haggard and grim. Sir, we found them stuffed into a linen closet off one of the side corridors. Trey is dead, and Talia, she's bad hurt, he said. Their throats were cut. Jarrett went after the healers, and Margaret, the maiden grey, she's looking after Talia. Rasa pushed to her feet, numb with dread. Where is Talia? she demanded, taking a step toward the door. I want to see her. Your Highness, you'll do more harm than good out there while the healers are seeing to her, Eamon said, and I can't allow you to go anywhere until we're sure the corridor is clear. Gently, he pushed her back down into her chair. Tears scalded Race's eyes. Trey Archer was new to the Grey Wolves and supporting a family of five. And Talia, was it only a half hour ago Rasa had been bantering with her in the corridor? Send someone after Pearlie, Rasa said woodenly. It's already done, Mick said. Rasa sat forward, gripping the arms of the chair, seized by a mixture of grief and smoldering anger. I'm going to find out who's responsible for this, and that person will pay, she swore. This will not go unrevenged. People need to know that an attack on my god is an attack on me. When she looked up, her entire blue-jacketed guard was kneeling in a circle around her, tears streaking down some faces. This day and every day, your highness, Mick said, very formally. I think I speak for everyone here when I say that it is an honor to fight shoulder to shoulder with our warrior queen. Chapter 30 Allies Han had been away from Rag Market for less than a year, but it looked different to his eyes, smaller somehow, the streets narrower, meaner, and more crooked, the houses shabbier. It was likely the same as before, he was the one who had changed. People in Rag Market lived vagabond lives, so it wasn't surprising that some of the vendors at the market were different. The tenants along Cobble Street had turned over during his absence, 
There was a vacant lot where the stable had stood, though the blacksmith forge where he'd buried the Waterloo amulet still crouched in the yard, painted over with street lord symbols. It was easier to move about than before. He kept a glamour wrapped around him so people naturally stayed out of his way without really noticing him. There was less jostling from slide-handers and canting crews, fewer come-ons from the fancies and second-story antes. He was just one more shadow in a shadowy part of the city. Evidence of the Briar Rose Ministry was everywhere, in the banners proclaiming free meals and temple criers promising free books and healers for the sick. The speakers drew them in with food and medicine and safe shelter. They kept them there with classes for litlings and grown-ups in trades and the arts, in religion and reading and mathematics. Despite the warming weather, the river seemed to stink less than before. During one of those interminable palace meetings, Raysa had launched a project to move the flatland refugees away from the river's edge into tent camps to the east of the city. Under the direction of the army, adults had been put to work digging pit toilets and building permanent houses in exchange for medical care and a reliable food supply. Some put their backs into it, tired of idleness and starvation and recognizing the benefit of what they were doing, Others elected to return home, to take their chances in the flatlands, where the work was easier and food more plentiful, even in wartime. Either way, they weren't dumping their scummer into the river anymore. Han threaded his way confidently through the tangled streets, heading for his old crib. Along the way, he detoured up over roofs and through taverns crowded with evening trade. He slid into doorways, waiting and watching to see if he'd shaken the tails that had followed him from the palace. Next time he'd have a chat with them, but now he had other priorities. By the time he reached Pilfer Alley, he was clear of them. The entry was marked with his flash and staff gang sign, a warning to stay away. Han went in through the warehouse, dropping through a trap door in the roof onto a catwalk. Using his first month's stipend from the Queen, Han had quietly bought title to the building under an assumed name. Property in Ragmarket was cheap, and he didn't need a landlord snooping into his business. Looking three stories down, he saw Dancer, his head bent over his long work table, wearing the peaked pallor he took on whenever he was in the city. He'd set up a metalworking furnace on the first floor, built of clay tiles, and vented all the way to the roof. Three other people waited for Han on the ground level of the warehouse, Cat, whom he expected, and Sari and Flynn, whom he'd never expected to see again. Han froze momentarily, torn between relief, delight, and alarm that Cat had brought them here without his approval. When she heard him overhead, Cat came to her feet, a knife in each hand. Seeing it was Han, she returned her blades to their hiding places and stood waiting, hands on hips, chin up like she was ready to do battle with him. Han embraced the two former raggers, tears unexpectedly stinging his eyes. You're supposed to be dead, he said, clearing his throat. Cat said the demons killed you. They should be dead, Cat said, but they got away and decided it was best to disappear for a while. They took ship with a pirate and crossed the Indio and back. Those pirates cut your tongues out, Han said, raising an eyebrow. Good you got Cat to speak for you. Pirating didn't agree with me, Flynn said, shifting from one foot to the other. Money was good, and I got to see Carthus, but turns out I get seasick something awful. He looked good. Though still small, he was taller than before, bronzed from the sun, and muscular from hauling sails around. So much better than dead. Sari Dobbs had acquired an impressive tattoo of a dragon during her overseas adventure. It stretched from her wrist to her shoulder, curling around her arm. I wanted to bring a real dragon back, but my captain wouldn't go for it, she explained, extending her arm. She was afraid it'd set the ship on fire. Han had heard there were dragons in Carthus, but he wasn't sure if Sari was joking or not. Though they shouldn't have been there, he was just so glad to see them it was hard to speak his mind. A weight of guilt slid off his shoulders. 
a small piece of the load that he'd been carrying around. Cat says you're a jinxflinger, Sari said, appraising him with narrowed eyes. I always knew there was something flash about you in those cuffs. She touched her wrists. Are you back in the game, then? Han asked Sari and Flynn. You two going to form your own crew, or go with somebody else? Sari and Flynn both looked at Cat, then back at Han, shifting uncomfortably. I told them they could join with us, Cat said. Han scowled at Cat. That wasn't your call to make, he said. Cat's face clouded up, promising the storm to follow. You were the one who said I should recruit some help. Not Sari and Flynn. I don't want them put at risk again on my account. Plus, you shouldn't have brought them here. Nobody can know where I'm staying. It's not safe. He turned to Sari and Flynn. I have a crew, but they keep their distance and work through Cat. Cat and Dancer are already in it. You're not. Now Sari scowled back. You think we're not after they done Sweets and Jonas and Jed? Sweets was just a litling. I know you lost your family, but we got scores to settle, too. It's not just scores for me, Han said. I'm in this for other reasons, reasons that got nothing to do with you. Sari and Flynn looked at each other, then back at Han. You always had plans, Sari said. Bigger than Rag Market, bigger than Southbridge, bigger than any other street lord. We want shares. We want to help. You don't want shares in this. It's a lack-witted, hair-brained scheme, a fool's quest, a lost cause before I even start. It never ceased to amaze Han how people were so keen to throw away their lives by joining up with him. Though maybe if he told them he meant to marry a queen, they'd realize how lack-witted he really was and stay away. Then why are you doing it, then? Sari asked, all suspicious. It's just something I gotta do. I don't have a choice, Han said. You do. Sari's eyes narrowed, her face pinking up the way it did when she got angry. She doesn't believe me, Han thought. She thinks I want to keep her out of my crew. Look, Flynn said, hear me out. We was all in Cat's crib the day the demons come. Me and Sari and Flynn and Sweets, Jonas and Jed. Sari and I was in the back room, and when we heard them smash their way in, we slid into the stash space under the floor. Flynn looked up at Han, his eyes dark and haunted. The demons tortured them. They kept asking where you was. We lay under there and heard the others screaming and screaming until they died, but they never give us up. We never even tried to help them. We ran instead. Now, every time I close my eyes, I see Sweets, and I hear him screaming. That's why we come back. We couldn't get away from it, no matter how far away we ran. It's not your fault, Han said. There's nothing you could have done against wizards. Maybe, Flynn said, but Blades is quicker than Jinx's. You would have tried. We could have tried. And you can fight wizards being one yourself. We want in. We can be the Blades and the Runners and the Pairs of Eyes. Han wavered. He did need allies. He could use the help. He had a job for Cat that would take her away from Dancer. He needed somebody to gather information and keep an eye on the doings in Rag Market. But once again he'd be putting his friends in danger in order to advance his own schemes. I hear you're working for the Princess Raisa, Sari said, changing strategies. Cat says the Rebecca that sprung us from Southbridge Guardhouse was the Princess Racer in disguise. I don't forget them that helped me. Anyway, me and Sari already decided, before we knew you was still alive, Flynn said. We plan to get a crew together and hush the High Wizard and as many others as we can manage. None is what you can manage, Han muttered. Don't you get it? You're outmatched. The only ones will be down on the bricks is you. Then give us a job we can manage, Sari said, leaning forward so her nose was inches from Han's. The thing was, Han understood. In Rag Market or Southbridge, you needed a crew and a gang lord with a plan and a reputation to survive. No matter what he or she asked of you, it was better than being on your own. After a brief, charged silence, 
Dancer spoke. This might help, he said. He held up a beaten copper pendant inscribed with Han's Demon King gang sign, a vertical line with a zigzag cross. It's a talisman similar to the ones the demon I wear. It'll make them less noticeable to charm casters and less vulnerable to charms. It should protect them from anything other than a direct hit. I can make one for each of you. All right, Han said, giving in. I'll tell you the same as I told Cat. You can't be having side jobs if you pledge to me. If you decide to leave, you tell me first and keep shut after. Until then, you do as I say. You can't be picking and choosing the jobs you do. My street name is the Demon King. You use that name even when you think you're free of snitches. You tell nobody where this place is. You don't come here without good reason. You'll meet up with the rest of the crew elsewhere. How will we get in touch with you? Sari asked. You go through Cat, or leave messages under the sign at the market. I'll do the same. You'll have a place to sleep and plenty to eat, and some jingle in your pockets, but nobody's getting rich on shares. If you can't live with that, walk away now. They didn't. Instead, they went down on their knees and spoke the oath, using blood and spit to finish it. What do you want us to do? Sari asked, as soon as she was on her feet again. You know Rag Market and everybody that lives here, Han said. Somebody's trying to murder the princess, the Briar Rose, and he's likely to be hiring again, since he just lost three assassins. Their eyes went big. Blood of the demon, Flynn said. Who'd want to kill her? Folk in Rag Market and Southbridge talk like the Briar Rose is a saint. Them that are hiring are unlikely to be from our neighborhood. Han said dryly, but they may hire here all the same. It'll help that people like her. Talk to them you know are in the business. See if you can find out who's looking for shoulder tappers and bravos. They'll be looking for quality and willing to pay a rum price. Flynn and Sari nodded. But be sharp on it and keep it on the hush. We're likely up against the same as did Velvet and the others. That's it? Sari looked disappointed. One thing more, Han said. See what folks are saying about some dead charm casters got their throats cut and been left in rag market. See if anybody's put the word out they're buying amulets. He nodded toward Dancer. And mind you, watch Dancer's back. He's gifted, and there's some that might have reason to hush him. I've got Dancer's back, Cat said, putting her hands on his shoulders. Sari and Flynn stared at the two of them, as if unwilling to accept the evidence of their eyes. "'You're walking out with a copperhead?' Sari said finally. "'You got a problem with that?' Cat said, eyes narrowed. They shook their heads. Dancer set his work aside and rubbed his eyes. "'The way I see it, the sooner we get this settled, the sooner I can leave the city.' Cat scowled. Just give it time. You'll like it once you get used to it. Cat and Dancer together is like a fish taking up with a bird, Han thought. Neither can live in the other's turf. I have a different job for you, Cat, Han said. And I don't know if you're going to like it. Chapter 31 Strange Bedfellows when Raysa entered the sick ward in Healer's Hall, her usual clutch of guards in tow, the apprentice on duty nearly passed out from fright. Then she dropped to her knees, her forehead nearly touching the floor. Raysa gestured for her to rise. "'Where can I find your patient Talia Abbott?' she said. "'She would have come in three days ago.' Trembling, the apprentice pointed to the other side of the hall. "'Last bed on the left!' she squeaked, by the window. She fled out the door. Leaving her guard at the door, Raysa walked the length of the ward between rows of narrow pallets as the stench of ripe slop jars smacked her in the face. Those patients that were able pushed up on their elbows, staring. A low mutter of voices washed to the other end of the room and back again. Some of the patients stretched their arms toward Raysa as she passed by, Queen Raysa, they cried. It's the lady herself, the Briar Rose. Touch us, heal us. 
I'm no healer, Raisa said, gripping hands on either side. But I wish all of you a swift recovery. She found Talia lying on a cot at the far end, propped against the wall, her neck swathed in snowy bandages. A chalk and tablet lay atop the covers at her side. Pearlie sat in a chair next to the bed, her head bent over a book she'd been reading aloud to Talia. She looked up when Raisa approached, then jackknifed to her feet, cheeks rosy with embarrassment. Your Highness! Cradling the book in one arm, she saluted, her fist against her chest. Sit, Raisa said. Please, continue reading. I just wanted to see for myself how Talia was doing. Oh no, Your Highness, please, you have a seat, Pearlie said, gesturing to the chair she'd just vacated. I'll get another. She sprinted away. Raisa sat down next to the bed. Touching her fingers to her own throat, she said, How's your voice? Any improvement? Talia shook her head and scribbled something on her tablet, holding it up so Raisa could see. Resting it. Hoping. Raisa was full of questions, but she hated to ask any because Talia would have to answer. I brought you a book, she said, extending it toward Talia. It's one of the spinner romances you like. I hope you've not read it. Talia scanned the cover, then shook her head again, smiling. Now Pearlie was back with a second chair that she placed on Talia's other side. Raisa took Talia's hand. Do you mind if I ask Pearlie a few questions so you don't have to write so much? Talia rested the tablet on the bed and nodded her head. What do the healers have to say about Talia's injuries? Raisa asked. The assassin crushed Talia's voice box and injured her voice cords, Pearlie said, speaking common with her musical Ardenine accent. Lord Vega's apprentice treated her the first day. The wound is closed, at least. The swelling's gone down, so she can breathe better, and it's less painful. She looked at Talia for corroboration, and Talia nodded. It's still hard for her to eat and drink. Sometimes it slides down the wrong way, and she coughs, and it hurts. Something Pearlie said caught Race's ear. His apprentice, Lord Vega, didn't treat her himself. Pearlie shook her head. No, ma'am. Lord Vega only sees to the nobility and those that come from Grey Lady. He has prentices from Odin's Ford over the summer, and they see to most everyone else. Turning her face away from Talia, she blotted at her eyes with her sleeve. Vega didn't examine her at all? Pearlie hesitated. No, ma'am. Lila Hammond was the one that saw Tatalia. She works hard, and she means well, but she's just a first year. She touched Talia's hand. You're never going to get better if you don't eat more. A flurry of footsteps in the hallway drew Race's attention. Harriman and Vega, the wizard in charge of the healing halls, swept in, trailing apprentices behind him like a ship with a white wake. Your Highness, I wish you would let me know you were coming, he said. I would have been happy to attend you in your rooms if you had... It was my intention that this visit be informal, Raisa said, thinking nothing's informal anymore. I don't need treatment, but there's someone here who does. She nodded toward Talia. Vega's disinterested gaze swept over Talia. I don't know what the girl has told you, but she has been treated, Your Highness, he said. She would have been evaluated when she arrived. He gestured toward the linen wrappings around Talia's neck. Her wound has been dressed, obviously. But there's more to be done, Raisa said. She has not recovered her voice, and she has difficulty swallowing. Wouldn't you follow up in such a situation? Vega waved his hand dismissively. If the matter were brought to my attention, perhaps, but we have hundreds of patients— we must accept that sometimes these injuries result in permanent disabilities. Raisa gripped the arms of her chair, biting back the first response that came to mind. Sometimes we must accept it, but only after every avenue has been explored. This soldier was injured when she stood between me and an assassin. She deserves better. She gestured, taking in the other residents of the ward. How many of these patients might recover with more intensive treatment? Lord Vega threw up his hands. I don't know, Your Highness, but we have limited resources, as you know, and... 
I understand that, Lord Vega, Raisa said, rising and putting a hand on his arm. But I mean to change that. I'm asking you to take personal responsibility for Private Abbott's treatment and recovery. Her health is a priority for me. More importantly, I'm asking that you establish a system of follow-up for those with more serious injuries. Seeing Vega's horrified expression, she added, I don't mean that you must heal them all personally. I realize the physical impossibility of that. But you must use your extensive knowledge and experience to direct their care. Lord Vega inclined his head. As you wish, Your Highness, he said, puffing up like a peacock. If our high magic resources are limited, then perhaps we should integrate some clan healers into the service in the healing halls, Raisa said, bracing herself for the reaction she anticipated. Copperheads! Lord Vega's eyes narrowed. I hardly think we are so desperate as to resort to backwoods sorcery, Your Highness. And I will tell you right now, there's not a wizard in the Vale would dare submit to a copperhead healer or take one of their potions for fear of being poisoned. That may be, at least at first, Raisa said, but there are many in the Vale who swear by clan remedies. I know some in the nobility who've also benefited from their herbals and poultices. I have personal experience with clan medicines, and I know they work. From Vega's expression, Raisa might have been suggesting that they use blood sacrifice in order to steal souls something the clans were often accused of. She sighed. One step at a time, she thought. We'll continue our discussions on that, she said. In the meantime, let's begin by reinforcing our current system. It's one thing to offer stellar care to the nobility, but imagine a healing service where every citizen receives premier treatment. Your reputation will spread throughout the Seven Realms, Students from the Academy will clamor to apprentice with you. Faculty will travel here to observe your methods. That's a possibility, I suppose, Vega said, straightening his wizard stoles and flicking imaginary dust from his robes. Although, in all honesty, we've had no difficulty securing... That additional support will make it easier for us to leverage your expertise, Raisa said, looking into the wizard's face. We will also recruit more fully trained healers to assist you. This healing service is critical for the well-being of everyone in the City of Light. It has been neglected for too long. Yes, Your Highness, Vega said, nodding, looking mollified. I couldn't agree more. Thank you, Lord Vega, Raisa said. I'm prepared to be dazzled. She smiled, and the healer preened under her approval. One more thing. Raisa said, as if she'd just thought of it. Sergeant Greenholt is to have unlimited visiting privileges with Private Abbott when she's off duty. I will arrange it, Vega said. He looked down at Talia as if seeing her for the first time. Hammond and I will be back to reevaluate you when she returns from supper. Talia and Pearlie stared at Raisa, wide-eyed, as the healer sailed away. I'll say one thing, Pearlie said. You sure know how to sugar up the poison. That's what this job is all about most of the time, Raisa said, making a face. She rose. Pearlie, you keep me apprised of how Talia is progressing. I'll be back to visit in a few days. Is there anything in this queendom that is working well? Raisa thought as she left the healing halls. Is there anything that doesn't need attention? There aren't enough hours in the day. Raisa was walking back to the palace through the gardens, trailing her usual wake of guards, when someone stepped out of the shadows next to the path. Raisa took a step back, hearing swords whispering free all around her. It was Micah Bayar. Micah! It's not a good idea to surprise me like that, Raisa said. She fingered her dagger, reflexively glancing down to make sure the Grey Wolf ring was in place on her finger. What do you want? I would like to speak with you, Raisa, that's all, Micah said, holding his hands out at his sides to show they were empty. He ran his eyes over her escorts, who were bristling with weapons. In private. That's not going to be possible, Raisa said. I'm sure you understand. Please, hear me out, he said, 
and consider what I say carefully. In a louder voice, he said, I'm going to remove my amulet now, so please don't run me through. Slowly, his eyes on the gray wolves, he lifted his amulet over his head and set it down on a stone bench in the garden. Then he sat at the other end of the bench and placed his hand on the stone next to him. Sit with me, please. Your guard can remain in sight, but far enough away that we won't be overheard. If I try anything, they can lope over and lop off my head. Rasa hesitated, biting her lip. How do I know you don't have another amulet hidden on your person? she said. Micah smiled faintly. Have mercy, your highness, he said. I could strip, but it's a chilly evening. Besides, you seem to have an immunity to any magic I can conjure. He raised an eyebrow. Rasa debated telling him that her guard could hear whatever he wanted to tell her, and yet she found she wanted to hear what Micah had to say, something he wouldn't say in front of her guard. She had the feeling she would learn something useful. Rasa wondered what Eamon and Han would think of this idea, then decided she didn't want to follow that thought any further. All right, she said. Turning to her guard, she said, Stay here and stay alert. Rasa walked over and sat down on the bench next to Micah, leaving a little distance between them. What is it? Micah studied her for a long moment. I'm disarmed, your highness. I'm totally without my usual weapons. You are never without weapons, Rasa said. He tilted his head toward the guards. What I mean is, I'm not used to meeting beautiful girls under so many pairs of eyes. Rasa half rose. Is that what you think this is? If so, then please, sit. Micah waved her back down. I apologize. I never seem to know what to say to you anymore. You could start by telling me the truth. Rasa drew her jacket more closely about her shoulders. I've grown up. I no longer respond to flattery. I spoke the truth, he said, but I suspect you're looking for a different kind. He looked down at his hands. I want to start over, he said. I want to ask permission to court you. Rasa just stared at him wordlessly. That was the last thing she'd expected him to say. After everything that's happened between us, now you expect me to accept you as a suitor? she said finally. I'm tired of pushing myself on you, he went on. I'm not used to it, and it's humiliating. There are lots of girls at court. Why do you feel the need to push yourself on me? Rasa asked. Are you under pressure from your father? Micah gazed at her for a long moment, then shrugged. Yes, he said, if you want the truth. But that's not why I'm here. I'm here for myself. There was a smudge of dirt on Race's breeches on the inside of her thigh. She licked her thumb and rubbed at it, then looked up to find Micah's eyes on her. She brought her knees together and dropped her hands in her lap. What is it you hope to gain by courting me? Rasa asked. Micah raised his dark brows. What's the usual objective of courtship, Rasa? There are any number of possibilities, as you well know, Rasa said irritably. In our case, we can't marry, and so I would beg you to keep an open mind on that, Micah said. You are the queen now, or soon will be. For a thousand years we've been imprisoned by the past. You have the power to make changes. The future is in your hands, if you'll only seize it. Rasa tilted her head. So, having failed at forcing me into a marriage, you hope to take me by persuasion this time? I like to think, he said, that had I tried that first, I might have succeeded. I'm not the only person you have to persuade, Rasa said. Do you think you could win over my father or Elena Demoni? She rolled her eyes, picturing that interview. You're the first person I need to win, Micah said. I'll worry about them when you say yes. Well, I have to worry about them now, Rasa snapped. They're not the only people you need to worry about. Micah closed his eyes, took a deep breath. Don't you realize the danger you're in, he said, eyes still closed. Maybe not. Is there something you want to tell me? Rasa said, putting her hand on his arm. 
Who killed my mother, Micah? Who's trying to kill me? Micah leaned in close, speaking into her ear so his breath stirred her hair and warmed her cheek. I don't know who killed the queen, he said. And if I knew for sure who was trying to kill you, I would handle it myself. Against all reason, Rasa believed him. Well, then, Rasa shifted away from him. Come back when you have those answers. Micah hissed out an irritated breath. I can't protect you if you won't let me near you. Based on your history, why should I feel safer with you? Rasa muttered. I'm just saying it would be safer if you were a little less outspoken, if you seemed to go along with things a little more, if it seemed like there was a chance that you might... accept me. If you threw the gifted a bone. Like what? Rasa demanded. Crowning you king? Micah raised his hands, palms out. Take this whole business of naming a street thief to the wizard council. The council is enraged. They take it as a lack of respect. They think you're tweaking them on purpose. Is that what this is all about? Rasa narrowed her eyes. You Bayars wanted me to appoint Fiona instead? Fiona has her faults, but she would be a far better choice than Alistair, Micah said. Trust me. You won't rest easy with him looking out for your interests. He's in this for his own gain. He paused. You must know that there are all kinds of sordid rumors flying around about you and that thief. The last thing I heard was that you'd named him to the peerage and handed him a holding on the Firehole River. Race's cheeks burned. What do you think, Micah? Are you listening to the rumors? Micah dismissed that possibility with a flick of his hand. I know better than that. I can't imagine you would have any interest in a street thug. But none of this helps. He's a wizard. If the Copperheads believe you're bedding Alistair, he'll end up in some ravine with a demon eye arrow through his eye. If you're going to be linked to a wizard, at least let it be someone who'd have the support of the Council. Alistair has no support from anyone. He paused, eyeing her as if debating asking the question. Why is he here, Racer? What do you see in him? Why does he have access to you and I don't? Micah reached for Racer's hand, then jerked his hand back as if recalling that his touch might not be welcome. He flexed his hand, rubbing his fingertips against his palm, releasing tension. You pardoned him for trying to kill my father, Micah went on. Have you asked yourself who's murdering wizards in the city now? Need I remind you that the killings commenced about the time he returned to the fells, and that the bodies have been left in his old neighborhood? Rasa's stomach flipped unpleasantly. It's easy to fling accusations, she said. That's all I've heard for weeks. I'll tell you what I told the demon eye when they accused your family of murdering my mother. Bring me some evidence, and I will act. We're watching him, Micah said. Sooner or later... He's going to make a mistake. They sat in stony silence for a long moment. Han was right, Rasa thought. If people come to believe that there's anything serious between us, it will be his death, and maybe mine. Make them think you hate me, he'd said. She wasn't sure she could pull that off, but maybe she could introduce some doubt. Look, she said. Alistair won't be a problem if you let me handle this my own way. I'm juggling a lot of competing interests right now. Putting him on the council was part of a larger bargain, the least of evils. It was the price I had to pay for a bit of peace. I knew it, Micah said, pounding his fist into his palm. Who's backing him? Who's he working for? Abelard? Rasa shook her head. I'm not going to discuss this any further. I've said too much already. Now, if there's nothing else? She made as if to rise. Micah held up his hand to stay her. I've already admitted that I wish you had named Fiona to the council instead, he said. But that is not what this is all about. That's not why we're holding this conversation. I'm just trying to give you some helpful advice. I don't want anything to happen to you. I don't want that on my conscience. His face was parchment pale, 
his black eyes bright and hard as obsidian. Raisa leaned forward. Micah, if you know of some threat to the Grey Wolf line, it's your duty to tell me, or prevent it, or bring it to the Queen's guard. Micah shook his head, released a sigh, and stood, lips tight, his face hard and bleak. You really don't understand, do you? he said in a low, bitter voice. That's exactly what I'm trying to do. Keep you alive. I've risked everything for you, my family and my future. All you need to do is show a bit of flexibility. But no, you'll get yourself killed and there's nothing I can do about it. Raisa shivered, her jacket no longer sufficient to keep her warm. There had been, what, four or five attempts on her life since Lord Bayar's assassins came to Odensford? How long before somebody succeeded? Beyond Micah, in the shadowy garden, gray shapes milled and circled, their eyes catching the torchlight, reflecting it back like temple candles. A turning point. A critical choice. But what is the right one? Micah might be here on his father's orders. He might have come to persuade her to reverse her decision and name Fiona to the council. He might be trying to frighten her into doing the bidding of the wizard council. He might hope to fool her into receiving him as a suitor. All of those things might be true, but Micah had saved her life more than once. For whatever reason, he seemed to have an interest in keeping her alive. She'd been impatient and lost her temper with the Queen's Council. It might feel good to antagonize Lord Bayar, but she could pay a high price. She needed to better cement her position before she made any more enemies. She considered the cost of playing the game. She wouldn't swap Fiona for Han Alistair on the Wizard Council. She didn't want three Bayars on the Council, and she'd given her word to Han. Thank you for your time, your highness, Micah said, interrupting her mental debate. Good evening. He turned to leave. Wait, Raisa said, pushing to her feet. He half turned and stood waiting. There was one thing she could do, a calculated decision in a situation that demanded a cold heart and a clear head, something that might stay any action against her long enough for her to build her own defenses. You've persuaded me, Micah, Raisa said, to this degree. If you're truly worried about my safety, you may tell your family that I've agreed to allow you to court me, with discretion, that I'm guardedly receptive to your overtures. I will do my best not to contradict that story in public, but I'm not making any promises beyond that. He inclined his head, his face expressionless. We can't wave it like a bloody flag in front of the spirit clans, and, given your history, I'm sure you understand why I can't risk being alone with you. I accept those terms, Micah said, but I'm giving you fair warning. I will do my best to change your mind. I'm giving you fair warning. Sooner or later, you're going to have to choose between me and your father. Whatever happens between us... You'll have to decide where your ultimate loyalty lies. I've already decided, Your Highness. Micah bowed, then turned and walked away, losing himself in the shadows. Raisa stood looking after him, wondering if she'd made the right move. Would she be able to convince Lord Bayar that she'd accepted Micah as a suitor, hide that from the clans, and still keep him at a distance? Would she be strong enough to keep him at a distance? Back in the palace, Raisa found Han Alistair waiting at the door to her room, chatting with the blue jackets stationed there. Cat Tyburn was with him, but Raisa wouldn't have recognized her if she hadn't thrown back her head and laughed her throaty laugh just as Raisa arrived. Cat was wearing a dress. Had Raisa ever seen her in a dress? Flouncy and in a deep apricot that set off her dark skin. Bangles graced both wrists, and her hair was raked back into a twist. Her lips were rouged dark as black raspberries. Raisa and her entourage skidded to a halt in front of the door. Han bowed, and Cat managed a curtsy. Your Highness, Han said, Lady Tyburn and I hope you can spare a few moments. He tilted his head toward the door. 
in private. L Lady Tyburn? Rasa squinted suspiciously at the two of them. Well, a few moments, I suppose, she said. I had some reading to do before supper. They followed her into her privy chamber and waited until Mick closed the door behind them. Magrid emerged from Rasa's bedchamber. Your Highness, I expected you back sooner. I wondered if you wanted to bathe before— Her voice trailed off as she set eyes on Han and Kat. Her lips tightened into a hard line. I'll bathe after dinner, thank you, Rasa said, poking through the envelopes on the tray inside the door. You can be at leisure until then. I don't mind staying, my lady, Magritte said, raising her eyebrows extravagantly. You might need something, or perhaps your guests might need some refreshment. They won't be staying that long, Rasa said. They won't need entertaining. Magritte folded her arms. Maybe it's not my place, but it just isn't safe to be in here alone with— You are dismissed, Magritte, Rasa said firmly. I will see you after my late meeting. Magritte stalked out, muttering something that sounded like jinxflingers and thieves, a queendom at her feet, and she consorts with jinxflingers and thieves. At least she was too well-bred to slam the door behind her. Well, Rasa thought, Micah Bayar was right about one thing. Han Alistair has no support from anyone. Ha! Kat said, looking after Magritte. Most people don't hate me until they get to know me. That's Velvet's aunt, Maiden Magret Grey, Han said. She blames me for what happened to him. That old Fustilugs is aunt to Velvet? Kat rolled her eyes. Rasa dropped into a chair, suddenly exhausted and feeling besieged. What is it you wanted to discuss? Kat wants to apply for a job, Han said, giving Kat a nudge forward. Don't you? A job? What kind of job? Rasa looked from Kat to Han. Kat curtsied again, her eyes downcast. If you please, ma'am, she said, I'd like to be taken on as your chambermaid. You? A chambermaid? Rasa said, astonished. Ah, uh, are you... are you qualified? Ma'am, I spent a year at the temple school at Odin's Ford, Kat said, and before that I was at Southbridge Temple School off and on. Speaker Jemson, he'll give a reference. He was the one wanted me to go to Odin's Ford so I could get on as a lady's maid. I can get references from the Ford, only that might take a while. Well, um, that's impressive, Rasa said, but I don't usually do the hiring for, if you like music, I'm a run player on the basilka, Cat rushed on. Also the harpsichord, mandolin, the lute, and recorder. And I can sing some, too. Cat, it certainly sounds like you're talented. Katarina, Cat said. That's my given name. It goes better with the job. But there's considerable competition for these kinds of positions, Rasa went on. My servants usually come to me with experience as a lady's maid. Why should I hire you instead? Well, I know I would need training in that part, Kat said. I know you likely don't hire maids from Rag Market, not directly, anyway. But Lady Tyburn has other talents, Han prompted, raising his eyebrows at Kat. You be quiet, Raisa said to Han. She looked at Kat. Whose idea was this? she demanded. Yours or his? Well, Cuff's... He asked me to apply, Kat said, and I thought, well, it makes sense. Even if it's a wizard comes after you, blades are quicker than jinxes. What? Race's head was beginning to ache. See, I'm the best knife fighter in the city, now Shiv Connor's dead, Kat said. Long, wicked blades materialized in each of her hands. You could ask anyone. We thought Katarina could be both chambermaid and bodyguard. Han said, two for the price of one. How many bodyguards does a body need? Rasa said, rubbing her temples. I've got bodyguards stumbling all over each other. We need somebody inside your room, Han said. After what happened to Talia and Trey, I'm thinking a guard outside your door isn't enough. I can't always be right next door. And so far, all of the attempts on your life have been with conventional means. 
knives and swords and strangle cords. I want to hear from Katerina, Raisa said, waving a hand to Hushhan. Why should I hire you? Well, Kat poked at the twist on the back of her head, tucking in a curl. You have the blue jackets as bodyguards, I know, and cuffs, but I think you need another blade up your sleeve. Someone who has connections all over the city. Somebody who has an ear to the ground and knows who's higher in bravos and who's to be hushed. Somebody that won't stick out in the streets. Cat cocked her head. But that person's got to be able to come and go inside the palace, too, and talk to all kinds of people and do things on the quiet that maybe you don't want folks to know about. Raisa frowned. Such as? Cat dug the toe of her fancy slipper into the carpet. Spying and filching where it does the most good, second-story work if need be, putting a bribe into the right pocket, or a word into the right ear at the right time. She looked into Race's eyes. You probably don't like the idea of doing things on the down-low, she said. But that's the turf you're walking right now. You got enemies that'll do whatever it takes to win. You got to have weapons of your own. Raisa ran her fingers through her hair. Unlike my enemies, I won't do whatever it takes to win. I'm not looking to hire an assassin or thug. I'm thinking more like spy master, Cat said. Cat was the one that roused all of Ragmarket and Southbridge to come to the Queen's funeral, Han said. She had two days to do it. How old are you, Katarina? Raisa asked. Cat shook her head. I don't know. I'm past my name day, though, she added, folding her arms and gripping her elbows to either side. I'm sure of that. She knows who you're up against, Han said, seeming to understand where Raisa was going with this. And she's older than her years. It would be a great favor to me if you'd take me on, Kat said, drawing her brows together as she concentrated on her speech. It would do me good to spend more time with quality, it would help me learn about manners, politics, and such. Signing on for this role is a good way to get yourself killed, Raisa said, the memory of Talia and Trey fresh in her mind. If you want to leave the streets, I can put in a word that will get you a position with almost any noble family in the Fells. You're smart. Given a little more polish, you'll move up quickly. That's not what I want, Kat said stubbornly. She has her own reasons for wanting to help, Han said. If you say no, I'll find other jobs for her to do, likely more dangerous than this. Raisa debated. Why was Han so keen on placing his former girlfriend in her rooms? There were so many possibilities. Was it really to prevent attacks by assassins, or would Kat serve as a barrier to keep the two of them, Han and Raisa, apart? Would it allow him to keep better track of Race's movements while permitting him more freedom to come and go as he pleased? She looked at Han, who stood, head cocked for her answer, absently rubbing his right wrist where the cuff used to be. His face gave her no clues. Did she really want Cat Tyburn looking over her shoulder during her rare moments of solitude? Maybe, if it helped her stay alive. All right, Raisa said. We'll give it a try. Chapter 32 For the Good of the Line After three weeks on the job as Race's chambermaid, Katerina Tyburn still rattled around Race's suite like a pair of chicken bone dice in a velvet bag. She was never still, always poking her head into the closet to make sure no one was creeping out of the tunnel staring out the windows to spot assassins hiding in the gardens, reconnoitering with the guards in the hallway to establish that they were still alive and on guard. Her constant motion set Race's teeth on edge, but she knew how hard Cat was trying and managed to restrain herself. The maidservant part of the job went mostly neglected unless Raisa asked her to do something specific. Cat simply had no clue what the job entailed. Margaret Gray caught things up when Cat was away, and she never missed an opportunity to point out the novice maid's shortcomings. For instance, one morning, Cat brought out the dress Raisa meant to wear to a reception for the guard and left it draped over a chair. When Margaret arrived, 
She arranged it on Race's dress form and circled around it, hands on hips, muttering to herself. Raisa tried to concentrate on her book, but Magritte's grumbling grew louder and louder as she took a brush to the skirt. I'll try the steamer, but I don't know if I can get these wrinkles out by tonight. It's a disgrace sending the Queen of the Realm out in something that looks like it was stuffed in a drawer or crumpled up on the floor. In my day, servants took pride in the appearance of their ladies. And so on. Raisa put a finger in her book to mark her place. Margaret, is there something you want to tell me? She said. No, ma'am. Margaret continued to brush at the velvet. Never you mind. I'll do my best to sort this out. Do you have concerns about my new chambermaid? Raisa persisted. Margaret swung around to face Raisa, her hands on her formidable hips. Your Highness, I'm wondering why she's here, and so is everybody else. Some of us come from Ragmarket Eye. But we take the long way here, working our way up with hopes of one day serving the Queen and her family. All the servants are buzzing about it, but they're afraid to say anything to her for fear she'll cut their throats. Really? Raisa said in a deceptively calm voice. Since when is it the role of my servants to dither and debate over my choice of employees? Margaret sniffed. It's our role to look after you, ma'am, as best we can. We want to see you well served, and it's more work for the rest of us when she doesn't do a job proper. She came recommended, Raisa said. Maybe she has some rough edges, but... Who recommended her? Margaret burst out. That blue-eyed devil lives next door? Oh, he's a handsome one, and he dresses up nice, but that doesn't change who he is. I've seen the way he looks at you, Your Highness, like he's hungry and you're dinner. Grace's cheeks heated as the blood rushed to her face. She came to her feet, fists clenched at her side. I have no idea what you're talking about, she said. I know all about Cuffs Alistair, Margaret went on. He used to take his pick of girlies in Ragmarket, breaking hearts all around. Ladies and laundresses, it didn't matter. Why, I've heard stories of how— Margaret! Han Alistair saved my life! Raisa said stiffly, resisting the temptation to put her hands over her ears. And nearly lost his own to do it. I owe him a debt of gratitude that I can never repay. Well, he'll make you pay, Margaret said. Mark my words, that one never does anything without weighing out the gold and figuring shares. All right, you've warned me, Raisa said. Now that subject is closed. Let's discuss Cat... Tarina. You are absolutely right. She does need training. She paused for a heartbeat. I want you to do it. Me? Margaret looked horrified. Oh, no, Your Highness, I couldn't. I'm promoting you. I'm naming you Mistress of the Queen's Bedchamber, Raisa said. You'll supervise my personal servants and be responsible for teaching them what they need to know to be the best they can be. Margaret pressed her lips together so whatever she was thinking wouldn't spill out. It wasn't hard to make a guess, though. Raisa touched Margaret's arm. I'm aware of Katerina's shortcomings as a chambermaid. She'll never be a stellar servant. That's not what I'm looking for. But she can be improved. I'm asking you to trust me on this and do the best you can. Will you do it? Margaret gazed at Raisa for a long moment, then nodded grudgingly. She opened her mouth to say something else when someone tapped at the door. Excuse me, ma'am, Margaret went to the door. It was Eamon. Raisa could see his tall frame in the doorway beyond Margaret's broad back. Eamon had asked for an audience with her, several times, and Raisa had put him off. Her instincts told her that any formal audience with Eamon wouldn't bring good news. She resisted the urge to flee into her inner chamber and claim a headache, but he'd already seen her. Margaret turned toward Raisa, a question on her face. Raisa nodded wearily. Come on in, Eamon, she said. He entered, and Raisa saw that he wore his dress blues, the lady sword at his side. She gestured to a chair by the windowed wall. Please, sit down, she said, and sat as well. Would you like anything? Some cider? Something to eat? No, thank you, Your Highness. Eamon shook his head, then eased himself down, 
perching on the edge of the chair, his hands on his knees. I won't stay long. I'm sorry I've put you off, Raisa said, fluttering her hand. It's been relentless, and I knew I would see you at the reception tonight. I understand, Your Highness, Eamon said, in his formal Eamon voice. I know we see each other almost every day, but I felt I should schedule an appointment for this. He glanced at Magret, then looked down at his hands, where the wolf ring gleamed on his right hand. A cold lump of dread formed in Raisa's middle. She knew what this would be about. Magret, she said, not taking her eyes off Eamon's face. Please leave us. She thought Magret might object, but she bowed her head and backed from the room. Magret made no secret of the fact that she thoroughly approved of and trusted Eamon Byrne. So, Raisa said, when the door had closed behind Magret, what is it you wanted to talk to me about? As you know, Anamaya Dubai has come home, Eamon said. She's staying in the dormitory at the cathedral school temporarily, since her father is stationed on the border of Arden. I know, Raisa said. I've seen her at court. How nice she came home for the summer. Though I would have thought she might stay on at school. She's hoping to find a position here at home, Eamon said. He cleared his throat. If she could earn a little money, it would help next year at school. Ah, Raisa said, nodding. When does she go back? Eamon's gray eyes locked on hers until Raisa looked away. She won't be going back. She's decided to transfer to the cathedral school, Eamon said. She has only one year left. Oh, I'm surprised she'd come back here, Raisa said. The cathedral school is good, but the temple school at Odin's Ford is the best in the Seven Realms. Eamon plowed on doggedly, as if telling a well-rehearsed story. I had to leave school suddenly, as you know, and with my... with my new responsibilities, I won't be going back. So Anamaya decided to come back home, to be closer to me. Well, she's sort of clingy, don't you think? Raisa wanted to say, but didn't. I hoped you might be able to give her reference for a position here at court, Eamon said. She's had three years at Odin's Ford. She has letters of reference from her masters at the Temple School, but your recommendation would mean a lot. Well, Raisa fluttered her hand again like it was some kind of captive bird. Of course. I mean, I haven't spent a lot of time with her, but from what I've seen, I... I would like you to get to know each other better, Eamon interrupted uncharacteristically. I think you would like her if you got to know her. How had Eamon gotten the impression Raisa didn't like Anamaya? I need to be a better person, Raisa told herself. I will be a better person, the maker willing, an unselfish person. I just don't know if I can do it right now, along with everything else. I'm sure we'll become great friends, she said, rattling on like an idiot, since she'll be here at court and here in the fells, permanently, it seems. Eamon gripped Race's hands, taking her by surprise. Ray, Anamaya and I would like to announce our betrothal at the reception tonight, he said. But betrothal Raisa stuttered. T tonight Eamon rushed on, now that he'd stumbled into it. Remember back at Odin's Ford I said we meant to announce our betrothal in the summer, after I returned home? So soon? I mean... You said you weren't planning to marry until after you finished at the academy, and... Right, but now that won't happen, since there's no reason to wait, Eamon said. His grip on her hands had tightened, and it cut off circulation to her fingers. She should have said, Oh, that's fabulous news. You'll make a perfect couple. But somehow her usual ability to dissemble deserted her when she was with Eamon. Instead, she managed... Well, what a... Happy and surprising surprise. Thank you for letting me in on your secret ahead of time. Eamon studied her face. Well, it hasn't been a secret, and I, as the captain of the Queen's Guard, I'm expected to let the Queen know about marriage plans. Really? Raisa said. Do I have to approve them, too? She tried to say it lightly, but the quaver in her voice gave her away. She'd lost Han, and she'd lost Eamon, 
and Micah was a snake, and Nightwalker was exhausting. She felt like the bell of the ball standing on the sidelines with an empty dance card. Eamon bit his lip, his face a mask of misery. I have to marry Ray, he whispered, looking down at their hands. And I'm eighteen now. I think it might be easier if I were married. He looked up rather hopefully. Don't you think? Raisa shook her head. Nothing will make this easy, she said. Marriage just seems so terribly, awfully final. Even though I know we can't be together, it's still hard to give you up for good. You're not giving me up, Eamon said. I will always be here. You know that. She nodded, gathered herself, and managed a wry smile. I do know that. I'm being unreasonable. Of course you of all people know that I'm not a reasonable person. Because you're my friend, I'm telling you how I feel, in my selfish heart. Raisa leaned forward, looking into his grey eyes. But know this, Eamon Byrne. I wish you every possible blessing in your marriage. No one deserves happiness more than you. I mean it. She released her grip on his hands and stood, clutching her skirts to either side. Thank you for the warning. It will help. Tonight. Eamon stood also. Goodbye, Your Highness, he said in a strangled voice. Thank you for meeting with me. I'll see you tonight. He saluted her, his fist pressed over his heart, then backed to the door and was gone. That night, Raisa Anna Mariana hosted a reception for officers of the army and the guard. She wore an unwrinkled dress of green satin that matched her eyes. She danced with all the officers, encouraging the Princess Melanie and her ladies of the court to join in. Midway through the evening, the captain of the guard, Eamon Byrne, asked her blessing on his marriage to Anamaya Dubai, a student at the temple school at Odin's Ford and the daughter of one of the officers in the army of the Fells. The couple knelt before Raisa, and she raised a glass to toast their marriage and their future happiness, noting that they were exceedingly well matched. Taking Anamaya's hands in hers, Raisa lifted her to her feet and stood on her tiptoes to kiss Captain Byrne's tall lady on the cheek. Thank you for sharing Captain Byrne with me, she said, smiling. I know we'll be great friends. There followed a series of toasts led by Raisa, who promised to dance at their wedding, which would likely be in the fall. All of those present agreed that the newly betrothed pair was a charming couple and congratulated Raisa on a successful party. That night, Raisa lay awake for a long time, staring up at the high ceiling, imagining that she heard Han Alistair breathing in the next room. Chapter 33 More Strange Bedfellows Having Cat next door as Race's chambermaid gave Han more freedom of movement, and less. He didn't feel like he had to stick to his room all the time, keeping his ear to the door, waiting for someone else to take a turn at trying to hush the queen-to-be. When Raisa was out and about, within the palace or outside, there were two of them now to split the responsibility of keeping her safe. Three, counting Captain Byrne. But he felt less able to come and go from Race's rooms at will, which was a good thing when it came to resisting temptation. The princess heir wasn't there much anyway. Raisa entered into an endless whirlwind of parties and receptions as the coronation loomed closer. Eamon, Han, Cat, and Dancer began meeting each morning to discuss security and strategies for protecting her during the festive turmoil, what with comings and goings and strangers in the palace. The Grey Wolves stood twelve-hour shifts, seven days a week, without complaint. They took a personal interest in keeping their friend safe. Magret Gray was the official gift wrangler, recording and storing the coronation gifts that poured in. Han inspected all of them for hidden hazards, such as magical snares, sorcery, poisons, or the like. It also gave him the chance to see who was cozying up to the queen. Lots of movables flooded in from the down realms, including a gaudy tiara from Gerard Montan. 
Han couldn't help wondering who was walking around bareheaded in Tamron now. Or maybe the previous owner had had her head chopped off and so had no need of tiaras anymore. The Bayars sent more lavish presents of jewelry and silver candlesticks. Han gave them an especially close going over, calling on dancers' expertise as well. They seemed to be unmagicked. It didn't matter much, because Magret Grey locked them away without even showing them to the queen-to-be. She wasn't taking any chances with wizards bearing gifts. The maiden still gave Han the evil eye, refusing to speak to him directly, even though he went out of his way to be polite to her. Han began thinking that he should give Raisa something for her coronation, too. He wanted it to be unique and yet meaningful, but it also needed to be something he could afford. He'd just bought a building, after all. Finally, inspiration struck. He talked his idea over with Dancer, who thought he could get the piece made in time for the coronation if he got to work right away. There was a silversmith at Demon Eye that would help him with it. Han and Eamon and Cat and Dancer attended all the parties and dances, too, working out a schedule of handoffs that kept the queen-to-be constantly under surveillance by at least two of them. Unfortunately, this meant that Han spent a lot of time watching Raisa circling the ballrooms and salons with Reed Nightwalker and Micah Bayar. To Han's dismay, Nightwalker seemed to have moved permanently into the city. Weren't the demon eyes supposed to be up in the spirits patrolling for jinxflingers? And Bayar, Han assumed those dances were driven by protocol, but still, how could she stand to have him touch her? There were other suitors, too, locals and foreigners, mostly minor blue bloods who hoped to make a marriage with a queen. Han made note of them, got to know their names, matched them up with the gifts flowing in. Cat assigned members of her crew to shadow races suitors in the city to find out where they went and whom they met with. The Klemath brothers were eager and persistent, like a pair of overgrown puppies, but Han wasn't too worried about them. Raisa seemed resigned to marrying for the good of the realm, but even duty had its limits. All of this surveillance left little time for dancing himself, which was all right. The only person Han really wanted to dance with was somebody he dared not show an interest in, publicly or privately. Private often became public in a castle with a thousand ears. He did get in a little practice, Han didn't have a dance card, an odd blue-blood scheme for lining up dance partners. But if he did, it could have been filled for every dance. There seemed to be no shortage of high-born women interested in getting to know him better. One of the most persistent was Melissa Hackham, Race's cousin and daughter of the head of the Council of Nobles. Han found it hard to believe that she and Raisa were related. Missy giggled constantly, like a dedicate deep in her cups. She hung on Han like a thorny vine, and, as usual, Han got the blame. Her father, Lord Hackham, glared daggers at him every time she twined her arms around his neck. It wasn't like he'd offered any encouragement. Most of his classmates from Mistwork were home for the summer, and the girlies he'd schooled with seemed to have forgotten what a pariah he was. Though likely some of them were crewing for the Bayars, trying to lure him someplace private for a shoulder tap. One night, he'd just handed off queen watching to Cat and was helping himself to some potent blue blood punch when some equally potent blue blood fingers wrapped themselves around his arm. He swung around, nearly flinging his punch into Fiona Bayar's face. She wore her glitter-pale hair loose around her shoulders and a black dress that was mostly bottom half. She'd filled in the plunging neckline with ropes of pricey baubles. Come dance with me, Alistair, she hissed. I want to talk to you. It was the first she'd spoken to him since Odin's Ford, the first he'd seen her since the old queen's funeral, the first he'd seen her since Raisa had assigned him to the wizard council instead of her. Han gulped down his punch and wiped his mouth on his sleeve on purpose. The punch glimmered his middle pleasantly. You sure you want to be seen with me? He said, making a show of looking around the room. 
Lord and Lady Bayar shared a large table with other blue blood wizards, including the Griffins. Han was surprised to see Adam Griffin, his former teacher, sitting with the rest of them in his wheeled chair. Han hadn't seen him at any of the other parties, and he didn't look happy to be at this one. Griffin was watching Han and Fiona, his brows drawn together in a puzzled frown. Fiona tugged at Han's arm, dragging his attention back to her. Never mind them. I'm spying on you, she said. I'm supposed to be winning your trust. Supposed to be? He raised an eyebrow, as if that would ever happen. Are you coming? Fiona jerked her head toward the dance floor. She was ordering him around again. It was a habit with her. Well, Han thought, I do want to know what she's up to. He took her elbow and walked her into the midst of the dancers. They circled the floor in silence for a few minutes. Well, Han said. Where did you learn to dance? Fiona asked. You're better than I expected. I'm always better than people expect, Han said, still keeping that little bit of distance between them. I understand that now, Fiona whispered. I'm beginning to realize that you have great potential. She paused. That was brilliant getting yourself appointed to the council, she went on, even though it was at my expense. However did you persuade the queen to do that? I can be very persuasive, Han said. You'd be surprised. On the sidelines, he saw Missy Hackham chatting with a crew of blue bloods, but keeping her eye on him. They swept past Rasa dancing with Nightwalker. He wasn't keeping any distance between the two of them. Rasa's eyes were closed, her head resting on Nightwalker's shoulder. Han couldn't help himself. He pulled Fiona closer against him, allowing a little heat to flow through his fingers. She smiled at him, slit-eyed, purring like a cat on a warm hearth. "'Have you thought any more about my proposal back at Odin's Ford?' she asked, sliding her hands up to his neck and resting her head on his shoulder. "'The one where I give you my amulet?' Han said, and you get to be queen of the fells. I notice you haven't been wearing it lately, Fiona said, looking down at his chest, where the lone hunter amulet was on display. I wear it, Han said, just not where you can see it. With all you bayars around, that'd be like waving a bag of gold in front of a slide hand's face. And in case anybody's thinking of tossing my room, I wouldn't chance it if I were you. She laughed. If I send anyone, I'll make sure they're expendable. She paused, the smile fading. I haven't forgotten that you saved my life in Edeon. I'm in debt to you. That and a copper will get me a pork bun, Han thought. Han scanned the Bayar table again as they swept by. Adam Griffin slouched back in his chair, head tilted back, his blue-green eyes fixed on Han and his dance partner. Oh, right. Han thought. Griffin is sweet on Fiona. Was that why he'd come home? To court her? Don't worry, Master Griffin, he thought. I'm not really getting into your game. I'm surprised to see that Adam Griffin is back from school, too, Han said. His parents brought him back here to assume the family seat on the council, Fiona said. He would have been better off staying where he was. The Griffins are fooling themselves if they think there's any chance he'll ever... She clamped her mouth shut, maybe thinking better of what she was about to say. Forget, Adam. Let's talk about us. What if I came to you with a different proposal? Would you be interested? She looked up at him, lips slightly parted. Different how, Han said. A better one, I hope. Of course, Fiona said. That was just the opening of negotiations. She pressed closer against him. They passed Rasa and Nightwalker again, tight as ticks in rag market. This time, Rasa was staring at Han and Fiona, a frown on her face. I don't think we should be talking about this here, Han said. Your family and friends aren't the only ones looking on. Fiona nodded. You're right. She drew back a little. But if you're willing to listen, we should talk soon. Her lips twisted in disgust. The princess heir has agreed to allow my brother Micah to court her, she said. In secret, of course. Han tried to prevent surprise from splashing over his face. 
She has? He blurted. He couldn't help looking around for Raisa on the dance floor again. Easy, Fiona snapped, jerking her arm away from his hand. You're leaking. Sorry, he said, getting his flash under control. I'm just surprised is all, after everything that's happened. Why would she do that? Fiona smiled grimly. Why do you think? Micah is handsome and charming and quite persuasive himself, and he works fast. So if we want to prevent a betrothal or elopement, we need to work fast. I'm willing to snarl up Micah's plans in my own interest, but it could get very complicated if my brother marries her. Complicated? You could say so, Han thought, his belly twisting into a knot. It could get complicated when I murder your brother. The song ended and they coasted to a stop, and there, so close he could have spit on them, Han saw Micah Bayar shooing off a glowering nightwalker. Micah gripped Race's elbows like they belonged to him, smiling down at her, ready to claim the next dance and more. And she was smiling back at him as they glided away. Micah works fast, Fiona had said. Han's temper flared. It was bad enough watching her with Nightwalker. How could she even stomach Micah after all he'd done? What was she thinking? Micah and Raisa swept past again. Micah's hand was at Raisa's waist, pressing her closer, his head bent down so he could whisper lies in her ear, his lips practically touching her skin. I should have killed him when I'd had the chance, Han thought, flexing the fingers on his blade hand. I need to put the Bayars out of the wizard business for good. Will you control yourself? Fiona snapped, jerking away and rubbing her arm. What's gotten into you? Nothing, Han said, refocusing on Fiona's face. It's nothing. Fiona eyed him as if she didn't quite believe him. We'll talk soon. I'll find a way. She took a step back from Han. In the meantime, think about what I said. Chapter 34 Second Thoughts Magret Gray was as good as her word. She did her best to smooth away Cat's ragged edges and teach her the basic duties of a chambermaid. With Magret's backing, Cat forged links with the upstairs staff and learned the names and ranks of nearly everyone who frequented the palace on a daily basis. Both Cat and Magret seemed to be determined to make a go of it. Still, it wasn't easy. Race's mistress of the Queen's bedchamber wasn't used to having her authority questioned when it came to protocol and manners. Though Kat's year at the temple school had shaped and rough-polished her, she didn't take criticism well. She always had to know the why and wherefore along with the who and the what. Sometimes Racer returned to her suite to find Magrid and Kat icily ignoring each other. Once, they were so caught up in a shouting match that they didn't even hear her come in. Magret? Shouting? Raisa didn't have time to referee. Her coronation was officially scheduled for her seventeenth birthday. Guests poured into Fellsmarch as the date drew closer. At first, it was mostly homegrown nobility and wizards from all parts of the Fells. Every scrap of guest space in the castle and all of the other buildings within the close were filled to capacity. Those of lower rank found themselves stranded outside the walls, pining to be inside. Some of the choicest apartments inside the close were still empty, reserved for royalty arriving from the down realms, including the King of Arden. Most would arrive immediately before the coronation and stay through the ball and the receptions that followed. Micah Bayar and Reed Nightwalker attended nearly every party, each dancing with Raisa as often as possible and keeping a weather eye on his competition. Han was always there also. She often spotted him standing against the wall, his eyes following Raisa and her suitors around the room. It couldn't have been easy to focus with all the distractions. Han received considerable attention from the ladies of the court as well as foreign visitors. A ruthless street lord, a thief, a gifted member of the Wizard Council, and heartbreakingly handsome. What more could a lady want? In a paramour, anyway. 
He danced constantly, with Missy Hackham, with his classmates from Mistwork, and with Pearly Greenholt, since Talia was still convalescing. He was always at the center of a fluffy crowd. Raisa couldn't help noticing whom he danced with, and how often, and how gracefully he circled the floor, his golden hair gleaming in the torchlight, especially since he never danced with her. Missy Hackham was a glittering planet in orbit around Han when she wasn't flirting with this or that minor prince from the Down Realms. Race's cousin seized every opportunity to touch Han, to hang on him, and she giggled furiously at everything he said. But that wasn't the worst thing. At a party two nights before the coronation, Raisa saw Han dancing with Fiona Bayar. As Raisa circled past with Nightwalker, Fiona had her arms wound around Han's neck, her head resting on his shoulder, pressed in so tight you couldn't get a hand between them. Find a back hallway somewhere, Raisa thought crossly. On second thought, no, don't, she amended. As Raisa watched, Fiona tilted her head up, smiling at something Han said. She didn't have to tilt far, she was so bloody tall. Don't you know how risky it is getting that close to Fiona, Raisa thought. She's just after your amulet, you know. Anyway, I thought you hated the Bayars. Don't you even know how to hold a proper grudge? Traditionally, the princess heir spent the night before her coronation ball sequestered, praying to the maker and her ancestors for guidance. Raisa dutifully dressed in temple trousers and a tunic, and instructed the guards outside the door to admit no one. After Magret left, Raisa knelt before the altar in her sitting room and tried to focus. It wasn't that she couldn't use a little divine intervention, given her present situation, but her mind kept straying to other things, bouncing from present to past. Raisa couldn't help thinking of her name day, almost exactly a year ago, waiting with Magret for her father to come, to escort her to the temple. Gavin Bayar had come instead, which had precipitated a whole chain of events that was still playing out. She would be seventeen tomorrow. She'd been just a year from name day to coronation. Raisa felt claustrophobic, much as she had a year ago. It was as if once again a trap was closing around her, doors closing on possibilities. She was suffocating. She needed fresh air. Pushing to her feet, Raisa hurried through her bedroom, past the elaborate temple robes laid out next to the bed, past the dress form in the corner draped in her ball gown. She plunged straight into her closet, raking aside dresses until she reached the back wall. Clawing open all of the latches and bolts Eamon had insisted on installing, she pressed her hands against the hidden door. It swung silently outward. Raisa flew down the dark tunnel, finding her way by touch, not bothering to light a torch. Finally, the corridor widened, and she knew she'd reached the bottom of the staircase to the garden. Groping blindly, she found the ladder and began to climb. When she reached the top, she pushed with both hands, wrestling aside the stone covering the entrance. When she emerged in the garden temple on the roof of the castle, it was full dark, though the moon was on the rise. Raisa walked out into the garden, under the glasshouse roof, breathing in the moist air of the conservatory, redolent with summer hyacinth and mountain jasmine. The great starry dome of the sky soared overhead, making Raisa feel very small, too small for the job she'd taken on. Moving to the edge of the terrace, she looked down on the city below. Wizard lights embroidered the streets, pooling in doorways. Carriages rattled along the way, no doubt bound for one party or another. A wisp of music floated up to her, a basilka, it sounded like, playing Hanalea's Lament. Raisa shivered and turned away. Returning to the small temple, she knelt again on the stone floor and began the meditation of the queens in a low, fierce voice. Hail Mariana, Honor Lissa, Honor Teresa, Honor Adra, Honor Doria, Honor Juliana, Honor Lara, Honor Lucinda, Honor Michaela, Honor Helena, Honor Rissa, Honor Rosa, Honor Althea, 
Anna Isabella. She continued through all thirty-two queens since the breaking, ending, as always, with Hanalia Anna Maria. Hear me, your daughter Raisa calls on you. As she continued with the words of the prayer, the temple around her shimmered and faded into mist. The familiar lupine forms of the Grey Wolf Queens came forward, sitting in a circle around her, curling their tails around their feet. Here was green-eyed Althea and grey-eyed Hanalia, and the blue-eyed wolf Raisa had seen at her mother's memorial, slender and graceful, with pale fur and small, delicate paws. Her form shimmered, pale and insubstantial. For a moment, Raisa thought she saw the image of a woman. Raisa came forward on her knees. Mother, she whispered, her voice trembling. The blue-eyed wolf ducked her head as if ashamed, then turned tail and disappeared into the mist, her tail pluming behind her. Yes, Althea said. That was Mariana. She's not yet accepted her wolf form, I'm afraid. But— Raisa extended her hands as if she could drag her mother back. I need to talk to her. I want to find out what happened. If— if it was an accident, or if— She won't be able to speak to you, Hanalea said, her grey eyes kind and sad. Not for months. What we do, communication across the veil, it's unnatural. It takes time to master. The implications of this penetrated slowly, like a chilly draft under the door. Well, I need to know. Did she kill herself? Was it an accident? And if not, who killed her? Raisa looked from Hanalia to Althea, hoping to read something in their wolf faces. The grey wolf queens looked at each other. Althea put her ears back and showed her teeth at Hanalia. Hanalia shrugged if wolves can be said to do such things. "'We've been given the privilege of remaining in the spirits,' Althea said. "'We watch over the City of Light instead of crossing to the Shadowlands. "'With privileges come restrictions. "'We can't change history by giving you information you wouldn't know otherwise.' "'That's not helpful,' Raisa snapped. "'I was promised the gift of prophecy.' I can't govern with a pocket full of platitudes and vague warnings and reassurances. You told me the Grey Wolf line is hanging by a thread. I want to know how to keep it from breaking. Hanalia and Althea looked at each other. All we can do is help you recognize what's in your own heart, Raisa, Hanalia said softly. You have access to all the knowledge and all the gifts you need to survive, if you will use them. You will have the chance to right a great wrong. What about my mother? Raisa asked. Did she have everything she needed, theoretically anyway? Once again they looked at each other, as if they were straying close to the boundary of what was permitted. You must use all the strengths of the Grey Wolf line in order to win, Althea said. The time will come when you will be forced to make a choice, Hanalia said. When that time comes... Choose love. The Grey Wolf Queens rose as one, turned, and trotted into the mist. Raisa slumped back on her heels, head bowed, seized by a fear of failure. What use was it to know that she could win if only she knew how to go about it? Losing would cut that much closer to the heart. Choose love, as if that were an option for the Grey Wolf Queens. Though she'd learned a tremendous amount in the past year, it was still too short a time. She'd thought she would have years to prepare, years to work with her mother as a queen in training. Tears burned in her eyes. There's likely never been such a weepy queen, she thought. A thought struck her. She could run away, like she had a year ago, when her mother had tried to marry her to Micah Bayar. She could be halfway to Delphi by morning and continue on to Odin's Ford. She could enter the temple school and become a dedicate. And the grey wolf line could unravel in her wake. It's just as well, she thought dispiritedly. What kind of dedicate would you be? You can't even manage to meditate for a night, let alone a lifetime. It's not fair, she thought. I should be going to parties. I should be kissing lots of boys. I'm too young to be queen. 
too young to be sparring with wizards. Relax, she told herself. There's not a wizard in sight. And then something made her look up to see Han Alistair standing in the doorway of the temple. She didn't know how long he'd been there staring at her, but it seemed to take him by surprise when she looked up and caught him. His usual street face was gone. In its place was a wistful vulnerability, a kind of feverish and hopeless desire. Magrid had said he had a hungry look about him. Was that what she'd meant? And what exactly was he hungry for? And then it was gone, replaced by what he called his street face, and Rasa thought maybe she'd imagined it. He walked toward her, tall and broad-shouldered, dressed in black, a frequent choice for him these days. But tonight his clothes were uncommonly elegant. Lace cuffs drooped over his hands, and his coat was finely tailored. Your Highness, he said, bowing stiffly. Almost, Your Majesty. Having second thoughts about climbing onto the Grey Wolf throne? Rasa rocked to her feet, swiping away her tears. How did you get up here? How did you find me? I'm supposed to be alone. I came up the side, Han said, nodding toward the edge of the roof as if she should have figured that out on her own. He made a show of looking around. I thought maybe I'd find Micah Bayar up here, he said. Why would Micah be here of all people? Rasa snapped. Last night at the dance, you two were snuggled in so close, I worried he might strum you on the fly. Han said. Just stop with the Thebes slang, all right? Rasa said furiously. I have no interest in taking up with Micah Bayar again. Again? Han raised an eyebrow. Rasa folded her arms, lifted her chin, and said nothing. Anyway, that's not what I hear, he said. He paused, and when she volunteered nothing, added, I can't believe that you would let him put a hand on you again. It's complicated she said, in no mood for confession. I'm putting on a show, and not for you. Anyway, what about you and Fiona? His eyes narrowed. Fiona? What about Fiona? At the dance. I never saw two people so wrapped around each other. Who were standing up, that is. I can handle Fiona, Han said. That's exactly what you were doing, Rasa said sweetly. Handling her. Why is it that I should be reassured that you can manage Fiona, but you have no confidence that I can manage Micah? That's condescending, Alistair. Han shook back the lace and counted off the reasons on his fingers. Because he has the morals of a flatland slave trader. Because he's a wizard and you're not. Because he's a Bayar. Because no girlie that catches his eye is safe from him. He paused. Because I think you still have feelings for him, and he'll use that against you. You're wrong, Rasa said flatly. They stood glaring at each other for a space of time, and then Rasa sighed. Let's not fight about the Bayars tonight, all right? Did you really come up here to talk about them? No, Han said. I wanted to see you one last time before the coronation. After a moment's hesitation, he took her arm and led her over to the bench by the fish pond, the same bench Rasa and Eamon had shared the night he'd returned to the fells from Odin's Ford more than a year ago. Rasa sat, drawing her knees up and wrapping her arms around them. Han sat next to her, staring out at the pond, seeming at a loss for something to say. At least the cold, distant Alistair was gone, temporarily at least. Tomorrow night there'll be fireworks, Rasa said, to fill the silence. At the end of the ball, this would be a good place to watch from. She chewed on a fingernail, then dropped her hands quickly. It wouldn't do to ruin her hands for tomorrow. Probably a lost cause anyway. Remember the night we met at Odin's Ford? Han said, still looking straight ahead. There were fireworks that night, too. I do remember. Rasa said. It seems like a long time ago. Not so long, Han said. A breeze swept down off Hanalea, rattling the glass, carrying the sting of high country snows. Rasa shivered, and Han slipped an arm around her shoulders, drawing her close. 
The heat of him soothed her, loosening the tight coil of worry wound up inside her. There's something about a roof, isn't there? Han said. It makes you feel like it doesn't matter what's going on below. All of those things that get in the way of your dreams, you're above them. Anything's possible. Anything's possible, Raisa repeated. Once again, her eyes welled with tears. What was the matter with her? She wanted to be queen. She'd fought for it, struggled to get back to the fells to protect her right to the throne. Was she just weepy over her mother's death? All those lost opportunities? Or was it something else? Was she closing a door that could never be reopened? Was she making a trade she would eventually regret? Choose love, Hanalia had said. Raisa was acutely aware of Han's presence next to her. Once she was queen, that door would be closed forever. You know, this is where Queen Hanalia used to meet with Alger Waterlow, Han said, shocking her out of her reverie. What? They used to come up here and make love in this rooftop garden, Han said, stretching out his long legs, before they ran off to Grey Lady. Now there was a queen who wasn't afraid to take a chance. Right, Raisa thought. Hanalia took a chance, and see where it got her. Who told you that? Raisa said. I never heard that story. She shivered again, as if ghosts were stroking her shoulders with their cold fingers. Some stories don't get told these days, Han said, allowing a subtle warmth to flow between them. He stroked her hair, brushing his fingers along the back of her neck, raising goose flesh. You're not making this any easier, she thought. After another long pause, he added, You don't have to do it, you know. What? Raisa turned her head to look at him. You don't have to go through with it. You don't have to be queen. You can be whoever you want. For once, his face was dead serious. What do you mean? Raisa said, swiping at her nose. I don't have a choice. You always have a choice, Han said. Take me, for instance. I can be anything I want if I want it badly enough. If I'm willing to do whatever it takes. Really? Raisa raised an eyebrow. He made it sound so simple. What happens to the fells if I bow out? Nobody is irreplaceable, Han said. How long do you think I would last if I relinquished the crown? Raisa said. I'd be a constant thorn in the side of whoever came to power, even if it were Melanie. I would be a rallying point for rebellion, more of a target than I am now. You don't have to stay here. That's why they call it the Seven Realms. He reached over, covered her hand with his free hand, as if to increase the points of connection between them. And there's always Carthus if you want to get even farther away. What in blazes would I do in Carthus? Raisa growled. And why would I want to go there? Han laughed softly. I'm convinced that you would land on your feet, Your Highness. You'd likely be running the place before long. I don't know anybody in Carthus, Raisa said. He took a breath, then forged ahead. I could come with you. I would help you, however you wanted. Raisa looked up, surprised. Han's blue eyes met hers, intense, focused, with no evidence of mockery. The offer sat awkwardly between them. What did he mean? What was he proposing? That she run off with him? He hadn't come out and said that, but... Did he feel as she did, that her coronation as queen would end any chance they could be together? If I have to be running things, I might as well do it here. Raisa massaged her forehead. How could she explain it to him, the ties she felt to these mountains, to this small, imperfect queendom with its constantly squabbling tribes? Raisa wanted to be here when the sun poured over the eastern escarpment in the morning and flooded the city of light. She wanted to be here in the spring when the dernwater escaped from its banks, fed by the melting snows high in the spirits. She wanted to see the aspens glittering on the slopes of Hanalea, to ride bareback in clan leggings and shirt through the slanting autumn sunlight. She wanted to eat high country blackberries in summer until the juice dribbled down her chin, 
and dance clan dances until her heart clamored and her feet stung. Being away from the Fells had only reinforced her love of home, as did the choice he was asking her to make. She looked up at Han, groping for something to say, but he shook his head. Never mind, Your Highness. I never thought you'd run away from... from all this. He waved his hand, taking in the palace, the city below. You're not the sort. I just thought it might help you figure out what you do want, what you're willing to fight for, what you'll give up and trade. You can't have everything, she said. I can, and I will. I'll find a way, Han said, almost as if he were trying to convince himself. His usual street lord confidence had drained away. She put her hand on his arm, looking into his eyes. I hope you will continue to be my friend, she said. I hope that you won't let rank and ceremony come between us. The expression on his face said, it already has. Race's heart seemed to seize in her chest. What if he went away? What if he turned against her? What if this was, what did he call it? A take-or-leave offer. How would she survive? I can be anything I want, he'd said. I have something for you, he said, breaking into her panicky thoughts. A present. That's actually why I came. A present? She blinked at him, taken by surprise. He thrust a small deerskin bag toward her, almost like he was embarrassed. Unlike Micah, Han wasn't the present-buying sort though he had bought her flowers once in Odin's Ford when he'd been late for a tutoring session and knew she'd be angry. Likely, growing up, he'd never had the money for presents. It's for your coronation, Han said. Dancer made it, so in a way it's from both of us. But he already made me that beautiful armor, Reysa objected. That was more than enough. Han cleared his throat. All right, it's just from me, then. She weighed the pouch on her palm. You didn't have to get me anything. Why not? Everyone else did. He looked down at his hands. The Bayars have sent you enough glitter bits to fill a stall at the market. Raisa tugged at the drawstring, forcing her finger into the opening. She dumped the contents of the pouch into her hand. It was a ring in white gold set with moonstones, pearls, and sapphires. Oh! she breathed. It's beautiful. Whatever made you think of it? It's modeled after a ring that belonged to Hannah Leah, Han said. It was... it was a favorite of hers, I guess. He hesitated, as if he would say more, but decided against it. Raisa tried it on. It seemed to fit her ring finger best, which was good because she wore the wolf ring on her forefinger. She turned her hand this way and that, so that the stones caught the moonlight. She knew she shouldn't accept it. It was too personal and costly a gift. And yet, the shadows under the trees shifted and swam with gray bodies, brilliant eyes, razor-sharp teeth. Raisa shuddered, as if someone had walked over her grave. I never knew Hanalea owned a ring like this, she said. How did you happen to hear about it? I, uh... I spoke to someone who was kind of an expert on Hanalea, and he described it to me, Han said. This is what Dancer came up with. He paused, and when Raisa said nothing, he added, If it doesn't fit, he says he can resize it. Fine. It seems to fit as it is, Raisa said. Thank you. Just don't tell anyone who gave it to you, Han said. If you, if you decide to wear it, I mean. I will wear it. She tilted her face up toward him. I will cherish it. I just wish... I just wish we... As if to stop her words, Han pulled her toward him, pressing his lips down on hers so hard it took her breath away. Power channeled through her, undirected but potent, making her head swim. The wolf ring on her finger grew hot as it drew the power in. Raisa wrapped her arms around his neck, molding her body to his, aware of the friction between them. Winding her fingers into his hair, she thought, I won't give him up. I won't. I will not. 
but then Han straightened his arms, breaking off the kiss and pulling away from her. He looked down into her face, his breath coming shallow and quick, his eyes a fierce reflection of some kind of struggle within. He threw his head back, the column of his throat jumping as he swallowed. Drawing a deep, shuddering breath, he looked down at her again. Nearly all my life I've taken what I wanted, when I wanted it, with no thought for the future, since I wasn't likely to have one, Han said. Do you know how hard this is for me? Do you? He gave her a little shake like it was her fault. Listen, she whispered, sliding her palm along his cheek, cupping it under his chin. It doesn't matter if we can't marry. We can still be together, when we can, even if I make a political marriage to someone else. I can't believe I'm saying this, Raisa thought. I truly am turning into my mother. But Han Alistair was shaking his head, his face a mask of regret. I want to be with you, Raisa's voice broke on the words she'd been unable to say back at Marisa Pines. I don't want to lose you. Why can't we have something even if we can't have it all? Because I won't share you with anyone else, Han said. I won't be your down-low lover. It's all or nothing, your highness. I won't settle for less. I have to settle, Raisa muttered. Why can't you? He kissed her again, this time long and slow, savoring it, then came gracefully to his feet. You'd better go to bed, he said, extending a hand to help her up. You have a big day tomorrow. He waited until she reached the top of the staircase, then turned and disappeared into the darkness. Giving up on meditation, Raisa went to bed, but it was a long time before she slept. Chapter 35 A Bad Bargain The coronation of a Grey Wolf Queen was a two-day affair. On the morning after Raisa met with Han in the glass garden, she endured an entire morning of highly ceremonial meetings with her subjects and allies called the Greeting of the Witnesses. Prior to the splintering of the Seven Realms, it had been customary for representatives from each of the realms to bring tribute to the capital of Felsmarch to honor the soon-to-be queen. These days it was just a tradition, though everyone in attendance still brought a small token gift for Raisa. All morning long she was acutely conscious of Han standing just behind and to one side of her throne, his face as unreadable as any ceremonial mask. The words that had passed between them the night before hung heavily in the air, distracting her. Truth be told, even after everything he'd said, she'd been relieved to see he hadn't departed during the night, seeking a less complicated, less dangerous future. Raisa wore the ring he'd given her as a coronation gift. She was sure he noticed it, though he said nothing about it. One foreign visitor Raisa was pleased to see was Dmitri Fenweeder. Lord of the Waterwalkers, whom Raisa had met in the Shivering Fens on her way to Odin's Ford. Then, Dimitri had been new to his position after his father was killed by soldiers from the Fells. Dimitri had grown taller and filled out in the years since she'd last seen him, and he had a new confidence about him. He'd brought her a linen marsh cloak, embroidered with leaves and ferns in subtle mist colors. To put a fine point on it, Raisa was still Dimitri's liege lady, as the Shivering Fens was still ruled by the Fells. "'I hope things are well along our border,' she said in common, smiling and stroking the fine linen. "'I would let you know if they weren't, Your Highness,' Dimitri said solemnly. "'The new commander at the West Wall is a woman, but she is surprisingly fair and easy to deal with.' He was teasing her. Perhaps she's fair and easy to deal with because she's a woman, Raisa replied. Dimitri laughed. You may be right, he said. Speaking of fair, I've not forgotten that you owe me Gildan, he said. You also promised to send me a clean river. I'm working on it, Raisa said with a sigh. Let's talk again after the coronation, before you go back home. When Raisa returned to her rooms, Magret helped her strip off her formal coronation clothing. 
She lay down on her bed in her cami and drawers, meaning to take a nap before dinner. She hadn't slept much the night before, thanks to Han Alistair, and she needed some rest if she hoped to keep her face out of her plate that evening. She was just drifting into sleep when a knock rattled the door. Cat came and stood guard at the foot of her bed while Magret rushed to answer, grumbling under her breath. After a few minutes of whispered conversation, she shut the door and returned to Raisa's bedside, her face a thundercloud of disapproval. Raisa propped up on her elbows. What is it, Magret? There's a messenger from Lord Hackham outside. He says the King of Arden has finally arrived. Magret sniffed to show what she thought of disrespectful, tardy kings. He and his party are at Regent House, and he'll be joining you for dinner. He's requesting a brief audience with you before dinner so he can offer his congratulations in person since he missed the ceremony this morning. There goes nap time, Raisa thought. I don't like King Jeff already. Reading Raisa's expression, Magret said, Your Highness, I'll say you're resting, and the Flatlander King will just have to wait until dinner. Raisa shook her head wearily. She sat up, swinging her legs over the side of the bed. Her feet didn't even touch the floor. No, I want to get the measure of the man, and that will be impossible to do at dinner, or at the ball after, and I don't want to be meeting with him at midnight. She yawned. Will the Queen of Arden be at dinner? Magret shrugged, frowning. I'll find out. There was no mention of her. Raisa sent word to the dining steward to rearrange the seating protocol. Magret helped her into the gown she'd chosen for dinner and the ball after. She brushed out Raisa's hair and kept Cat on the run, fetching and carrying jewelry and brushes and paint and powder. In a spare moment, Cat slid into the red satin dress she'd been saving for the dance. It was sliced high on both sides to afford freedom of movement. Raisa knew her maidservant slash bodyguard would have blades hidden beneath the satin, though Raisa couldn't fathom where. Raisa decided she'd like more eyes and ears when the king came to call. Fetch Lord Alistair from next door if he's there, she said to Cat. Lord Alistair? Cat grinned and curtsied. Yes, ma'am, she said and flounced out. Magret sniffed. Lord Alistair? You can dress him up in silks and satins, but you'll never— Hush, Magret, Raisa said. She poked her head out the door, bringing Pearly Greenhold to full attention. Can you send word to Captain Byrne that I'm receiving the King of Arden in my sitting room, and I would like him to be present? And then she thought, is it even proper to receive a king in your sitting room? Likely not, but state visits had been few and far between when Mariana was queen, so Raisa didn't have much to go by. Plus, it was his own fault for showing up unexpectedly. Cat returned in a few moments with Han in tow. Raisa suspected he'd been trying to catch some sleep also, since he was a bit rumple-haired and yawning and he'd missed fastening one of the buttons on his jacket. Eamon came soon after and stood against the wall, his uniform perfect as always. He'd been at attention all day, it seemed. Raisa settled herself into a chair, spreading her full skirts around her. The chair was on a small riser, which gave her a little height over the rest of the room. They waited. Finally, a commotion in the hallway said the King of Arden and his entourage had arrived. Race's uncle, Lord Hackham, entered, bowing and wringing his hands. He seemed unaccountably nervous. Your Highness, he said, his broad forehead gleaming with sweat, the King of Arden asks permission to bring his guard in with him. Tell the King of Arden no, he can't bring his guard in with him, Raisa said acidly. The Fells may seem an uncivilized and dangerous place, but surely no more dangerous than Arden has been. Yes, your high, your majesty, Hackham said. I just want you to know that I, I never realized that I was as surprised as you at, at what had happened. It was never my intention to keep anything from you. When he, when the king arrived, I sent a messenger to you immediately. 
I hope you realize that I only have your best interests and those of the Queendom at heart. Rasa stared at him. Is it because I'm still half asleep, or is this man not making sense at all? Or is guilt making him stumble-tongued? If she hadn't been half asleep, perhaps she would have asked more questions. Let's just get it over with, Rasa said, feeling the beginnings of a headache. Han murmured something to Cat, jerking his head toward the door. Cat followed Hackam into the hall. A moment later, Cat hurtled back into the room as if chased by demons. She stationed herself in front of Rasa, a knife in either hand, all of her genteel patina swept away. Cuffs! Look sharp! It's him! The way-faced, gutter-swiving, prig-napping bastard! He's here! Han looked as mystified as Rasa. Who's here? He too stepped in front of Rasa, taking hold of his amulet. He looked from Cat to the door, unsure whether to open fire. The door opened, and in walked her uncle, Lassiter Hackam. Followed by Prince Gerard Montan, youngest of the unhappy Montan brothers. Rasa stood frozen, staring at them. Montan was beautifully turned out in a deep green velvet coat, cream trousers, and tall boots, his cloak bearing the red hawk emblem, a circlet of gold on his head. Rasa glanced quickly at his scabbard. It was empty, so her guard must have taken his sword at the door. Good, she thought, remembering poor Will Mathis dead at Montan's hand. Rasa glanced at Cat, whose knives were again concealed, but she still stood between Rasa and Montan, balanced as if to spring if necessary. When and how would Cat and Han have met Montan? Whenever it was, they seemed to have formed a strongly negative opinion. The Prince of Arden stopped just inside the door, glancing quickly around the room. His eyes narrowed a bit when he saw Han and Cat. So he recognizes them too, Rasa thought. Montan's gaze shifted to Rasa. He inclined his head slightly, as appropriate from one monarch to another. Your Majesty, he said with a thin smile. Please accept my apologies for not arriving in time for your witness ceremony. I had expected your brother Jeff, who responded to my invitation, Rasa said, managing to maintain an even tone. I didn't realize that you were coming. I'm here in my brother's place, Gerard said. He can't be here, unfortunately. A loaded silence thickened the air. I see. Rasa folded her arms, her mouth going dry, and a leaden weight collecting in her stomach. There was no way Jeff would send Gerard as a representative. Do go on, she said. Out of the corner of her eye, she saw Lord Hackham shifting from foot to foot by the door, as if thinking he might need a quick escape. I bring bad news. My brother was attacked by brigands on his way here, and he and his entire family perished. Gerard said, making no attempt to look sorry. Brigands? Rasa cleared her throat. I'm most sorry to hear that, which was absolutely true. Gerard smiled. Given what happened, you can imagine why I'm wary of traveling anywhere without my guard. Still, I felt it was my duty to come, since I'm the last surviving Montan brother. And now the undisputed King of Arden. Chapter 36 A Dangerous Dance Somehow, Rasa managed to get through dinner without throwing up on the new King of Arden or anyone else. She accomplished that by eating very little. Montan had been placed next to Rasa, as befitted another head of state, he had no gift of social conversation, not that Rasa was in the mood, but talked mostly of armies and politics and the challenges of governing Tamron, crushing resistance, and bringing the nobility to heel. Rasa suspected that his choice of topics wasn't because he saw her as a peer or confidant, but because those were the only things that interested him, or because he saw this as an opportunity to intimidate her. 
He also asked numerous questions about the military and political situation and structure in the Fells, which Raisa deflected by giving vague answers and then changing the subject. She didn't trust Gerard Montan, and although he likely had plenty of spies in place already, she wasn't going to be one of his sources of information. All through dinner, Raisa struggled to rein in her acid tongue. You're a grown-up, she said to herself, and a queen. You can't indulge your temper. You have to be strategic and weigh every word. He is here to gather information. It's best if he underestimates you. There's no need to let him know you despise him. Not yet. The head table hosted foreign dignitaries mostly, including various dukes and princes from the Down Realms, the kings and queens of Weenhaven and Brunswallow, and a prince from the Southern Islands loaded down with a fortune in jewelry. I don't even like most of these people, Raisa thought, and I trust them even less. She couldn't help but think back to plainer meals in the barracks at Wean Hall, the easy camaraderie over shared misery. Finally, they moved on to the ballroom and formed a receiving line to greet guests as they arrived. The Grey Wolves were off duty now. Raisa had ordered that they attend as guests instead of bodyguards. Talia! Raisa embraced the grinning guard who had arrived with Pearlie. At last, somebody she wanted to see. It's so good to see you up and around. Captain Byrne, he says I won't be able to laze about much longer, Talia said, her voice low and rough, but understandable. I'm back on duty tomorrow, thanks to you, your highness. Talia squeezed Raisa tight and then backed away as Pearlie looked on, tears standing in her eyes. Cat came through the line with Dancer. He wore a clan coat of the finest deerskin, beaded and embroidered with flash symbols and small talismans, a kind of magical armor. Cat kept a possessive hold on Dancer's arm, eyeing the brilliantly plumaged guests uneasily. She was on duty in the ballroom and still edgy among bluebloods. Han passed through the line alone. He bowed low to kiss Race's hand. She felt the quick pressure of his hot hand as he murmured, Your Highness. Eamon arrived with his fiancée, Anamaya, who looked resplendent, practically glowing in canary-colored silk, and all of the Bayars, a study in black and white. Reed Nightwalker came by himself also, though Race a guessed he was unlikely to leave unaccompanied. Though some women in the Vale wouldn't consider walking out with a copperhead, others found his deadly reputation and exotic good looks intriguing. Nightwalker was among the first on Raisa's dance card, and he requested one of the vigorous clan dances, which left Raisa flushed and breathless and weak in the knees. It wasn't easy to carry off in a ball gown. After, he fetched her a glass of wine. You dance like a clan princess he said, nodding in approval. I had hoped you might wear clan dress tonight. We'll celebrate in the camps as well, after the coronation ceremony tomorrow, Raisa promised. My father and grandmother are planning it, and I'll dress for the occasion then. This is more of a flatland party, after all. I'll look forward to having you to myself, Briar Rose, Nightwalker said. He leaned closer. It's good to see one of clan blood on the throne of the Fells. He bowed, then turned and crossed the dance floor toward his waiting admirers. After that, it was one dance after another, each time with a new partner. It seemed that Raisa was expected to dance with every important male guest at least once. Many of them tromped on her toes, being unfamiliar with northern dances. Too bad I can't dance with two at a time, Raisa thought, and get through this more quickly. Micah surfaced midway through her list. She had to admit it was a pleasure dancing with him after so much wrong-footedness. Well, he said, looking into her eyes, there were times that I didn't think you would live long enough to be queen. No thanks to your father, Raisa said, nodding to where Lord and Lady Bayar stood watching the dancers. No thanks to my father, Micah agreed. But thanks, in part, to you, I suppose, Raisa said generously. Micah was looking almost honorable in comparison to Gerard Montan. Micah smiled faintly and drew her in closer, 
brushing his lips over her neck. Raisa stiffened and drew back. Careful, Bea, she said. She couldn't help looking around for Han. He'd made herself conscious, which was maybe the idea. She didn't see Han, but she did see Nightwalker watching them, his face a thundercloud. Accept my apologies, Your Highness, Micah said, not looking sorry at all. It's just that you're irresistible tonight. Try harder, Raisa said bluntly. How does it feel? Micah asked. Being queen, I mean. It's not official until tomorrow, remember? Raisa said. But it's already a little daunting, I'm afraid. I don't like it that Gerard Montan rushed up here within days of murdering his brother. Now he's got two big armies and nothing to do with them. I don't like it either, Micah said. It would help us if his brother had lived a little longer. Do you think the Thanes will go with Gerard? Or will those who supported Jeff rally around someone else? I don't know, Raisa said honestly. We need better intelligence from Arden. We need better weapons, Micah said. Then the intelligence won't matter so much. If the Wizard Council perceives that Montan presents an imminent threat, I can't say what they'll do. Oh, don't start, Raisa said. Let's see if we can get through the rest of this dance without talking about politics. Hmm, what should we talk about instead? He stroked her hair. Remember how we used to slip away from boring parties? Don't think that's going to happen tonight, Raisa said. Lifting her head, her gaze fell on Melanie, who watched, tight-lipped, from the edge of the dance floor. Though her sister had been the object of continuous male attention all night long, she still seemed fixed on Micah. I hope this isn't going to go on forever, Raisa thought. They danced in silence after that, until the song ended. Raisa drew away from Micah, but he kept his hands on her shoulders. What are you doing after the dance? he said. I know somewhere we can go to be alone. That's enough, Micah, Raisa said sharply. I'm going to be alone in my bed. Well now, that's a shame, Your Highness, somebody said, practically in her ear. They both swung around. Han Alistair bowed. I believe I'm next on the list, he said. You? Micah looked him up and down, then turned to Raisa. Alistair's on your dance card? Raisa looked. It seems he is, she said, surprised to see his name there. He'd never danced with her before, not at any of the pre-coronation parties. Why you? Micah said, his brow furrowed. Why not? Han said. He stood, chin cocked up, his stance and expression holding a promise of violence, a street lord challenge. What is that on your stoles? Micah said, giving back disdain. A crow? I would have thought a rat would be more appropriate. It's a raven, Han said, known for being smarter than you think. Taking Race's hand, he led her into the dance while Micah stared after them. After the events of the night before, Raisa didn't know what to expect, but he kept her at a proper arm's length, as if this dance were something he just had to get through, maybe to make a point with Micah. Try to look like you don't want to be with me, Han said, his eyes flicking over the other dancers. How do you know I do want to be with you? Raisa said, tartly. Han looked startled at first, and then his mouth twitched, fighting off a smile. Raisa didn't care. She was tired of being yanked this way and that by Han Alistair. Hot kisses and intoxicating embraces, followed by a stiff arm. It was the first time they'd danced together since their lessons in the upstairs room at the Turtle and Fish in Odin's Ford. She was acutely aware of the distance between them, the placement of his hands on her shoulders and hips. You're really not bad, Alistair, Raisa said. Memories of Odin's Ford sluiced over her, of uncomplicated kisses and a friendship with fewer barriers between them. Han was bent on business, not memories and small talk. Besides his guard, Montan has a couple dozen servants with him who look a lot like soldiers or rushers, he murmured. Cat put a tail on them. If he has other people here, we want to know about it. Where did Cat find a crew on such short notice? Raisa said. She's been recruiting in Ragmarket and Southbridge. He leaned in. 
She says to tell you she'll kill Montan for you if you want. No one will ever tie it to you. What? Raisa grabbed Han's lapels and pulled him closer, glaring at him. Tell her to forget it. I don't send assassins after people, especially my guests, no matter how despicable. I told her you'd say that, Han said, smiling and nodding to Missy Hackam, who looked on, scowling, as they circled by. He turned back to Raisa, his smile fading. I think you should consider it, at least. Not that it wasn't tempting. Looking ahead, Raisa could see nothing but trouble from the new King of Arden. How do you know, Montan? she asked, to keep from saying yes. Cat, Dancer, and I had a dust-up with him in Arden's court. He's a great one for abducting people. I know, Raisa said, recalling their encounter in Tamron. Don't drink with him, and don't go anywhere alone with him, Han said. Not even inside the palace. In fact, don't go anywhere without me or Cat or Captain Byrne until Montan leaves town. He looked down at her with narrowed eyes, searching for evidence of foolhardiness. I'll be careful, Raisa said. She scanned the ballroom. Montan was deep in conversation with Lassiter Hackam and Bron Klemath. Anamaya Dubai was huddled up with Talia and the rest of the Grey Wolves, but she didn't see Eamon. Where is Captain Byrne, anyway? she asked. He's setting up a perimeter around the castle close, Han said, just in case the King of Arden has planned more than a friendly visit. Raisa felt a twinge of sympathy for Anamaya. When she married Eamon Byrne, this was what she had to look forward to, a lifetime of deferring to duty. As the song ended, Han looked over Race's shoulder, and his face cleared of all expression. She turned to find the new King of Arden bowing before her. Your Majesty, I believe the next dance is mine. Han put his hand on her bare shoulder, the heat of it stinging her skin. Remember what I said, Your Highness. And then he was gone. In contrast to the hot wizard hands and sweaty suitor palms Raisa had encountered all evening, Montan's hands were dry and cold as a lizard's skin. Had it been less than a year ago that he'd repulsed her at her name-day party with talk of eliminating the elder brothers who stood between him and the throne? And now he'd achieved that. Raisa made a mental note. When Gerard Montan makes threats and promises, take them seriously. As he had at Race's name-day party, Montan overlapped any pleasantries and cut right to the point. I'm surprised to see you dancing with mages, Montan said. I understood that you were forbidden to consort with them. I'm forbidden to marry them, Raisa said, but they're still good for dancing. Montan didn't smile. They're good for military uses as well, but rather dangerous to fraternize with, I believe particularly for a young lady like herself. Wizards have been part of our social and political structure for generations, Raisa said. We believe the benefits of fraternization are worth the risk. Montan changed the subject. I sent you a proposal a month ago, he said, and you responded somewhat favorably, I believe. That would be his proposal that Raisa send her armies against King Jeff as a kind of betrothal gift to Gerard. I was willing to listen, Raisa said, but it seems that circumstances have changed. Yes, they have. I am no longer in need of your army, which puts us on a different footing when it comes to marriage negotiations. Does it? Raisa said. So, am I to understand that you're no longer interested in an alliance by marriage? Montan shook his head. I am very much interested in pursuing a marriage contract with you. He paused. Though I'm not so much interested in an alliance as a consolidation of holdings. And I'm not interested in either one, Raisa thought. Your Majesty, she said. I hadn't even dreamed that we would be discussing this tonight. I expect you must have your hands full with your new responsibilities. As I hope you can understand... There is much to do here in the fells before I consider external affairs. On the contrary, I believe I have a certain momentum, Montan said. You've seen what I can accomplish in a short time. I see no reason to delay the inevitable. 
The resources in the fells are complementary to our own and would help restore our depleted treasury. This would be the next logical step. You honey-tongued romantic, you, Raisa thought, doing her best not to roll her eyes. As usual, it's all about you and what's best for you. She was suddenly eager to get Gerard Montan out of her queendom as quickly as possible. She cast about for an excuse. I'll carefully consider what you've said, she said. But you should know that here in the Fells it is customary to remain in mourning for a year after the death of a parent. That prevents hasty decision-making while in the throes of grief. I couldn't consider celebrating a marriage or negotiating changes in political structure any time soon. The song ended, and they came to a stop. Good evening, Your Majesty, Raisa said. Safe travels home. She curtsied a goodbye, trying to pull free, but Montan kept hold of her arm, dragging her toward a windowed alcove at the side of the ballroom. I'm not finished, he said. Perhaps I've not made myself clear to you. Raisa set her feet, resisting, and suddenly they were walled in, Eamon Byrne, Han Alistair, Cat Tyburn, and three of the Grey Wolves, with Micah close behind them. "'You take your hands off me before I have you arrested,' Raisa said, her voice like ground glass. Montan let go of Raisa's arm. "'I don't know what customs you keep in the South,' she went on, "'but I will not be manhandled in my own court, by anyone.' "'I understand that you have much to think about,' Montan said, pretending to ignore Race's small army. But you of all people should understand that I'm not endlessly patient. When your mother became an obstacle, you removed her, just as I will not hesitate to remove anyone who gets in my way. He paused a moment to let that sink in. I offer you a role and a voice in a greater kingdom of Arden, an offer that may be withdrawn at any time. I suggest that you choose carefully and render me an answer sooner rather than later. He turned on his heel and walked away without even a suggestion of a bow. Montan, Raisa called after him, her voice ringing out above the music and clamor of voices. He swung around to face her. Yes. No need to wait and wonder. I'll give you my answer now, she said. Montan turned and stood waiting his lips forming a faint smile. He expects me to give in, Raisa realized, astonished. He expects me to say yes. He's used to bullying women into doing what he wants, she thought. He's never bothered to learn to read them. Maybe it was Raisa's imagination, but it seemed the ballroom went silent around them, waiting to hear her answer. The answer is no, Raisa said, in a loud, carrying voice. I would rather marry the demon king himself than marry you. I suggest you look elsewhere for a bride, and heaven help the one you choose. Two spots of color appeared on Montan's pale cheeks, whether fury or embarrassment at this public rejection, Raisa couldn't tell. Now he inclined his head a fraction, his blue eyes as pale and cold as wind-roughened ice. Thank you, Your Majesty, for being so direct with me. Good evening. Raisa watched him walk away with mingled feelings of relief and dread. It was a relief to put an end to the charade that she would ever consider a marriage with Montan, but she knew he would find a way to make her pay for his public humiliation. I should have let Cat kill him, she thought. Chapter 37 Coronation The coronation ball had been for the nobility, wizards, and military officers, bluebloods, Han would call them. Vale folk of all ranks were invited to the coronation day party, and there would be a feast and dancing in the spirits for clan folk. Even in celebration, her people were divided. First to Temple. Magret helped Raisa into her temple robes, draping the elaborately embroidered clanwork coronation garment over her shoulders. It was studded with jewels, and so heavy, Raisa nearly staggered under the weight. 
it seemed symbolic of the load of responsibility settling onto her shoulders. When she was ready, her father, Avril, her sister, Melanie, her cousin, Missy Hackham, and her grandmother, Elena, came to escort her to the cathedral temple. Eamon was there also, solemn and heartbreakingly handsome in his dress blues. The rest of the gray wolves lined up at attention behind him. Raisa swallowed a lump in her throat. Han Alistair wore the black and silver coat he'd worn to Mariana's funeral, the one Willow had made for him, inscribed with subtle gray wolves and ravens, the serpent and staff on the back. He displayed what Raisa had come to think of as his court amulet, carved of translucent stone in the shape of a hunter. She knew he would be wearing the serpent amulet against his skin. He met Raisa's eyes, and energy and tension and secrets crackled between them. His gaze dropped to the pearl and moonstone ring she wore next to Hanalea's wolf. He bowed deeply, his raven stoles nearly touching the floor. When had he come to look so at home at court? Had she herself changed that much in the past year? Melanie and Missy lined up behind Raisa, each grabbing a fistful of fabric. They would help carry her train. Good thing I don't have to wear this thing but once, Raisa grumbled. There's no way I could dance in it. Magret fussed with the folds of Raisa's robe, arranging and rearranging. The newly made mistress of the queen's bedchamber was dressed in a fine gray wool dress, her maiden pendant glittering at her neck. It's all right, Raisa said, taking Magret's hands. Thank you for everything you've done, and will do for the line. She went up on her toes and kissed her former nurse on the cheek, wet and salty with tears. Eamon came and stood on Raisa's right-hand side, Han on the left. It felt good to have them there. Let's go, she said, lifting her chin. They walked down the long corridors, the heavy brocade fabric swishing over the marble and stone floors. The formal passageways through the palace were nearly deserted, Everyone who was anyone was already at the temple. Servants stood in the doorways, however, and lined the broader corridors. Even the cooks and kitchen staff took a few minutes from their preparations for the feasting that evening to watch the Princess Air pass by for the last time. The next time they saw her, she would be queen. The little procession entered the courtyard, walking along the gallery between the castle proper and the cathedral temple. Han slid his hand inside his coat and murmured a charm. Light arced over them, looking like a magical arbor entwined with roses, but Raisa guessed it was a clever means to deflect any assassin's arrows or magical attacks. As they came into view, more servants cheered and waved handkerchiefs from balconies. Happy name day, they shouted, and long live Raisa Anna Mariana. Temple dedicates stood to either side of the great double doors of the cathedral. They pulled them ajar as Raisa and her entourage approached. Raisa halted in the doorway, scanning the room. The cathedral was packed, every seat on either side of the aisle occupied. The hall thundered with the sound of feet hitting the floor as the congregation rose to greet the princess heir. Raisa walked down the aisle, head held high, Han and Eamon falling back a bit so that she was visible to everyone. At the front of the temple, Speaker Jemson waited in the ceremonial robes that speakers had worn for every coronation since Hanalea. Good thing they're one size fits all, Raisa thought, just like mine. Again, the cacophony of noise and color reminded Raisa of her name day ceremony, but this time the Grey Wolf throne sat empty on the dais twined with rowan and roses, instead of her mother's white gardenias, a symbol that times had changed. Still, Raisa couldn't help thinking of it as her mother's throne. Below, at floor level and to either side, were the less elaborate chairs, occupied by representatives of the spirit clans, the wizard council, and the council of nobles. Her grandmother Elena took her place next to the clan seat, and Gavin Bayar and Lassiter Hackham came forward and stood for the wizards and the Vale nobility. Events seemed to slow to a crawl as Raisa's mind raced faster, collecting images, sounds,
body language, expressions, and reactions. Raisa halted just in front of the dais, turning to face the room. Her attendants fanned out to either side. Again, Han conjured a canopy of glittering magic, wolves and roses, and the unlidded eye, the symbol of her father's clan. The gray wolves lined up against the wall, rigidly at attention. Han and Eamon stood on either side of the dais, an honor guard of sorts. Melanie, Missy, and Avril took seats in the front row, Avril slipping his arm around Melanie's shoulders. Just behind them, Magret sat very erect, her nose pink, dabbing at her eyes. Melanie leaned forward, looking across the aisle to where Micah and Fiona sat in the front row, clad in their usual black and white, looking straight ahead. Their faces were like fine porcelain, white and hard, and yet somehow brittle. Raisa saw a spot of red out of the corner of her eye. It was Cat Tyburn standing in the shadows of a side corridor, wearing her satin dress from the ball. She seemed to have taken a fancy to it. Cat stood, head cocked, surveying the crowd for trouble. Farther back were guests from outside the queendom, seated according to rank and protocol. The seating had been rearranged yet again, as Gerard Montan had sent his regrets, saying he would return home immediately. Raisa almost wished he were there, under her eye, where she could watch him. She couldn't honestly say she regretted what she'd said, but maybe her timing could have been better. Behind the throne, crowded to either side of the altar on the dais, stood Raisa's ancestors, the Grey Wolf Queens. They eddied and shifted like vapor, their brilliant eyes glittering in the light from the torches and candelabras overhead. Raisa looked over at Han, wondering if he could see them too. If he did, he didn't acknowledge them. He stood cradling his amulet, scanning the audience for potential dangers. This is like a wedding, Raisa thought. The bride and her attendants at the front, the wizards on one side, the clans on the other— like two families that don't get along. The Vale folk, as always, were forced to divide themselves between the two. And me? I'm marrying the Grey Wolf Throne, the most jealous of lovers. She'd chosen it over Aemon, over Han, likely over any chance at happiness in love. Don't be maudlin, she scolded herself. Life is full of difficult choices. At least I get to be queen. Jemson walked to the center of the aisle and turned to face Raisa, his back to the crowd. He smiled down at her and winked. "'Greetings, gracious lady,' he said. "'Who are you, and what brings you to temple today?' It was the first of the traditional three questions. "'I am Raisa Anna Mariana, the princess heir of the Fells,' Raisa said, loudly enough to carry to all corners of the hall." I have come here to claim the Grey Wolf Throne. By what authority do you claim the Grey Wolf Throne? Jemson asked sternly. My mother, Queen Mariana Annalisa, has joined our ancestors in the Spirit Mountains, Raisa said. I am Mariana's heir, entitled by blood and ability. What is your lineage? Jemson asked. Raisa recited the new line of queens, beginning with Hanalea and ending with her mother and herself, familiar from all of the temple days of her life, familiar from her name day a year ago. Jemson nodded. I am satisfied that you qualify by blood, your highness, he said. Now I have three questions that relate to ability. These were new questions, ones she hadn't answered at her naming. It was assumed that a named princess heir would have time to become more capable before her coronation. "'To whom do you answer, Raisa Anna Mariana?' Jemson asked. "'I answer to the Maker, to the Line, and to the people of the Fells,' Raisa said. "'How do you signify, Princess Raisa?' Jemson asked. "'By what do you pledge?' "'By my blood,' Raisa said. Drawing the Lady Dagger that had belonged to Eden Byrne, she sliced her palm and allowed her blood to drip into the large basin on the altar. Jemson handed her a clean white cloth to wrap around her hand. Lifting an elaborate ewer, he poured water into the basin and swirled it. 
clean, clear water from the Dern water, high in the spirits. Who will help you in this race, Anna Mariana? Jemson asked. The queendom rests on three foundations, wizards, the spirit clans, and veiled dwellers, Rasa said. Jemson dipped a cup into the basin, lifted it, dripping. He gestured, and Elena, Lord Bayar, and Lord Hackham came forward. Jemson passed them the cup, and they each drank from it in turn, glaring at one another over the rim. Eamon and Han came from either side to drink. Jemson invited the front row up, and Melanie, Missy, and Avril Lightfoot came forward and drank. Melanie's pale cheeks were even paler than usual, and Raisa knew that her sister had imagined herself in Raisa's place. Avril smiled at Raisa, his face alight with pride. Was it because she was his daughter, or because there would be a mixed-blood queen on the Grey Wolf throne? Micah and Fiona approached from the other side. Micah's eyes met Raisa's as he shook back his hair, tipped the cup, and drank. Fiona kept her eyes focused on the cup. One by one, the people in each row were invited forward to drink the blood of the Grey Wolf Queen. About half the crowd stayed in their seats. They were dignitaries from the rest of the Seven Realms who had no intention of declaring fealty to Rasa. We are thereby pledged to preserve the Grey Wolf line and the Queendom, Jemson said, drinking from the cup himself and then setting it aside. Remember that, Rasa thought, looking at the Bayars. Kneel, your highness, Jemson said. Rasa dropped to her knees, the coronation robes puddling around her. Jemson lifted the ornate grey wolf crown from its velvet cushion, raising it high. By the authority vested in me as speaker of the cathedral temple of the City of Light, I crown you, Rasa Anna Mariana, Queen of the Fells, thirty-third in the new line. And he settled the crown on her head. On the dais, the Grey Wolf Queens bowed their heads in acknowledgment of their new sister queen and dissipated like vapors. Rasa rose, stiff-necked, conscious of the weight of the crown, worried it might topple off. Jemson stepped aside. Her attendants assembled behind her, and she processed grandly down the aisle to the applause of the assembled nobility. Likely the last time they'll unite to cheer anything I do, Rasa thought. As she crossed the courtyard, she heard a clamor from the balconies, but was afraid to look up for fear of losing her crown. Rose petals spiraled down all around her. Once safely inside the palace, she lifted off the crown with both hands and handed it to Eamon, exchanging it for the lighter tiara. She climbed the grand staircase to the third floor and turned down the corridor, trying not to trip over her coronation robes, her attendants trailing like fancy plumage. Thousands of people had collected in the courtyard below, men, women, and children. No doubt some had come because they'd never been invited into the castle close before, and they were curious. But many of them wore roses pinned to their clothing, some of them real, and others fantastical constructions of fabric and lace, bright spots of color on gray and brown. When Rasa appeared at the railing, a thunderous shout went up from the crowd, Rasa, 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 and Briar Rose, Briar Rose. Rasa extended her hands, and the crowd shouted, Who are you, and what brings you to temple today? I am Rasa Anna Mariana, Grey Wolf Queen of the Fells, she replied, and the cheering started up again, dying away only when she raised her hands for quiet. Peoples of the Fells, a coronation is an ending and a beginning, she said. The ending of a period of uncertainty, the beginning of a new era. The end of Mariana's reign, the beginning of races. The end of a princess, the first steps of a queen. The end of childhood. She paused, wrinkling her nose. And now I suppose everyone expects me to be a grown-up. Laughter rolled through the crowd. In some ways, I will never grow up. For instance, I continue to believe in miracles, but I know that miracles come to those who work very hard. 
I pledge that I will work very hard for you. Another cheer went up. I continue to believe in the people of the Fells. Although we've had hard times, and there are threats on every side, we will overcome any adversary if we will just work together, Vale dwellers, wizards, and spirit clans. You listen to each other, and I will listen to you. Finally, in addition to hard work, I believe in parties. This was greeted by a roar of approval. Tonight we celebrate. I will be dancing, and I hope you will be dancing too. Thank you. As she turned away, cheers hammered her back. And so it was done. Rasa was queen of the fells, thirty-third in the new line of Hanalea. She'd been born for this and raised to it. She'd fought for it, and at times she'd thought she might die for it. She had a long history of tragedy and triumph behind her, and a lifetime of hard work ahead of her. It was time to get started. Epilogue The coronation party continued in Fell's March long after the official one was over. Guests spilled out of the castle close and into the streets, bluebloods mingling with rag pickers and blacksmiths and stable boys. Food and drink had flowed freely at the new Queen's party, and the streetwise residents of Rag Market and Southbridge filled their bellies and then their pockets and carry bags. In times like these, who knew when more food would come their way? Some in the crowd would have celebrated the crowning of the Demon King himself, so long as it involved jackets of ale or drams of stingo and blue ruin. From the roof of Southbridge Guardhouse, Sari Dobbs surveyed the crowd with the practiced eye of a slide-hander. A pocket diver could have a field day with a crowd so deep in its cups, but so far there had been little evidence of trouble. Even street rats were disinclined to target those celebrating the crowning of the lady known as Briar Rose. Cuffs, or the Demon King, as he called himself now, their street lord, had asked them to keep eyes and ears on the celebration, to pass through the rougher sorts of inns and report back anything that might threaten the safety of the queen. He'd called on them since most of the prime blue jackets were partying along with her. Who would have guessed... Me and Flynn playing at blue jackets, Sari thought, grinning at Flynn on a roof across the river. Her grin faded as she considered the high cost of sobriety on a night like this. The fireworks were long over, the vivid colors still engraved on Sari's eyeballs. It was getting past Darkman's hour, and even the most dedicated soakers were stumbling home in the gray light of morning. Motioning to Flynn, Sari skinned down the drain pipe to the ground. They'd make one more sweep through the streets of Rag Market and then head back to their crib. Along the way, they growled at some of the litlings and street kitties, scaring them toward home. On their way down Pinberry Alley, on their old turf, Sari spotted a pair of fine boots poking out from behind a dustbin. Dustbins were new to Rag Market, one of the Queen's bright ideas. She seemed to think folk would put scummer and trash in them instead of leaving it in the gutters. Hey now, Sari said. It ain't safe to be sleeping over here with them boots on. She nudged one of the boots with her toe, and something about the way the leg rolled away told her the boot's owner wouldn't be needing them any more. Flynn, she hissed. Get over here. Two bodies lay behind the dustbin, a woman and a man, all glittered up in blue blood finery, the wizard stoles around their necks splattered with blood. Their throats had been cut right through the windpipe. Flynn stared down at them, swearing under his breath. Sari knelt next to the bodies and patted them down. Whoever had done them had left their purses behind, and the boots. Their flash pieces is gone, though, Flynn pointed out. He was right. Their amulets were missing, and jinxlingers never even went to the privy without their flash pieces. Sari and Flynn searched the area, but didn't find them. Flynn squatted next to the corpses, scanning their clothing in the growing light. Look at this, he said, sweeping his hand down the torso of the wizard with the boots. 
There, faintly daubed in blood, was a vertical line with another line zigzagging across it. Flynn sat back on his heels. What does that look like to you? When Sari said nothing, he thrust the talisman Cat's copperhead had made into her face. Sari looked again. Now she saw it. The stylized serpent and staff. The gang sign of the Demon King, Cuff's Alistair's new street name. That don't make sense, she said after a long pause. He's left the life. But he's got himself a crew and a crib, and he said himself he's got a game going, Flynn muttered. Said he didn't want to let us in because it was too risky. Sari waved at the two on the bricks. You think these ones had a hand in what happened to his mam and sister? Does it matter? Flynn said. You think he's out hushing wizards at random? Sari said. Him? Or Cat Tyburn, maybe? She's rum with a blade. She shook her head. He's a charm caster himself. Anyway, Cuffs is too smart for that. Flynn licked his lips. Remember what he said down in Filter Alley? He wouldn't say what his game was. But, you know, he did call it a lack-witted scheme. A fool's quest. Maybe that's why he didn't want to let us in. He'd have taken their purses, Sari said. Make it look like footpad work. Unless he was making a point, Flynn said. Why else would he sign his work? Sari tried, but her weary mind couldn't come up with another argument. Maybe Cuff's aunt in his right mind, Sari said, frowning. Remember how he was after Mam and Mary burned? I've never seen anyone that draws trouble like he does. The Blue Jackets will be stumbling through here before long, Flynn said, judging the angle of the light. Sari thought on it. Here's what we'll do. She wadded up the end of the wizard stole in her hand and pressed it into the neck wound, saturating it with blood. Then she mopped it over the symbol on the corpse's coat until she'd blotted it all. Good thing these is fresh, she muttered. She handed one of the purses to Flynn and stuffed the other into her carry bag. Let's take these, too. Make it look like a slash and grab. The next thing Sari knew... Flynn was tugging off the boots. They're clan made, he said when she glared at him, and they look like my size. By the time the sun broke over the eastern escarpment, Sari and Flynn were on their way back to their crib. Sari hoped they'd managed to cover their street lord's tracks, but worry tugged at the corners of her mind. He keeps this up. He's bound to be caught, she thought. And this time, they'll dangle him for certain. The End You've been listening to The Grey Wolf Throne by Cinda Williams Chima, narrated by Carol Monda. If you've enjoyed this book and this performance, Recorded Books recommends Tiger, Tiger by Kirsten Hamilton, narrated by Celeste Chula. Tegan Wiltson's best friend, Abby, dreams that horrifying creatures... Goblins, shapeshifters, and beings of unearthly beauty but terrible cruelty are hunting Tegan. Abby is always coming up with crazy stuff, though, so Tegan isn't worried. Why would her fabulous life be in danger because of a dream? She's on track for a college scholarship. She has a great job. She's focused on school, work, and her future. No boys, no heartaches, no problems. Until... Finn McCool arrives. Finn's a bit on the unearthly beautiful side himself. He has a killer accent and a knee-weakening smile. And either he's crazy or he's been haunting Abby's dreams, because he's talking about goblins too, and about being THE McCool, born to fight all goblin kind. Finn knows a thing or two about fighting, which is a very good thing, as Tegan suddenly discovers. Abby's right. The goblins are, indeed, coming. You will find a wide selection of titles in the Recorded Books catalog, including bestsellers, mysteries, classics, histories, and more. Call us toll-free or log on to recordedbooks.com to learn about our latest releases and special offers, order another recorded book, or to read author interviews and narrator profiles.
Don't forget to ask about easy 30-day rentals by mail. And thank you for being a Recorded Books reader. Audible hopes you have enjoyed this program.